This is Audible. Tantor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents The Wolf at Bay by Charlie Adhara. Narrated by Eric Blomquist. Chapter 1 Birthday, Anniversary, or Apology Cooper Dayton looked up from pretending to check his phone while loitering under one of the young trees that lined Ann Arbor's streets. A large, older black woman stood, leaning against the doorway of the shop behind him. How long had she been watching him? He felt a flare of annoyance with himself when he realized he had no idea. He was distracted today, off his game. But then, when was the last time he'd been on his game? Cooper gave her his best confused look. Sorry? She smiled knowingly at him and tilted her head at Simpson's across the busy street, her long, beaded braids clacking pleasantly. You've been standing here staring at that flower shop for fifteen minutes, so is it for her birthday or anniversary, or are you making up for a fight? Because I've been married for thirty-two years, and believe me, there are different bouquets for different occasions. Cooper smiled, relaxing slightly. Yeah? How so? Anniversary has got to be something sexy. Roses. Roses are good. Classic. Hot. If you're married and had flowers at the wedding, add some of those. She'll be impressed by the thought. Not married. He paused and added. And he's a him. She simply smiled and nodded. All right. If it's an apology, go with his favorite flower. A lot of them. I don't know his favorite flower. She sucked her teeth, mock disapprovingly. I'm not sure he even has one, Cooper added defensively. What about birthday? Something that goes with the gift you got him, because you better not just be walking in with some lousy flowers. So which is it? Cooper laughed. What if I want to get him some flowers just because? She raised an eyebrow and sniffed. Uh-huh, right, you fucked up flowers it is then. Cooper's smile froze on his face and he gave a little reflexive jerk of his head. No, he said. Well, maybe. There was, of course, that whole unwitting accomplice to a psychotic serial killer hell-bent on destroying the entire werewolf species thing four months ago. If anyone was keeping track, that definitely counted as a fuck-up. But Cooper doubted there were enough flowers in the cramped corner store across the street for an apology that size, and sorry I almost got you killed just wouldn't look right on one of those teensy-tiny cards they stuck to bouquets. Besides, the incident was on the list of things he and Park did not talk about. Hmm, the woman eyed him knowingly. Not an apology, you were saying? No, really. What kind of flowers for just because? That depends on just because what? Just because you love him? Cooper coughed. Oh, well, let's not get crazy. <laughs> what are my other options? She snorted. Like that, is it? You sound like my second husband, Gary. He couldn't handle looking like he cared either. A man like that gives daisies. Dead by the end of the work week. Don't be a daisy man, friend. I thought you said you've been married for 32 years. And I was. Just not to the same man or for consecutive sentences, she cackled. Anyway, before you go sending messages, maybe you better figure out what it is you want to say. You better hurry up, though. Looks like they're closing. Cooper followed her gaze, and sure enough, Donnie Simpson was pulling the outside display of autumnal arrangements back into his shop. Damn it, excuse me. Uh, thanks for the advice, Cooper muttered. The woman waved him on. Just tell him how you feel and the flowers won't matter she called after him as Cooper crossed the street. Easier said than done. He wasn't sure how he felt. He did, however, have a pretty good idea how Park was going to feel after this. Cooper checked his phone with a curse. Park was supposed to meet him here with the search warrant while Cooper made sure Donnie Simpson stayed put. Only now, Donnie was closing shop 45 minutes early and Park wasn't back yet. Don't go in without me, Park had said before they'd separated. Then how am I supposed to intimidate and threaten innocent wolves into confessing while you're not looking, Cooper had replied. I'm joking. He'd put his hands up at Park's grimace. If by joking he meant repeating verbatim the things his BSI colleague said snidely about him behind his back, and to his face. Park's sense of humor was apparently too refined for that. I just don't appreciate my partner confronting a dangerous suspect on his own, 
so wait for me outside, okay? I can take care of myself. I was doing this job just fine before you. You should trust me. None of that is true. Not now. But they didn't talk about that either. Fine, understood. Park had hesitated, looking uncharacteristically unsure, and began to say something else. But Cooper cut him off, gently grabbing his arm and rubbing his thumb over the crook of Park's elbow, his sensitive spot. I won't go in without you, Ollie, he added playfully, using Park's childhood nickname. Park had snapped his mouth closed and blushed. Still, his expression was... troubled? Disbelieving? But thankfully, he hadn't pushed it. And now? Cooper walked into the flower shop and a cluster of bells announced his arrival unnecessarily as Simpson was standing right at the front window display, unplugging the neon open sign. Hi there, Cooper said brightly, and continued into the store without pause, scanning the bouquets. Park didn't want him confronting a dangerous suspect. Fine. Cooper didn't relish the idea either. He just needed to stop Simpson from closing in order to buy Park some time. What kind of small business owner would kick out a potential paying customer? He perused the store and made his way toward the back, letting himself imagine just for a moment that he really was here buying his boyfriend some just-because flowers. What would he get Park? No. What would he get Oliver? Ollie? He smiled slowly, remembering the night they'd spent together watching movies at his place right before getting called out to Michigan for this case. Fetch me that flower, the herb I showed thee once. The juice of it on sleeping eyelids laid will make man or woman madly dote upon the next live creature that it sees. Cooper had frowned at the TV, trying to follow the loopy language. So, basically, he's telling that naked kid to go get him a roofie? Park had punched him lightly and readjusted on the couch so that his head was in Cooper's lap facing the TV. It's not a roofie. It's Cupid's flower. Love in idleness. A uh, flower that drugs you into thinking you're in love? Uh-huh, right. So, are there Athenian police in this forest or what? Shh, you're going to miss the best part. Cooper had shut up and run his fingers absently through Park's hair, too relaxed to make another teasing comment. Usually a fairly hardcore movie fan, or obsessed according to a certain wolf, that night he couldn't stop his attention from drifting away from the screen to watching Park instead, who was mouthing the occasional line along with the actors. He wondered if Park ever missed being a professor and teaching lit classes. He was always bringing over books for Cooper to read and wanting to talk about them. Cooper hadn't really been much of an English student, but watching Park explain them excitedly afterward and then having him listen so intently when Cooper ventured his own tentative opinion had recently given him a new appreciation for the subject. When Park had shown up with a literal tome of Shakespeare's plays, though, Cooper had drawn the line and suggested a compromise. Park could pick a film adaptation of a Shakespeare play as long as he then sat through a real classic movie of Cooper's choosing. Cooper had to admit some of them weren't too bad. Unfortunately, the most interesting part of this 1930s A Midsummer's Night Dream so far was a totally wild full-body sparkle suit. King of the Fairies is right, Cooper had crowed. That got him another punch, but it was weak and shaking with laughter. When the credits had finally rolled, though, Cooper was troubled. He tucked Park's hair behind his ear, thinking, If you knew the person you loved had fallen in love with you because of some psychedelic magic herb, he asked hesitantly. Cupid's? Yeah. Yeah, Cupid's flower, oxlips, wild thyme, briar rose, and eglantine, I got it. But if you knew they loved you because of magic, would you stay with them anyway? Keeping in mind you are not the one who squirted love potion number nine in their eyes to begin with, and curing them is not an option. Park had gone very still in his lap, and Cooper couldn't see his expression at this angle. Not that it would have mattered. Park had a skill for keeping secrets behind that mask of his. I don't know, Park said eventually. I'd like to think I wouldn't, but people are stupid in love. Cooper snorted in agreement. Lucky for me, magic doesn't exist, so I don't need to find out. Cooper made a non-committal noise, but to him, the existence of magic was in the eye of the beholder, and according to his own eye, 
Looking down at an honest-to-God werewolf drooling on his jeans, magic was a lot closer to being real than it had been a mere year ago. Park twisted his head in Cooper's lap so that he was looking up and wiggled his eyebrows. Not that I need supernatural help to really appreciate a good ass. Idiot. Cooper had spanked him playfully, and the evening might have gotten interesting if Santiago hadn't called moments later about a vicious werewolf attack in Michigan. In Simpsons, Cooper ran his fingers gently over a bouquet of yellow roses. He wished he remembered what Cupid's flower was actually supposed to be. Pansies, maybe? He could get some for Park. As a joke, of course. And obviously not in the middle of a brutal homicide investigation. Maybe when they got home. His home not Parks. Though more and more his D.C. apartment felt unbalanced without Parks big body sprawled across the furniture. Stop that. Dangerous. Don't go there. He let his fingers drop. He had to pay attention to the case, or there was a real possibility he didn't make it out of here at all. Never mind home. It wasn't a sound, but a familiar prickling low on the back of his neck that told him Simpson had finally followed him back into the store. Cooper threw his hands to his heart dramatically anyway when Simpson cleared his throat right behind him. Oh, yikes, you startled me. Simpson peered unapologetically at Cooper, his faded blue eyes shifting to gray as he stepped even closer, into a shaft of late afternoon sunlight filtering in through the flowers. We were just about to close, Simpson said, but even he seemed unsure. Oh, please, Cooper said loudly, injecting some wine into his voice. I won't be long. I'm on my way to my boyfriend's house, and I can't show up without flowers. I fucked up big time, you see, and I have it on good authority that apology flowers have to be big, and my baby deserves the biggest, he winked at Simpson. Simpson stared back at him. No flicker of humor or even recognition in those blank eyes. Like social interactions were something he'd learned to wait out but did not care to participate in himself, which for a shop owner couldn't have been too lucrative. No wonder the guy had gotten mixed up with money laundering. Allegedly. So, uh, what kind of flowers do you recommend? Without looking away from Cooper, Simpson reached to his right and grabbed a small bouquet of daisies dyed, or perhaps genetically modified, bright, unnatural fall colors. The thought of giving them to Park made Cooper snort. Don't be a daisy man, friend. Uh, actually, I was thinking something a bit bigger and, uh, flashier. I want it to look expensive, you know what I mean? Simpson studied him for a moment, then put the daisies back and walked past him toward the back of the store. Cooper trailed behind. Most of the overhead lights back here had already been shut off, and heavy plastic curtains had been rolled down, covering the coolers where the more delicate flowers were kept. Cooper noted an unmarked door tucked behind a display of ferns, he quickly checked that his taser, modified to take down wolves, and his gun were available and hidden at his shoulder and hip. It would be bad enough when Park found out he'd broken his promise to not approach the suspect alone. To do so unprepared? Well, maybe buying some big flashy flowers wouldn't go amiss after all. Not that Park seemed like a flowers kind of guy, all jokes aside. Nor was he technically Cooper's boyfriend. Possibly. That, too, was on the list of things they did not talk about. It was a long list. Lilies are very popular amongst fighting couples, Simpson said, pulling back a rubbery plastic sheet to show a couple dozen beautiful lilies. I have a cat, Cooper shrugged apologetically and couldn't help himself from glancing over Simpson's shoulder toward the front door. Park, where the hell are you? I thought these were for your boyfriend. Yeah. He, uh, lives with me. And my cat. Simpson blinked once, slowly, looking almost like a cat himself. No, not a cat. But a predator was waking up behind his eyes. His face, however, remained eerily blank as he stepped directly into Cooper's space, forcing him to back up against the plastic curtain. The hum of the flower cooler drowned out the noise from the street and the delicate fragrance of lilies became choking this close, like perfume in an elevator. I thought you said you were on your way to your boyfriend's place, Simpson murmured. His hands quickly closed around Cooper's wrists. Fuck, Cooper thought. He should have drawn his weapon before this. He shouldn't have let Simpson get this close. Really, 
truly he should have just gone with the fucking lilies. The four deep scars on Cooper's belly pulled unpleasantly as his skin tightened to goose flesh, a primitive awareness of danger kicking in too late. The memory of claws slicing flesh forever carved into his skin. He hunched in on his belly slightly as it cramped. Who are you? Simpson said. Let go of me, man. What's your problem? Cooper tugged, but Simpson's grip on his wrists tightened. It wasn't comfortable, but it wasn't unnaturally strong yet, either. Simpson was still trying to hide what he was, which meant he didn't suspect who Cooper was. Cooper could still fix this. You lied to me. Why did you come here, really? Simpson said. Look, Cooper affected an embarrassed look. I, uh, wasn't lying about living with my boyfriend, but I'm on my way to see this, uh, other guy, and I was just being cheap and going to split the bouquet between them. Get it? Cooper was surprised to see a flicker of disapproval escape Simpson's blank mask, but the grip on his wrist slowly loosened and then dropped away altogether. Someone's going to get hurt, Simpson said finally. Cooper huffed. Yeah, me. He held up his wrists and tried to grin. Simpson turned and walked away toward the counter. Cooper could easily take out his taser now, disarm the suspect, cuff him, and wait here safely for Park to arrive with the warrant. But that wasn't how the BSI did things. Arrest first, investigate later. Not anymore, and that was a good thing. There was an order of due process to follow. Some pollen from a rare flower sold only in this shop had linked Simpson to the body of a man suspected of running a money laundering scheme with an unknown partner a partner who had torn his throat out rather than split the payday. A classic wolf kill. Simpson was a wolf. What's more, a witness had placed Simpson's car at the scene. That would have been more than enough to get him booked four months ago. Cooper's last partner, Jefferson, would have tasered and cuffed him before the bells above the door had stopped ringing. And that's not all Jefferson would have done. Cooper swallowed the hot, acidic anger, guilt, and shame that threatened to boil over and burn him alive there on the spot. Follow procedure. He, more than anyone, couldn't step out of line. So far, all Simpson was officially guilty of was acting a bit weird. He couldn't be arrested for terrible customer service. Cooper straightened his jacket and didn't take out his weapon. Are you... is everything okay? Simpson was staring at some long-stemmed sunflowers and didn't seem to hear Cooper's question. He plucked a single yellow petal and rolled it between his fingertips. I saw you, Simpson said. Sorry? Across the street, watching. I know. I know who you are. Cooper reached slowly for his badge, but Simpson continued. He's downstairs. Cooper paused, then retracted his hand leaving his badge in his pocket. Who? Who's downstairs, Mr. Simpson? Simpson finally faced Cooper, who stumbled back in surprise. His face wasn't a blank mask now. It was transformed with fury and pain. His irises were larger, the blue-gray bleeding out into the white as the wolf peeked through. Don't fuck with me! He screamed and shoved a display shelf of sprays proclaiming to keep flowers alive twice as long. The bottles rolled across the floor. I know. I've known for weeks that I can't take it anymore, okay? So just take them and... The discreet door behind the ferns opened and a short, burly, bald white man burst into the room. Babe, I heard a crash. What's... He cut off and stared at Cooper, who stared back. Brian Fasser. The wolf who had come forward claiming to witness a silver sedan speeding away from the scene of the crime. Donnie Simpson's car. Simpson, who Fasser had claimed not to know. He'd lied. Cooper saw the exact moment Fasser realized he'd been recognized. Unfortunately, Cooper's reflexes weren't quite as fast. He was still reaching for his taser when Fasser tackled him to the ground, pinning his arm between them. Brian! Simpson shouted somewhere beyond Fasser's snarling teeth inches from Cooper's face. What the hell are you doing? And then, Brian, he repeated, sounding appalled as Fasser lifted his right hand and extended his claws, four inches long, sharp as razors, and strong as steel. Go lock the door, Donnie, Fasser said. What? No, who is this? 
Vassar's canines elongated and his eyes flicked back towards Simpson. Just go lock the fucking door. Cooper slammed his head up into Vassar, feeling the sick give of his nose. Vassar bellowed, reaching instinctively for his face and released Cooper, who bucked him off and scrambled to the side on his belly. Vassar lunged after him, landing on Cooper's legs while his claws tore through the side of Cooper's jacket, snagging temporarily in the fabric. Cooper grabbed one of the fallen pesticide bottles and swung it in the direction of Fasser's broken nose. Fasser let out a screech, inhuman and wet. His weight disappeared from Cooper's legs. Cooper rolled to his back, pulled out his taser, and aimed at Fasser, who was struggling up to his knees while protectively covering his bloody, disjointed nose. Hands above your head, Cooper said. Weapons away. Fasser slowly put his hands up. His claws retracted though his eyes were still all brown, no white, and shimmered a bit in the dim light of the shop. Simpson, standing in place in shock, seemed to rouse himself and stumbled forward as if to stand between Cooper and Fasser. Sir, I need you to stay where you are, Cooper said without looking away from Fasser, whose eyes narrowed. Cooper could practically see him smell an opportunity. He didn't doubt Fasser would sacrifice Simpson if it provided the distraction he needed to escape. Whatever other issues Park and he had, these two made them look like relationship goals. Who are you? Why are you doing this to us? Simpson choked. Cooper tried to keep his voice calm and soothing. Just because Simpson was too shocked to be threatening now didn't mean he couldn't rip Cooper apart the minute Cooper tried to take out Fasser. He was a wolf, too. Stronger, faster, and deadlier than Cooper on his best day. And this quite clearly, was not turning out to be his best day. My name is Special Agent Dayton, and I'm with the BSI. He ignored Simpson's sharp gasp. I don't want to hurt you, Mr. Simpson, so I need you to back up against the far wall while I cuff Mr. Fasser here on suspicion of murder. No, Simpson said confidently. Brian would never. Brian killed a man and tried to set you up to take the fall. No, Simpson repeated and took another step forward. Out of the corner of his eye, Cooper saw Simpson's claws extending slowly. You're lying. Think about it, Mr. Simpson. How do you think I got here? How do you think Brian recognized me? He's been using your store to launder money, not caring that it could be traced back to you. He ripped out his business partner's throat and then claimed to see your car leaving the crime. Don't listen to him, babe. The BSI just wants any excuse to round us all up and put us down. Shut up, Fasser, Cooper said. Mr. Simpson, you know I'm telling the truth. You suspected Brian was lying about something, didn't you? But you thought he was cheating on you, right? That's why you were so suspicious of me before. Well, this is what he was hiding. Why else would he have attacked me just now? Just let me cuff him and we can figure it all out. No, Simpson repeated, though he sounded less sure now. Still, he took another step forward, effectively blocking Fasser. Cooper tried to shift quickly. Still on the floor, but almost too fast for his eyes to see, Vassar slammed his hands to the back of Simpson's knees and his claws shot out, slicing through jeans and into skin. He then sprang to his feet in one fluid motion, too smooth to be human. Simpson howled and toppled over toward Cooper, who rolled out of the way just in time. He fired his taser at the now standing Vassar from below. Vassar was back on the ground without a sound. Unmoving, and unconscious. A blessing, in Cooper's opinion, considering the taser prong stuck to his groin. Cooper hurriedly cuffed Fasser's hands behind his back while he could. Brian! Simpson yelled and scrambled toward his boyfriend. He's fine, he's just unconscious. Cooper began, putting a hand to Simpson's shoulder, and was promptly knocked onto his back with Simpson sitting on his chest, teeth fully extended and irises dilated to a full, luminous blue. Idiot, your boyfriend set you up. Twice, Cooper wanted to say, but with Simpson's claws pricking at his shoulders through his jacket, he decided calling the guy an idiot was not his best bet. Donnie, don't do this. It's over. You don't have to go down with him. Simpson took a deep breath, somewhere between a snarl and a sob. Why did he drag me into this? Why couldn't he just talk to me? Why couldn't he just tell me he didn't love me anymore? I don't know. Cooper said softly. Simpson's hands relaxed their grip until they were just resting against Cooper's chest. 
Did he really hate me that much? Simpson's voice cracked like it was too thick with tears, snot, and hurt to fit in his throat. Cooper shook his head, reaching slowly for Simpson's wrists. I don't. There was a flash of movement to Cooper's right, and then Simpson disappeared with a sharp whimper, knocked off his chest by a blur too fast to be anything but another wolf. Cooper scrambled for his gun and turned to see Simpson pinned to the floor with a man kneeling on his back, ass waving in the air and cuffing Simpson's hands. Cooper left his gun holstered and flopped back on the floor with a sigh. He knew that ass. Knew it very well indeed. Cutting it a bit close, Cooper said. He heard a huff. Our bat signals must have gotten crossed. I could have sworn we said we'd meet outside. Park loomed into Cooper's field of vision. Despite his light tone, Park's face was not amused. His eyes were lighter than usual, a golden brown near glowing themselves, and the corners were tense and wrinkled. He looked older than when they'd first met, Cooper realized, and far more tired. Perhaps that was what happened after four months of being partnered with Cooper did to a person. Or perhaps that was what happened after four months of... whatever this personal relationship was. I know there's a lot of green stuff in here, so it can get confusing, but this is actually inside. Park held his hand out. Cooper grasped it and was pulled to standing. You're bleeding. Park frowned, reaching tentatively toward Cooper's face. No, I'm not. Cooper protested and ran an exploratory hand over his face. Nothing hurt, but when he examined his hand, sure enough, there were smears of blood there. Fasser must have snorted on me. Charming. Who? Cooper gestured toward Fasser, just beginning to shake off the effects of the taser. Our killer, I think. He was going to blame poor Donnie, his boyfriend, for everything. Park didn't even bother looking over at Fasser, just raised an eyebrow and pulled Cooper toward him so he could inhale the side of his neck, something he seemed to do whenever he didn't believe Cooper wasn't injured. Poor Donnie. When I walked in, he was on top of you. He was just talking. On top of you? Like you can judge, Cooper caught a hint of smile against his throat. With his teeth out, Park murmured. I tend to have that effect on people. Park stiffened and pulled away enough for Cooper to see his frown. You really do. Which is why you should have waited for me. They were closing early. If I had waited, we might not have made the faster connection in time. You should have, Cooper pulled out of Park's grasp, putting some space between them. I had it under control, Agent Park. Park opened and shut his mouth, biting off whatever he planned to say. He looked away from Cooper. Fine. Are you calling it in, or am I? Cooper didn't have many fans in the Bureau. He'd lost a lot of credibility after his last partner had taken a one-way trip to maximum security. Today... With two injured wolves on the scene, plenty of people would expect Cooper to try and keep his name away from a potential clusterfuck like this. Park was giving him that choice, offering to take care of him, which was exactly why he couldn't take it. I got this, Cooper said. He turned away so he didn't have to see Park's expression of doubt. Chapter 2 after some persuasion, Brian Fasser did perhaps the only decent thing he could for his boyfriend and confessed. Not that he had a lot of choice in the matter. Once Cooper and Park knew where to look, the evidence fell into place to irrevocably prove Fasser had murdered his business partner and was planning to run with 100% of the profit and leave the entire mess in Simpson's lap. They didn't grow enough apology flowers in the world to fix that. But at least he admitted Simpson had nothing to do with it. Donnie was just a perfect patsy who loved Fasser and who Fasser didn't love back. Even when Cooper and Park had tied up the last details of the case and could finally drive out of Ann Arbor, Simpson had still been hanging around the station, hoping to talk to Fasser, hoping something would change, hoping the past itself would change. People fell out of love in phases, even when it should be the most obvious, one-and-done sort of deal. Even when you were betrayed and realized the person who you thought you cared for had never really existed to begin with. Not really. One moment you could hate them so much it made you sick, 
and the next moment your brain could totally forget it was even angry and just plain miss the person you used to know. Or thought you knew, anyway. Cooper was familiar with that well enough himself, both with romantic relationships and platonic ones like Jeff... He shook his head, rejecting the painful thought. The point was, he'd been there. So when the Bureau had wanted to book Simpson for assaulting an agent, Cooper managed to get the charges dropped, despite Park's disapproving frown. He couldn't help it. He felt bad for Simpson. He really did. He just hoped a relationship never made him look like that big a schnook. Again. Cooper glanced automatically at his partner in the passenger seat. Park had been quiet during the drive out of Michigan. Well, even quieter than usual. Preoccupied. An indistinct tension had hovered between them ever since the flower shop, and it hadn't been helped by the pair of BSI agents that arrived at the end of the day to oversee the transport of Fasser. Cooper didn't recognize them, but that didn't mean much. Now that every BSI agent was paired with a trust agent, Cooper ran across more new faces every case and recognized the names of less than half. That didn't mean they didn't recognize him. Just couldn't resist roughing him up, huh? Said the human BSI agent, McKinnon, as his trust, Wolf, partner Wiley, loaded Fasser into the back of their van to take to the closest BSI specialized holding facility. Electrocuting his dick wasn't enough. You had to cave his face in, too? Park moved forward, but Cooper shook his head tightly. Don't. He hated Park feeling like he had to protect him from his own colleagues, no less. Besides, everything they said, he deserved. The initiation of the new program pairing trust and BSI agents was going well. Cases were being solved faster. Relations with the Wolf community were slowly, very slowly, getting better, and improved training was making sure the guilty went where they were supposed to and the innocent didn't get swept up in the investigation. For the most part. It certainly wasn't perfect, but it wasn't the disorganized, problematic, unchecked system of a few months ago that had allowed corruption and a serial killer to pass within their ranks. Baby steps. And surprisingly, most of the newly paired agents were getting along. Just not with Cooper. Either they didn't believe he hadn't been involved with his ex-partner's crimes, or they thought he should be punished for not figuring it out sooner. Cooper didn't blame them. He just wondered if Park felt the same way. Cooper had pushed to leave Michigan as soon as they'd handed over Fasser, even though there was no way they'd get all the way back to D.C. tonight. They'd have to find another motel to stop halfway. But with McKinnon's words burning in his mind and Park's loaded looks practically screaming unspoken questions and concern, he was just too antsy to hang around town. Now, however... Trapped in a car and starting to feel the aches and pains of his tussle with Fasser, he wished he hadn't. He glanced at Park again, sitting up against the passenger side door, cheek pressed to the window, one long leg pulled up on the seat. It looked uncomfortable as hell, but Park seemed not to care, lost in thought. His tongue played with the small scar that bisected his upper lip, and his eyes were dilated, whiskey gold nearly obliterating the white. They stood out in the dark, lighter than his hair and skin, especially when they caught the reflection of passing headlights and would flash that peculiar and inhuman flat, greenish white. Even like this, quiet and contemplative, he looked... wild. Dangerous. A passing car blared its horn and Cooper jerked his attention back to the road, swerving away from the lane he'd started to drift into. Shit. He rubbed at his eyes quickly, his pulse racing for a different reason than it had been a second ago. Sorry. The word sounded weird between them. How long had they been sitting in silence? Are you tired? Cooper hesitated. Yeah, a bit. Better for his pride to admit fatigue than that he had gotten distracted staring at Park. There's a motel right off the next exit, Park said, checking his phone. I wouldn't mind an early night. Cooper raised his eyebrows without looking away from the road. Are you trying to seduce me, Mrs. Robinson? Park laughed, a light, warm chuckle. Would I do something like that? 
I don't know. Would you? He waited, then added, Please. Cooper only caught the low growl because he was listening for it. It was one of his favorite noises recently and only slipped out when Park lost his careful control. Unable to resist, Cooper reached for him, and Park's hand met his halfway, fingers nudging in between his, always so eager for physical touch. Cooper brought their clasped hands to his mouth, kissed Park's knuckles, and heard him sigh happily. That sound was pretty far up on his list, too. Hey, who's seducing who here? Park said, voice a little rough. Right. Cooper dropped Park's hand, which fell into his lap and gripped the wheel instead. Do your worst. Park started to rub a slow circle into Cooper's thigh. Okay. Maybe not your worst. I'd rather not get pulled over, thanks. Park huffed and walked his fingers up Cooper's arm, teasingly instead. Cooper bit down on his lip when they passed over the spot where Simpson's claws had dug in, but it was useless trying to hide anything from Park and his wolf hearing. This was the same man who had once come running across the apartment because he heard Cooper inhale sharply while checking the basketball scores and thought something was seriously wrong. Park's hand froze and pulled away. You were hurt. Not a question. An accusation for lying earlier. It's nothing. Probably happened before. When? Park said bitingly. The cat showing her affection again? Park and Boogie had a curiously antagonistic relationship. Curious, not because Boogie was usually such a paragon of hospitality, but because Boogie liked Park while Park went out of his way to avoid Boogie and refer to her only as the cat. Cooper sighed. Okay, so Simpson may have scratched me a bit, but it didn't even bleed. You know that's true, or you would have noticed it before now. He tapped his nose. Park didn't like that. Take this next exit, he said without any of the flirtation of a moment ago. They drove in silence for a while, occasionally broken by Park giving directions. Cooper tried to keep his eyes on the road, but the long, flat, straight terrain made it too easy to look around. They were somewhere in Ohio now, and the night sky was so large he imagined he could see the curve of the atmosphere resting above them like a contact lens. He thought about saying so, but Park had closed his eyes and seemed... off. Lost in thought again and beyond Cooper's reach. Finally, he couldn't take it anymore. Are you upset I got Simpson off? Whoa... Park said evenly, what exactly went down in that flower shop? Cooper smiled and a flush of relief soothed him. If Park was joking, they'd be okay, surely. I'm not upset, Park added eventually. Anyway, it was your call. Damn right it was. Besides, isn't the guy going to suffer enough? That's got to be the worst breakup ever. As long as you didn't feel like you had to drop the charges, Park said, and Cooper stiffened hands tightening on the wheel. It wasn't often either of them referenced the animosity Cooper got from the rest of the Bureau, and he wasn't sure he liked hearing it now, even indirectly. He skirted around the question. You're the one always telling me prison is for rehabilitation, not punishment, and the only thing Simpson needs to rehabilitate is his broken heart, and his taste in men. I mean, I've had some pretty bad judgment in people before, clearly, but goddamn if it isn't obvious from the outside. Park hummed, possibly in agreement. It is those we live with and love and should know who will loot us, he said like he was quoting something. That's some pretty dismal pillow embroidery. McLean's words, not mine. Cooper felt the weight of Park's gaze on him, and after a moment he continued the quote. But we can still love them. We can love completely without complete understanding. Cooper's heart beat faster. Park was probably just referencing what a sap Simpson was, but still, he tucked the words away to take out and search for hidden meanings later when he could wonder if Park had meant it for him and get furious at himself for wanting it to be. In the meantime, he laughed it off. Sure we can, but that doesn't mean we should. Park huffed, sounding amused, but didn't comment. Do you ever miss teaching? Cooper asked after a few moments of silence. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw Park look at him quickly. 
a rare, genuinely surprised expression on his face. They almost never discussed their personal lives, a habit they'd fallen into after Florence when every question about each other's past seemed to tread too closely to some lie or misunderstanding from their less-than-ideal first case. What makes you ask that? I don't know. It was just something I was wondering before in the flower shop. Oh, good. Glad to hear your head was firmly in the game. And the way you talk about books and shit sometimes. It sounds like you miss it. This job has its perks, Park said vaguely. It was his usual deflection when anything about his life before the trust came up. Cooper expected it, but couldn't help feeling a bit disappointed. Up ahead, a bunch of cars were parked in the field running along the side of the road, and beyond them, some bright, freestanding lights wiped out the stars. Cooper thought of the last stadium lights he had seen. Park, naked in a cage, his face twisted with betrayal. Cooper knowing it was his fault. How could he dare think Park owed him information about his personal life when he was responsible for that? How could he dare think Park was quoting love poems at him? He was lucky to get whatever Park chose to give him. Park nodded at the lights in the field. With aliens in town, I like our chances of getting a room. I want to believe, Cooper said. The man at the front desk of the motel was short, slight, and a well-crafted sort of pretty. Subtle jewelry in his ears, glowing, poreless bronze skin, brows a tad too perfect to be natural, and a bright smile that got a lot brighter as he took in Park. Good evening, gentlemen. Can I help you? Do you have any available rooms for tonight? Absolutely. Will that be one room, or... The man glanced over Cooper with mild curiosity. Two, Park said. Of course, it had to be two. The Bureau was paying and couldn't know they shared a room, but the satisfied smile on the man's face still grated Cooper's nerves. Just the one night, you said? Too bad, not nearly enough time to see the sights. The man fiddled around on the computer, filling out their payment information with slow, deliberate, one-fingered pecks. In town on business? No, Cooper said shortly. Park added in a nicer tone. On our way back from business. So, it's time for pleasure. The man winked and his fingers lingered while handing Park back his card. Park smiled. Cooper rolled his eyes. Maybe you have time to take in a couple local legends after all. My name is Javier. Local legend number one, no doubt, Cooper thought, watching the way his fingers slid over Park's palm as he finally let go of the card. What would you recommend, Javier? Park asked, either clueless to the blatant flirtation or deliberately leading him on. Depends on what you're in the mood for. Food? Drinks? Fun? Park looked at Cooper questioningly. They'd eaten on the road, but Park was pretty constantly hungry. Something to do with the metabolic needs of his daily shift to wolf form. Too bad Javier's ass wasn't high in calories because it was 100% on the menu. Cooper concentrated on relaxing his jaw. I'm not hungry, he said, trying his best not to sound like a petulant child. Park frowned and seemed like he was going to argue, and Cooper's stomach clenched. Unfortunately, since they'd been partnered full-time, he'd been forced to explain his eating needs to Park. Ever since being attacked by a werewolf over a year ago and having 30% of his small intestine removed, Cooper had needed to adjust his eating habits to smaller, more frequent meals to reduce the strain on his guts. He'd tried to hide it from Park for as long as possible, not needing more reasons for Park to think he was weak. For a time, Cooper even tried to ignore his diet and to eat what Park was eating when he ate it. Hard for even an average human person and had paid some disastrously rough consequences. But they spent a lot of time together, and after a short couple weeks of working and sleeping together most days, Park had awkwardly brought the subject up himself, and Cooper was forced to explain. He regretted it every day. Ever since then, Park had been hypervigilant that Cooper was getting enough nutrition. He often cooked him little omelets in the morning before Cooper woke, had started researching supplements and vitamins he thought Cooper should take, and packed snacks for him on cases as if he was a child. Park opened his mouth now, 
almost certainly to insist Cooper get some protein before bed. If he brought up his health issues and babied him in front of Perfection Brow's Javier, Cooper was going to flip shit. Shouldn't you? He quickly cut Park off. So what else is there to do? Javier didn't even look at him. Well, if you came in off the highway, you may have noticed our very own famous haunted corn maze, Park said. We did see some lights. After dark, it's for adults only. Best thrills in the county. Cooper imagined wandering around a corn maze in the pitch black and decided he'd honestly prefer an alien abduction. And there's the haunted hayride, if you think you're brave enough for some spooky stories. Ooh. Javier made a sound that might have been a ghost noise, but sounded a bit too X-rated for your run-of-the-mill Casper. It made Park smile, though. Isn't it a little early for that stuff? he asked. It's never too early for a good monster story to get the heart racing, Javier winked. He seemed to linger just a bit on the word monster. And was it Cooper's imagination, or did his eyes flicker just a little? Don't you agree, sir? Cooper grabbed his room's keycard off the desk and backed away. He felt flushed, his skin too tight, and the scratches on his shoulders were starting to throb. I'm exhausted. I'm going to head up. See you tomorrow. Park looked startled by his sudden departure, but Javier cheerfully waved goodbye, and Cooper left. No, retreated. If he were a wolf, his tail would be glued between his legs. But he was just a man, and a pretty pathetic one these days at that. Safely in his room, Cooper tossed his bag in the corner, locked his weapons in the safe, and sat on the bed in his clothes. He checked his messages. His boss, special agent in charge Santiago, had called to express her approval of the quick and efficient wrap-up to the case. Perhaps she hadn't heard the full story of the flower shop incident. Ava, his young neighbor and cat sitter extraordinaire, had texted three pictures of Boogie looking various shades of smug, she had apparently presented Ava with a large live cricket that morning. There were pictures of that as well. He wondered if she and Boogie both had considered that a job well done and just let the critter hop back into the crevices of his apartment. He grimaced. The sounds of footsteps and laughter drifted down the hall, Javier guiding Park to the room next door to Cooper's, just in case he got lost in the labyrinth of the two-story motel. Cooper waited barely breathing until he heard the sound of Park entering his room and Javier's footsteps leaving, back down the hall, alone. He sighed, at the same time relieved and frustrated with himself for being so. Cooper briefly imagined going by Park's room and suggesting they go out and make time for some pleasure. They weren't in any real rush to get back to D.C. after all. Now that this case was closed, they each had a couple days off. Days Cooper had been planning to use to, well... Talk. With Park. About them. And what that meant exactly. Or something. Suddenly the thought of a knight wandering around lost in a corn maze didn't seem like such a bad idea after all. Feeling twitchy and not at all tired anymore, he got up and rummaged through his overnight bag for the little tube of neosporin he kept with him at all times. It was tucked into a subtle inside pocket along with condoms and lube, which he had also started carrying with him. Not that he and Park should be fucking on cases, but if one year as a Boy Scout had taught him anything, it wasn't explicitly to carry condoms with you at all times. If it had, maybe he would have dropped out, but he did like to be prepared. Besides, the case was over, and he didn't need two days to talk. In theory, anyway. He and Park had been sleeping together for almost four months now, and Cooper still hadn't found a way to clarify what was going on. Were they dating? Fuck buddies? Clumsily falling onto each other's dicks with regularity? They didn't go on dates. They worked together. They hung around Cooper's apartment watching movies and discussing books. They had sex. They didn't talk about it. Any sweet nothings exchanged happened in the dark while covered in sweat and other fluids, and were thus void. Most of the time, Cooper fully expected Park would just stop showing up at his apartment one day, and that would be that. They still wouldn't talk about it, and they'd keep working together, without the sex, until Cooper imploded like a collapsing black hole of emotional repression. In the hall, he heard a knock, and for one embarrassing giddy moment he thought it was Park, 
using some ESP shit to eavesdrop on Cooper's neuroses and here to tell him he did care and he would never stop showing up. Cooper kicked himself. Have some shame, Dayton. But then he heard the door to the room next to him open and recognized the flirty receptionist's voice. Back again. Cooper hurried to his door and peered out the peephole, but couldn't see anything at that angle. Feeling absurdly childish, he strained his ears to hear, but Javier's voice had dropped to a murmur. Cooper imagined what he'd do if he didn't hear the footsteps leaving alone this time, if instead he heard two voices move into the other room. He wished he weren't too chicken shit to walk out into the hall and stake his claim in Park right then and there. Of course he wouldn't. He couldn't risk word getting back to the Bureau. They'd separate them as partners at a minimum, and despite what SAC Santiago had assured him, he still felt his position with the BSI was tentative at best. That's what Cooper told himself. But that wasn't the real reason. Even if he was a wolf, the chances of this Javier guy somehow finding out they were BSI agents and reporting an inappropriate relationship to DC were non-existent. It was the relationship part that kept Cooper frozen in place, listening at peepholes. He just didn't have the right to state claims on anyone. In the hall, the voices ceased, and Park's door closed softly. Cooper tensed, held his breath, listened. But the TV in the room on the other side suddenly switched on, and he couldn't hear voices coming from Park's, or footsteps leaving. Cooper forced himself back to his bag and pulled off his T-shirt to get a look at the scratches. They couldn't even really be called that. More like four angry pinpricks that faded in comparison to the bruises around them. Still, they stung like hell as he rubbed Neosporin in. Everything was hurting more than before for some reason. He put his t-shirt back on and then, after a moment's consideration, his jacket too. If caught, he could pretend to be looking for the vending machines. Park would even approve of that, as long as it was trail mix. Cooper checked that the coast was clear and then stepped into the hall. Not breathing and stepping as softly as possible, he crept the few short feet to Park's door and listened for voices. He swore to God if he heard Javier making any ghost sounds, he would. Park's muted laughter hummed through the wall. Cooper pounded on the door before he could get a rational thought in. Three official knocks, and then another. And another. Across the hall, a woman in pajamas opened her door a crack, keeping the chain on, and peered out. What the hell? Cooper flipped her his badge. BSI, back in your room, ma'am. She slammed her door shut quickly. He was about to knock again when Park's door opened. He had changed into sweatpants and a t-shirt and was smiling. He looked warm and relaxed in every line of his body except for his bare feet. Those were tensed, and he rocked slightly but continuously on the front pads, but that was typical. A quirk Cooper had noticed not long after Park had started spending most nights at Cooper's apartment. Cooper would always wake after Park did and find him rocking gently on his toes by the stove, cooking them breakfast. The familiar sight released something tight and snarled in Cooper's throat, and he sighed. The reprieve was short-lived when Park raised his eyebrow in surprise and said, Oh, it's you. Expecting someone else? Cooper snapped and shoved past him into the room. He glanced around the empty space and frowned at the television where Grace Kelly was gesturing excitedly from a murderer's apartment while Jimmy Stort flipped out in his wheelchair across the way. He punched the off button aggressively. Hey, didn't you say I should watch that? Park asked. He closed the door and was leaning against the little desk pushed against the wall. His hands held the edges and his large shoulders turned in on themselves, making him look smaller than he was purposefully unguarded and non-threatening. Cooper recognized this stance, too. He'd watched Park slip into it often enough while interviewing suspects and witnesses, humans who got edgy, their reptilian brains picking up on some predatory aura Park gave off, or other wolves who recognized him as a threat, no subconscious necessary. Park would pull in on himself like he could trick them into calming down. The weird thing was, it usually worked. And now, he was using it on Cooper, looking touchable and comfortable and sweet. Cooper fought it, unwilling to let go of his anger yet and admit he'd stormed in here for a reason. He grumbled. Yeah, well, who starts a movie right in the middle? 
It was a playful argument they had often, lounging around Cooper's apartment. How could so much about Park feel so familiar while Cooper still knew so little about him? Park tilted his head. Is that why you were yelling at the neighbors and trying to break down my door? To critique my viewing experience? He shook his head, mock impressed. Ebert's got nothing on you. Cooper scowled but drifted toward him anyway, like he was being pulled, and Park shuffled his legs apart slightly until he matched Cooper's height. Cooper ran a hand over Park's chest, smoothing non-existent wrinkles and didn't look him in the eye. No, Cooper cleared his throat. I thought I heard a knock earlier. Hmm, Park said, arching into the touch slightly without moving his hands. He always seemed slightly warmer than most people. Whether that was a wolf thing or a park thing, Cooper wasn't sure. He'd never asked in case the answer was neither and Cooper's own body just flushed every time they touched. After a moment, when it became clear Park wasn't going to continue, Cooper pressed. Was that the ever-helpful Javier? He worked hard to keep the question banally curious, but when he glanced up, Park's lips were twitching with repressed amusement. What did he want? To be helpful, more or less. Park shrugged, but one of his hands drifted forward to ghost down Cooper's spine. Reassuring. Comforting. Help you take a roll in his hayride? Cooper bit out, but even as he did, his hands gentled and dipped lower, playing with the elastic of Park's sweatpants. He could feel the stir of interest brush teasingly at his wrists. What did you tell him? The truth. Cooper hoped Park couldn't feel his hands tremble. Which is? I told him I already had urgent plans. Oh, do you? Cooper stiffened and pulled away slightly, only to be trapped by Park's hand at his back. Park skated his nose along Cooper's jawline, into his hair, inhaling deeply and then back down to nuzzle the sensitive spot behind his ear. Mmm, -hmm. I had the middle of a movie to catch. Cooper snorted. Then I can't say I'm sorry for interrupting. He dragged the tips of his fingers down the front of Park's sweats, tracing the outline of his hardening dick. Park fidgeted, chasing Cooper's fingers, but his face remained unchanged, calm, and mildly amused. Oh, that's okay. If I'm really, really lucky, I'll make it just in time for the end. The hell you will, Cooper growled, shoved Park back and dropped to his knees. He pushed his face against Park's groin, breathing in the familiar musk of his arousal and mouthed along his dick through the fabric. Park huffed and ran his hand gently through Cooper's hair, just long enough to get a good grip in. He'd need to get it cut soon, certainly before he saw his dad. Not that he had any plans to see his father soon, but the recently retired Sheriff Dayton had been phoning about three times a day for the last week, and Cooper couldn't dodge his calls forever. That kind of persistence usually meant he was going to successfully guilt Cooper into a visit. Hey, Park pushed his hips away. Where did you go? I'm right here. Who else's mouth did you think was on your dick? Jealous, Agent Dayton. Cooper looked away from Park's too knowing gaze and pushed his face into the crease of his groin and thigh. Why would I be? Park couldn't pull away again with the desk pressing into his ass, so he gently pushed Cooper's face away, thumb on his chin. Cooper sighed pointedly. He could usually count on sex with Park as the one thing that reliably turned his mind off. If he was busy fucking, he couldn't be expected to do anything else, like fix things or talk. But lately, even these precious, simple moments were being interrupted by his mind pinballing around all the things he tried to avoid. And Park wasn't helping. I don't know, Park said delicately, like he was picking his words carefully, keeping his tone intentionally light. Shall we examine the clues? You ran off in the lobby when Javier started flirting with me. You were skulking in the hallway. Cooper started to protest, but Park cut him off, saying, I could hear you. And then you kicked in my door because you thought you heard a knock. Cooper made a face at him, embarrassed and annoyed. Time to get Park back on track and off focusing on him. He dipped his head so that Park's thumb slid across his mouth. He licked the pad and murmured, You want to solve a mystery now, Scooby-Doo? Really? 
He bit the thumb gently, enjoying the sound of Park's breath hitching. I just don't want you to feel like you can't talk to me about something. This was the opening Cooper should have been looking for, but if it didn't go well, and if he didn't get the answer he wanted, and if... and if... Avoid, 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 his heart beat. He felt another wave of longing for the peace of single-minded, no-expectation sex. Mmm, hmm, okay. Cooper slipped his lips around Park's thumb and sucked, looking up at Park in what he hoped was an alluring way, though an ex had once told him the wide-eyed thing just made him look like a terrified squirrel getting some bad news. Definitely not the image he was going for when trying to get his face fucked. He worked his tongue toward Park's thumb and tried to inject some sultry knowingness into his eyes. Unbelievably, Park was still talking, though admittedly his voice was a bit ragged. I mean, if there's anything you want to say about something. Cooper released Park's thumb with a pop. Christ, you don't quit like a dog with a bone. Wolf with a bone, Park corrected, patting his own dick in his pants. I just don't want you to think... Yes, I agree, Cooper interrupted. I don't want me to think either. He softened his tone and slid his hand slowly up Park's thighs. The only mystery I want to work on right now is the mystery of Agent Park in the motel room. He pulled Park's sweatpants down, freeing his dick to bob in interest. With the candlestick. Park laughed. God, you're a dork. He choked off when Cooper guided Park's dick to his lips and whimpered at the familiar taste. He kissed and licked the head before working about half of Park's length into his mouth, the other half covered by his fist. His left hand reached around to brush the bottom of Park's ass teasingly. Good. That's good, Park said and ran his hand gently through Cooper's hair. Cooper didn't want to go down that mental road again. Instead, he concentrated on the quivering muscles of Park's thighs as he resisted thrusting, the weight of Park on his tongue, filling his mouth the heat and pulse of his taint beneath his fingers. Cooper looked up at Park. His eyes were closed and his head was to the side in an almost quizzical tilt. What was he thinking about? Who was he thinking about? Cooper felt a spike of possessiveness and annoyance. He pulled his mouth off slowly and tapped the back of Park's balls until his eyes opened and he looked down at Cooper. Watch me, Cooper demanded. He rubbed the head over his lips and then tapped it against his tongue. Park growled so low in his throat, Cooper swore he could feel it in his bones. The hairs on the back of his neck stood up. Not in fear. Not exactly, anyway. Not in a way he could ever explain without Park getting that puckered, worried look. But there was vulnerability there, and that frightened Cooper still. He licked a long stripe up the underside of Park's shaft. Mine, he whispered. He felt Park's whole body twitch and looked up to catch a strange expression flicker across his face. His eyes were unnaturally dilated and gleaming. Well, natural for him, but Cooper had an even harder time reading him than usual when he was like this. Yours, Park said, voice gruff, restrained. Cooper groaned and worked Park's cock into his throat as far as he could this time. Park's fingers traced the corners of Cooper's lips where they stretched around his dick. So pretty, he murmured. He nudged Cooper's crotch with his bare foot, and Cooper almost choked. Take it out. You want me to watch you? Then show me how much you like this. Cooper hurriedly ripped off his jacket and shirt, undid his jeans, and shuffled them and his underwear down his thighs while Park watched. He groaned again with the wave of relief when he took himself in hand and stroked. Park guided his dick back into Cooper's mouth and began to thrust shallowly. Cooper's other hand grabbed Park's meaty ass, squeezed, and tugged. His fingers slipped into the crack, searching until he found Park's hole and pressed against the flinching muscle. Park snarled. Yes. And Cooper bobbed his head further, encouraging Park to go deeper to take over and drive the obsessive thoughts away. Park took a gentle but unrelenting grasp of the back of Cooper's head, stilling his movement, and began to fuck his face in earnest. Park knew by now exactly how much Cooper could take, not all, but enough, and controlled the depth with a level of precision and care that made Cooper moan, the sound wet, muffled, obscene. He was pulling desperately at his own dick now, matching Park's pace. 
Fuck, Cooper, I... Park's broken voice was all the warning Cooper got before his mouth flooded with Park's orgasm, fingers tightening in his hair. He greedily tried to swallow as much as possible, but some still dribbled out the corners down his chin. He licked up what had spilled down Park's cock. When he was done, Cooper looked up to find Park watching him, eyelids so low they might have been closed except for the gold glimmer beneath dark lashes. His face was unmoving and unnerving. Oliver, Cooper questioned, voice all spit and grit, his throat wrecked. Park shook his head like he was waking up from a trance. He slid to his knees in front of Cooper, hand still gripping his hair. He pulled Cooper's head back gently, angling his face up, and examined it. Messy, Park said, and Cooper whimpered. Park wiped his fingers across Cooper's lips and chin, collecting the trails of cum and spit there, and brought them down to Cooper's leaking dick, knocking Cooper's own hand away and taking hold firmly. He lowered his mouth down to the long line of Cooper's exposed throat and grazed his teeth across the tendon. My mess, Park said into his skin, so softly Cooper wasn't sure he heard it. One, two... Three hard strokes and Cooper's orgasm ripped through him almost violently, shouting and thrusting through Park's slick fingers. Park's hand released his hair and slid down to support the small of his back, holding their bodies firmly together. Cooper's head flopped forward onto Park's warm shoulder. His gasp slowed to fast breathing, which eventually relaxed into deep, shaky inhales where he could smell the heady mix of Park's skin, sweaty t-shirt, and sex. He became aware of Park's hands stroking up and down his back, from the top of his neck to the bottom curve of his ass. Gentle. Soothing. Protective. Cooper pulled away, avoiding Park's eyes. I should, uh, take a shower. He slipped out of Park's hold and pulled his pants back up with a disgusted wince, then got up and hurried into the bathroom, closing the door. He hesitated over the lock. He wanted desperately to be alone, but locking it seemed like a slap in the face if Park heard it and wasn't even intending to follow. And of course, he would hear it. Cooper left it untouched and hurried out of his clothes and into the shower, turning the temperature up to blistering heat. Hotel water always got so much hotter than his own apartments, but he didn't feel as appreciative as usual. He felt raw, a stripped wire, exposed, delicate, and flinching, it wasn't bad, but it triggered his need for space, as if one touch or one word would zap them both. Or worse, he'd cave and say something stupid. People got a free pass for the shit they say during sex, that was just common courtesy. But directly afterwards was the most dangerous time for Cooper, and before he admitted anything, he had to be sure he wasn't alone. He aggressively scrubbed hotel shampoo through his hair and then down his body. Desert rose. It smelled like every other generic soap out there. How many hotels had he and Park shared together in the last four months? There'd been a lot. A lot of solved cases done by the book, including today. Though perhaps it wasn't as clean a finish as Cooper would have liked. Whatever his colleagues said, they were good partners. In the field. And in bed. Frankly, Cooper had been in committed, monogamous relationships with a lot less chemistry, so why was it so hard to say he wanted something like that for them? They had fun together. Wanting to continue that fun under a different name, or any name really, shouldn't be such a big deal. It's not like he was saying he was in love or anything. He didn't love Park. He'd only met the guy a few months ago and knew almost nothing about him. That would be totally crazy. They got along well, and he wanted to find out if Park planned on them continuing to get along well for the foreseeable future, or if he was interested in getting along well with anyone else. Because if not, Cooper wanted to know now, before he started to really feel for the guy. And that was it. Right? Cooper finished and dried off, wrapping the towel around his waist. He was grateful Park had left him alone and given him space to recover himself. He always did without complaint even though he knew Park liked to be physically affectionate post-sex. That had been a good sign, didn't it? If Park just wanted a fuck buddy, there were lower maintenance options all over the place. In fact, one was just a shout away, wandering the halls and ooing like the ghost of Christmas ass. Cooper bet perfect brows Javier wouldn't run out on a cuddle. 
He grimaced and went back into the bedroom. Park was sitting on the bed, Cooper's jacket in his lap. He was playing with the holes where Fasser's claws had ripped through the material beneath the arm. But he wasn't looking at it, just staring thoughtfully toward the huge window. The tip of his tongue traced the scar on his upper lip. Cooper sat beside Park on the bed and touched his shoulder lightly. Just say it, Dayton, what's the worst that could happen? Park. Oliver, I actually do want to talk to you. About before? He took a deep breath. You told me you wouldn't go in alone, Park said. Cooper swallowed his words, completely thrown off balance. He hurriedly tried to recalibrate. That's not what I... We already talked about this, he said slowly, frustrated that Park, usually so in tune with his needs, had chosen this moment to misunderstand him. A small, frightened part of him wondered if it was intentional, wondered if he was being cut off before he began to mercifully save them both the humiliation of unrequited... interest. I told you, I saw Simpson closing suspiciously earlier. I went into stall. You knew I was on my way with the search warrant. You should have waited for me. Like we said. Like you said. Park looked at him at last, brow furrowed. I didn't realize you had a problem with my authority. Cooper sputtered. Your authority? I didn't mean... Park's face was regretful, but it was too late. Is that who you are? My boss? My alpha? That was a low blow. He flinched like Cooper knew he would. Park avoided all language that could be considered animalistic. His ex pack was his family who he had grown apart from. His daily need to shift was getting a run-in, and the A-word was just a big, fat, no-fly zone, and not because it wasn't applicable. Cooper wasn't an idiot, most of the time. He had seen the way other trust members treated Park. Wary respect, some with deference, others avoidance. Park and Agent Chan, in particular, went out of their way to not cross paths. I like her a lot. Park had explained when Cooper commented on it, wondering if there was bad blood there. I respect her. We just have a couple of big personalities, and that doesn't always... mesh. Cooper's eyebrows had shot off his face. Amy Chan was the most stone-faced, humorless, and quiet person Cooper had ever met. She was also the best interrogator they had. Sometimes all she had to do was walk into the room and the suspect would start confessing. Must be that big personality. She'd always been polite, if a bit standoffish, with Cooper, though. All the trust people were. Despite having more reason to hate him, the wolf agents never once gave Cooper shit the way his own fellow human BSI agents did. Cooper had asked Park about it once, half-joking, relaxed, fucked out and naked in bed around the second week of them being partners. Is that because of you? Have you stuck some kind of no trespassing property of sign on my back? Cooper never forgot the look of horror on Park's face. I have not once thought of you like that, he finally said brusquely, rolling away from Cooper and avoiding his eyes. Cooper felt like Park had sucker-punched him. Right. Of course, I was just joking. And he sort of had been. About the sign. But that look of revulsion quickly masked was as clear a rejection as Cooper needed. This isn't what this is. Don't get attached. Cooper had never tried to reference or clarify their sexual relationship again. Until now. He hadn't even gotten close to the topic and Park had that familiar look of horror on again. Because of the A-word? Or because Cooper had dared hint that there was something else between them besides work and sex? Cooper pushed the panic back and tried to rewind. Laugh it off. So if you're my alpha, does that mean I'm in your pack now? What are the health benefits like? Paid vacation? No, of course not. You know we're not. Like that, Park said, and this time he didn't go with the joke, because he doesn't want you to embarrass yourself hoping for more. No, of course not. The bitterness in Cooper's voice clunked out and fell flat between them like a bat making contact with the ball all wrong. Ugly, weak, and dead on impact. Park must have heard it too. Of course he did because when he spoke again, his voice was gentle and unsure. You are my partner, Cooper. I don't... I respect you as my partner. 
I don't think of you like I... in that way. Our... Park paused and then gestured between them. This other stuff doesn't change that. The hurt, confusion, and disappointment all clamored to the surface, wanting to be the first out of Cooper's mouth. He pushed everything aside to deal with later, in private, and latched onto the anger. He always did. Okay, partner. Then how about respecting my decision to pursue the suspect as I saw fit? I because you know I've been doing this a hell of a lot longer than you have. He could see Park's frustration growing. His corneas were expanding slightly, the carefully contained animal within waking up at the blatant disrespect. Good. Get angry, Cooper thought. He wanted Park as furious as he was. He was so sick of always being the one to lose control, of being the one left trembling and unraveled at Park's feet, the one who had to run and hide his emotions behind closed doors because God fucking forbid he share himself with someone who wasn't willing to share back who even now was trying to retreat behind the same blankly professional mask he gave everyone else. I know you're a good agent. I didn't say you weren't, but sometimes... Park shook his head. This has really not been your night for finishing a sentence. Sometimes what? Park's eyes flashed, and if possible, his face got stonier. I, the senior agent, made a call, and you know what? It got us faster. It got us this, Park countered, holding up the torn jacket. What, a ripped jacket? I was planning on getting that let out in the shoulders anyway, Cooper shrugged as blasély as he could. Saves me a trip to the tailor. Don't joke about that, Park threw the jacket across the room. Cooper's heart raced. Fuck hayrides, the thrill of a good argument was burning through his veins. Vaguely, he knew he should stop, turn back before he broke something irreparable. But the moment he stopped feeling angry, the hurt would set in. What's this about, really? Is it what happened before with... He could hardly say the name. With Jefferson? You really don't trust me on my own with the suspect, just like the rest of them? Of course I do, Park said, sounding exasperated. That's not it at all. If I don't trust you with anyone, it's yourself. Cooper stopped short. Okay, you're going to have to explain that to me. Park eyed the scratches on Cooper's shoulder and then glanced down lingering on the four thick scars across Cooper's belly, peeking out of the towel around his waist, still prominent well over a year later. Sometimes I worry you aren't being careful, like you need to prove something, or... Park gently took Cooper's hand and squeezed. Like you don't care what could happen. Cooper blinked, shocked enough that his anger disappeared for the moment, like a cloud passing across the sun. You think I'm... what... Trying to get myself killed? No, I didn't say that, Park said firmly. But you think I take unnecessary risks? You don't think I handle myself properly in the field? Cooper hesitated, but this time Park didn't argue. That doesn't sound like you respect me as an agent. Park shook his head and stroked Cooper's hand with his thumb. No, I do. I just want to protect you. Cooper laughed quietly, frustrated that Park was toying with the line that he himself had drawn not five minutes ago. But that's not how this works. We're partners, remember? Just partners. I don't need you to protect me. I don't need you to worry about me and feed me. I am a grown-ass man. I don't need you. Cooper's breath caught as the last words slipped out, but it was too late. Park's face had gone carefully blank. He let go of Cooper's hand. Park, that's not what I... No. I understand. And look, you're right. Of course. Park looked away. I'm sorry I made you feel like I don't respect or trust your abilities. That was never my intention. Oliver, Cooper, please. I'm tired. Park hesitated and Cooper couldn't breathe waiting for the rest of that sentence. Tired of having this conversation? Tired of taking this shit? Tired of you? I just want to sleep. Ah, that kind of tired. Either that or he'd changed his mind, because some people actually, you know, think before speaking so as not to hurt others. Park pulled off his clothes quickly, tossing them across the room with uncharacteristic messiness. Can I... Cooper didn't even want to ask because he didn't want to be denied. He cleared his throat. Can I stay? Of course, Park said. Soothing words, but the tone was flat, and he didn't quite look at Cooper as he said it, busying himself with getting under the covers. 
Cooper settled in beside him, not touching, and turned off the lights. The sudden darkness counterintuitively made the room feel less intimate than before. Lights and shadows from the road invaded the space and danced across the ceiling. The occasional voices of people in other rooms drifted in through the walls. Cooper felt exposed and alone. He wanted to reach for Park, to reassure himself of that connection, that he was still... there. But the potential pain from Park pulling away from the touch, or God outright rejecting it, far outweighed the slightly sickening feeling of being shut out from him. Cooper put his hand tentatively in the space between them in bed and watched his own fingers play with the sheet for a while. Then he studied Park's profile from under his lashes. His mouth looked soft and relaxed, and Cooper longed to brush his fingers over it. Park's eyes were still open but unfocused. Awake, but not really here. Obviously lost in thoughts that Cooper could only guess at but did not seem particularly pleasant. The fear of what those thoughts could be pulled Cooper's hand back from the middle ground and rolled him over so his back was to park. He curled up slightly and didn't dare move again until morning. Chapter 3 Cooper listened to the sounds of Park in the shower. His eyes were itchy from a long night's shitty sleep. Well, that was one way to clarify a relationship status. Get the other person to break up with you. Christ, what a fuck up. The shower stopped and Cooper's heart beat double time. He had the absurd urge to run out of the room like if Park didn't see him he wouldn't remember what an asshole he was. The bathroom door opened and Park slipped out with a cloud of steam, scrubbing his wet hair with a towel, another slung low on his waist. Cooper followed the drops of water running down his muscled torso, some of them catching in the dusting of hair beneath his belly button, others making it all the way to the towel's edge before being absorbed. He licked his lips. Even when Cooper was anxious, overtired, and upset, Park managed to turn him on. Good morning, Park said, interrupting him staring. He was smiling slightly and sounded normal enough, but his eyes were shut off in a way Cooper hadn't seen in a while. Not since they'd first met and Park had been keeping secrets. It was the first time Cooper realized just how much Park had relaxed around him since then. Well, not anymore. Good morning, Cooper said, wincing at his own scratchy voice. Park started rooting through his carry-all. Cooper knew he should get up and go to his own room to dress and pack, but the tension, Cooper's, or Park's, or both, was like a third guest in the room, and he was afraid of leaving Park alone with it. He cleared his throat. Uh, Oliver? Park looked at him, and Cooper struggled to get his tongue in position. To say something. Anything. Are you upset? About... last night? No. Park smiled, but then quickly turned back to his bag. Okay. Cooper watched him for a moment. So, are we good? At what? Park replied, voice a little wry. It was an obvious joke, but cut Cooper off at the knees. Checkout's in an hour. Will you be ready to head out by then? Yes, of course, Cooper winced, sitting up and glancing at the clock. For not feeling like he slept at all, he'd certainly slept in. I figure we can get breakfast on the road. Or not. D.C. isn't that far, Park shrugged. Park not caring about food? Cooper's gut, which rarely had problems these days, cramped viciously, and he doubted it was from the possibility of not getting fed. The slight anxiety he'd felt before blossomed into full-on fear. He was suddenly convinced that if they went back home without fixing this, he'd never see Park again. Not like this. Not like he wanted to. They wouldn't be going back to Cooper's together, that seemed sure. Park would disappear to his own place to freshen up or to check up on some things, and while he was gone, he would think about just how not worth it Cooper was. He didn't even know where Park lived. Generally, yes, but he'd never been there. It was always Park calling Cooper up, always Park stopping by, or picking him up, or coming home with him. Park making the effort, while Cooper had obstinately refused to show the slightest interest in Park's life, too afraid to show his cards. Well, now he'd bluffed too far and Park didn't want to play anymore. 
Oliver. Park looked at him, waiting. A flicker of something behind those hard, amaretto eyes that gave Cooper the tiniest bit of hope. If he could say the right thing, find the right words to explain, maybe... Somewhere on the floor, his phone started vibrating. Cooper scrambled for it distractedly, and when he looked up again, Park's expression had closed. He answered the call. Dayton. Coop, it's me. Dad. Hey. Park tossed his towel over a chair and started getting dressed. I finally caught you before coffee, huh? What? Cooper blinked, trying to refocus from Park's firm ass and his morose wondering if this would be the last time he got to see it. Could he continue working as partners with Park, having him so close but untouchable? A daily reminder of his screw-up. Only your pre-caffeinated brain forgets to screen my calls. Sheriff Ed Dayton, no, recently retired ex-Sheriff Dayton, laughed too loudly. Cooper winced. It's not like that, Dad. I've been on a case. Sure, Coop, sure, Ed interrupted dismissively. Just checking what you decided on for this weekend. This weekend? Cooper repeated dumbly. Trying to salvage his relationship, digging his way out of 30-plus years of emotional repression, spilling wine and tears at an unimpressed boogie's feet like a sacrificial offering if the above didn't work out. Your brother and Sophie's bash. Don't tell me you're screening your mail now, too. The Bureau of whatever lending you out to the NSA? Cooper grunted, tuning out his dad's usual ribbing. He'd completely forgotten about his brother's engagement party writing it off as sometime in the fall and to be worried about then. Well, technically it was fall now, and the party was this weekend. Shit, he muttered. Park paused in pulling on his shirt and looked up at him, concerned. Cooper shook his head to communicate everything was fine. Except nothing was fine. He hadn't been to Jagger Valley since last winter. Not even when Ed had called him a month ago to tell him he had stepped down as the county sheriff catching Cooper completely by surprise. Dean had chewed him out about not coming to visit after that. But he just... couldn't. Not with Park and work and everything slipping through his fingers at home. Not after the last disastrous visit. He'd told himself he'd see his dad soon enough at the engagement party, and by then his own life would be figured out. Shit, Cooper repeated with more feeling. Park made a move toward him and then stopped. The memory of last night's argument still drifted between them. I don't need you to worry about me. Park jerkily forced his gaze away from Cooper and continued dressing. Don't tell me you forgot. Ed's voice was steely with disapproval. No, of course not. I just... I'm heading back from Ohio today. Then you have to pass by home anyway. Come early. I could use you on a few projects I've got going. I'm with Ollie... My partner, Park... Well, bring him along, Ed boomed, his voice echoing in the room. I'd like to get to know the man sharing my son's cubicle. I don't know if... Coop. Please. Dean wants you here. The whole town's coming practically. You know Dean. What are people going to say if his only brother doesn't even show up to his engagement party? They're going to think you have a problem with Sophie. What? Why would I... They're going to think you're sore because you still love her. Park's whole body twitched at that. Wolf hearing, picking up every word of the conversation whether he wanted to or not. He grabbed the motel coffee pot and carried it into the bathroom to fill with water. Cooper groaned and pushed the phone tight to his ear. Dad, we were twelve. So? It's not exactly like you've brought anyone else home to meet me. Yeah, well. Sophie Odell was his first and last girlfriend. She'd moved away after high school to go to some prestigious college, gotten married, had a kid, Gotten divorced, moved back to Jagger Valley, opened a veterinary clinic, and in Cooper's opinion was way out of Dean's league. Still, he wasn't exactly pining no matter what his dad said. I think I've moved on. Good, and there's no reason you can't be there, Ed said cheerfully. Bring Bench. Park? Yep. I don't know, I'd have to talk to him. Cooper glanced toward the bathroom. Part of him rebelled at the thought of introducing Park to his family and mixing the two halves of his life, his two selves. He wasn't out in Jagger Valley, and despite the inevitable fantasy of just showing up with a man like Park on his arm and an accept me or fuck you on his lips, he wasn't sure this was the practical time to change that. Dad, Dean, I'm gay, and this is the man I'm having sex with. 
Is he my boyfriend? I'm not sure. Partner? Well, we work together. Though frankly, that part of our relationship has been showing some problems as well, and now I'm not sure if he even wants to be with me as a fuck buddy anymore. Yeah, no. He wasn't doing that. Not until he fixed whatever was happening now. But Cooper feared if he left Park in D.C. and spent the weekend in Jagger Valley with this uncomfortable tension left between them, by the time he got back, there would be no semblance of a relationship left to fix. Maybe... Maybe if Park was with him in Jagger Valley, it would be easier to talk. It was overambitious to work on a personal and professional relationship at the same time. That was the problem with covering someone's ass in and out of the field in different capacities. All their issues were getting muddled up. Away from work, maybe Cooper could see if Park cared about him just as a partner, or as a... partner. He imagined Park at his side for the inevitable hours of fishing and hiking with his family, having his warm, steady arm around him at night. Keeping back the gloom his childhood home always seemed to invade upon his mind. Coop. Cooper, are you listening to me? His dad was saying. Of course. Not. Ed sighed, not fooled. Coop, listen. This weekend is... important. Okay? Yeah. It was. Because hell, if he was going to let Park slip away without a fight. And if there was one thing Cooper was good at, it was fighting. He promised his dad he'd get back to him and said goodbye. He could still hear the sink running in the other room. Either Park was washing the hell out of that coffee pot, not a bad idea, or he was trying to give Cooper some semblance of privacy. Cooper knocked in the partially closed bathroom and pushed it open. Park was standing at the sink, overflowing pot in hand. That's enough for me, thanks, but what about you? Cooper said. Park twitched a smile on the mirror, turned the water off, and fiddled with pouring a reasonable amount out. Did you catch most of that? I apologize, I wasn't trying to intrude. Park always sounded a bit prep school when he was uncomfortable, a result of being raised by wealthiest sin grandparents who had always kept their families separate from the local kids. Park had once joked his grandparents still operated on the feudal system. As the biggest, oldest pack around, they taught their children to be responsible for the town, but did not allow them to get close to the regular people, human and wolf alike. He'd laughed when he'd said that, but Cooper's heart had ached for the little Oliver who craved companionship and attention but was constantly denied both. It's fine, Cooper said hurriedly. Good, actually, now I don't have to go over it again. So? So? Do you, uh... Want to come? Park met his eyes in the mirror. You don't have to invite me just because I overheard your father say so. I know. Cooper said, a little peeved, I want you to come. Park frowned at that. You do? Yeah, of course. I mean, my dad will probably grill you on whether you played ball, any ball, in high school. Dean will slap your back a couple hundred times. Everyone in Jagger Valley will show up to the party, invited or not, because everyone loves golden boy Dean Dayton. And all downtime will be dedicated to hiking and fishing or talking about hiking and fishing. It'll probably be awful. So really, if you were smart, you'd stay the hell away, and it's pretty selfish of me to even ask, but I'm selfish. What else is new? Yeah, I want you to be there. Cooper felt a little out of breath, and his heart was beating unusually fast. God, he'd babbled through that. Park turned around, so he was face to face with Cooper, his expression a little unsure, but warmer than before. I played basketball freshman year of high school. Does that count? Cooper laughed. No, not at all. In fact, that'll probably just set him off on a lecture about follow-through and commitment. Why'd you stop? I got cut. I was terrible. Really? Yes. Park tilted his head. Why do you look so happy about that? Do I? No. <laughs> Cooper tried to school his expression, but Park squinted at him suspiciously, and eventually a grin broke free again. He snagged the front of Park's shirt and twisted it in his fingers, suddenly unable to resist touching him. I guess it's just nice to know you're not perfect at everything. Park seemed to think that over, perhaps looking for hidden digs or sarcasm. Eventually, almost tentatively, he said, 
Well, I was really embarrassingly bad. Can't dribble for shit. Cooper tugged Park still closer and slid his free hand around Park's waist. Go on. When my hands are above my head, I'm all thumbs. Can't catch a thing. Mmm. Cooper pressed their bodies together and inhaled the curve of Park's neck to his shoulder. I never once made a free throw. Ooh, baby, the things you say, Cooper groaned. Park laughed, a deep rumbling in his chest. The sound loosened the pulsing knot in Cooper's chest that had been there since last night. He pressed a quick kiss to Park's clavicle and pulled back. Seriously, though, it will be horrible and boring and a complete waste of your free weekend, but do you want to come meet my family? It would be my honor and pleasure, Park said. Cooper snorted. You've never been more wrong. In the car, the tension of before seemed mostly forgotten or put aside, and Cooper was relieved. Park didn't hold grudges or sulk. For Cooper, who said the wrong thing all the time, a seemingly endless supply of fresh starts was helpful. If this was a new beginning, he'd take it. He was happy and grateful to move on. To joke and talk with Park about nothing in particular as they drove into Maryland and made their way to Jagger Valley. In fact, Park seemed even more chipper than usual. It was a good sign that Cooper had made the right choice in asking him to come. As they got closer to town, Cooper talked less and less. It had been months since he'd been back here, and he couldn't even remember the last time he'd arrived as a passenger, free to soak in the scenery as they passed by. His old elementary school the smell of the Chesapeake Bay permeating even the closed car, signs in several yards telling him to vote Bell, all bringing back memories. Few of them good. His dad had been sheriff, or working for the sheriff's department of this county, for most of Cooper's life. Dean had joined the same department right out of school. Cooper was supposed to do the same. The Dayton boys keeping the county safe. That was the plan. Except Cooper hadn't come back after school. He had gone straight on into his master's for criminology and from there to Quantico. That had been Cooper's plan, ever since the summer before freshman year of high school, to get out of Jagger Valley and stay out. He just never quite got around to telling his dad and Dean. The more time he spent away, the easier it was not to talk. That was true for a lot of things. He fidgeted. How long has it been? Park asked. January. He could feel Park's surprise. After all, D.C. was only an hour away. My last visit wasn't exactly a big success. What happened? Cooper snorted. Nothing happened. Nothing ever happens here. It was just... Freezing his ass off as his father dragged him and Dean on hikes through the woods. Guts still recovering from surgery and unable to eat the same food or the same amount as his family, but unwilling to admit it. Trying to anyway, and then vomiting it all up whenever he could get a moment alone. Getting asked incessant questions about his new job transfer to the Bureau of Special Investigations. Getting asked when he was going to get sick of stuffy offices and city life and come home and do some real work. Getting asked when he was planning to meet someone. Settle down. Didn't he know Ed had been married to his high school sweetheart with two kids by his age? Didn't he want to be happy? Cooper was supposed to spend the whole weekend. Instead, he had left the first night. It was just bad timing. Park looked at him curiously, and Cooper hesitated. This wasn't the usual stuff they talked about. Family. The past. But if he wanted this to be a relationship, he supposed that included a bit of opening up and sharing thoughts deeper than their typical conversation of whether the book or movie version was better. I had just broken up with someone, Cooper said finally, and then after a moment he braved it and added, I had just gotten dumped on my ass, actually. He signed on to date an FBI agent, apparently, and wasn't that impressed with my new can't-talk-about-it job. Ryan had also said Cooper had turned into an angry, paranoid, jumpy lunatic two steps away from building a bunker, but there was a limit to this sharing thing. It hadn't been easy discovering a whole new world of werewolves living amongst regular people, and though he hadn't realized it at the time, 
The adjustment wasn't helped by his new partner and mentor feeding him lies about how violent and unstable said werewolves were. Cooper snorted. Unstable. Park was the most balanced and solid person he knew. Jefferson was serving life in a padded cell, and in Cooper's opinion, the pads were more than he deserved. I'm sorry, Park said. I'm not. He wasn't... You. It really wasn't a big deal, but being here right after wasn't great. Because you're not out to your family? Amongst other things, Cooper said vaguely. Look, about that though, I probably should have said something before, but is that going to be a problem with you? Because I didn't plan on changing that this weekend. Probably. He was always coming close and then bailing once he actually got there. It's nobody's decision but yours, Park said easily. I can respect that. Right. Thanks. Obviously, I'm not asking you to lie about yourself. I'm just... I don't know if this is the right time. For me. It wasn't that he was ashamed of being gay, or even the sort to avoid a fight if that's what it would come to, but that didn't automatically mean coming out to his family was the best decision for him. There had been a period of Cooper's life where people he loved just seemed to disappear one after the other, and despite whatever Park thought... Cooper did in fact have a self-protective instinct. So in middle school, when he had first started to recognize his feelings about boys for what they were, he had flinched away from the risk of losing anyone else from his life. Then, after that, all he'd cared about was getting away from Jagger Valley and living his own life far away from the people there. It hadn't seemed important whether he was out or not back in this tiny town that he didn't even plan on coming back to. He didn't owe them anything, they didn't deserve to know. By the time it did seem like it might be important, he was out of school and a real adult with plenty of relationships behind him. The sheer amount of time that had gone by, not to mention the number of things he was already lying to his dad and Dean about, made the whole thing seem daunting. It was just easier to put off until later. And the less he came back, the easier it was. Ed was a hard man. Hard to please, hard to live with, and in a way, hard to love but he was Cooper's dad. He had raised two little boys on his own after the love of his life had died at 32. He had done his best, and God knew it wasn't always great, but the thought of maybe losing him and Dean now after all these years of losing the last connections Cooper had to his mom, it just made him lock himself down deeper as they turned onto his old street. It's this one right up here. He pointed to the neat little white and brick house on the corner. Park pulled into the driveway and cut the engine. Cooper stared at the house without really seeing it. He hadn't lived here in 17 years. Got annoyed with his dad when he referred to it as Cooper's home. And yet somehow, it still was. In school, he'd learned that the human eye doesn't bother much with details. It picks up edges. Differences, cues that the brain uses to fill in the rest with memory and reason. That's why people could read whole sentences with the middles of each word muddled up. That's why Cooper could look at nothing but the wind chimes by the front door. Bright red glass cardinals. His mother had loved birds and could see the whole house. The small front yard his father still mowed every Sunday. The hall bench Cooper had spent his time outside while staring up at his father's sheriff's hat on a hook above his head. The wood flowers polished and white walls kept immaculate except for the small patch of butter yellow in the back room that his mother had painted to test out the color but never had time to finish, and Ed had never painted over. All right. Cooper looked at Park, momentarily surprised he was there. This was a difference. There had been no Park the last time he had come home. Yeah, of course. The question is, are you ready? Cooper teased. A strange expression passed Park's face that Cooper couldn't quite identify before it was gone, and Park nodded. If Cooper didn't know better, he'd say it was nerves, but Park didn't get nervous. Cooper had seen him take down wolves whose claws and fangs were fully out with a relaxed smile on his face the whole time. Hell, he'd seen him remove Boogie from his spot on the couch without blinking an eye. Not a task for the weak of heart. Or skin. Cooper must just be projecting. Then let's do this. He opened the door and hopped out. Just, if things get to be too much around here, remember your safe word. Park smiled and followed him toward the front door. Right. 
what was it again? Safe word. Ah, nice and easy and just a little bit subversive. My yearbook quote, what, easy or? A roar shook the house. Cooper reached for his gun, spinning off the front step toward the sound before remembering he wasn't carrying. Not even his taser. The scars in his belly pulled sickly and the roar carried on longer than it should. Cooper shook his head. Were his ears ringing, or was that? A mini-excavator rounded the corner of the house and paused, rumbling in the driveway. A small version of those big diggers, though still about seven feet tall, used to tear up ground or knock down houses. It was so unexpected Cooper had to resist looking back at the house to check that they hadn't wandered into a different yard. The long, toothy arm moved up and down jerkily, like a wave. What do you think, Coop? His dad's voice, clearly shouting but hardly understandable over the roar of the machine, was coming from the metal and glass control booth. Cooper just shook his head, not bothering to try being heard. Not that he knew what to say. He looked back at Park, still standing on the step, looking quietly amused with just a touch of that mysterious something else. Park met his eyes and raised an eyebrow. The roar abruptly cut off and his dad clamored down. Ed Dayton was one of those people who had settled into a certain look early and stuck with it. His gray hair was short and no nonsense, while his thick gray mustache distracted from the deep lines around his mouth. His face was tan bordering on leathery, and besides a soft gut he was fairly fit, with big shoulders and chest, much stockier than Cooper, who took after his mother in stature. Ed had looked this way as long as Cooper could remember, which had made him seem old and worn for a 40-year-old but pretty damn good now for a retired man in his mid-sixties. He certainly seemed energetic and happy as he strode toward Cooper and slapped him hard on the shoulder three times. The scratches there screamed. Ed frowned at his flinch and then slapped him once more on the same spot. You're late, kid. Cooper suppressed a sigh. He'd only told his father he'd be coming straight here a couple of hours ago, had purposefully avoided giving an ETA, and was still somehow late. The miracles of family. Park, giving them space from the front step, finally approached. His stride was typically silent, but Cooper could tell he was getting closer by the way Ed's eyes widened, the color a familiar faded brown and green, the same as his own. Dad, this is Park. Oliver Park. My partner at work. The BSI. Cooper bit his tongue. Any more clarifications and he'd need to supply his father with an index. Oliver, my dad, Sheriff Ed Dayton. Just plain old Ed now. Sir, good to meet you. Park looked uncharacteristically intense, almost a little grim as Ed shook his hand with his usual firm one-two pump, then went all out and gripped his shoulder with his left hand. Whoa, big guy, huh? Depends who's asking, Park deadpanned, and Ed brayed his startlingly loud laugh that always sounded a little off, like he'd read how to do it somewhere. Ha, 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 true. Still, I bet you can teach Coop a thing or two on the bench. What? Well, he didn't get shoulders like this from lifting textbooks and filing papers, did he? No, just from running around in his arms, Cooper bit his tongue again. At this rate, he wouldn't have any taste buds left by dinner. Of course, if his dad was cooking, that was a good thing. Well? Ed finally stopped groping Park and turned back to Cooper. Isn't she something? He gestured proudly at the excavator like he'd built the thing himself. You didn't buy this, did you? Nah, Ramon's lending her to me, for the weekend. For the party? Cooper asked. Ed gave him a hard look. For yard work, Cooper. With this, we can finally make some progress. On what? The moat? Cooper expected another unamused look, but his father turned abruptly away and started quizzing Park on, of course, his ball-playing history and avoided Cooper's eyes. Cooper frowned. He drifted away while Park and Ed talked basketball, following the deep, muddy grooves around the house toward where the excavator had come from, an uncomfortable feeling in his stomach. Coop, wait! His father called, but it was too late. He rounded the corner into the backyard. It was not immediately obvious what was going on, though it should have been. Half of the yard was the same. Same neat little patio. Furniture and grill nestled against the big back windows overlooking the field. Town-owned open space that their yard and several of the other neighbors backed up on. And beyond that, the forest. 
looming pine trees casting grim shadows across the field, hiding the flooded patches between the weeds. The other half of the yard, the side he always avoided looking at, was a mess. His dad's ancient tools were propped up against the tiny garden shed that separated their yard from the hardwicks next door. Tire tracks and gaping holes scarred the grass like a brutal attack. In the center of the activity stood the familiar, crumbling, skeletal structure circled by lavender bushes, though all the flowers were dead and gone by now. You're tearing down the gazebo? Coop? Ed sighed like this was the end of a long and ongoing argument and not a total shock. Nothing had changed about this house in 25 years, and now that it was, he was starting with this? It's falling apart, the beams are rotted, it won't survive another winter. It's always been like that. Cooper's voice sounded dazed even to his own ears. Park moved to stand quietly beside him. Cooper could feel him watching him intently. He cleared his throat. Why now? Your brother's getting married. There's going to be kids running around here. Sophie's daughter, Kayla, and who knows, maybe more soon. Maybe you'll finally come home and start a family, eh? This house needs kids growing up in it again. Cooper grimaced both at the idea of living in this house again and his dad talking like that with Park right there. But Ed cut him off. What do you say, Oliver? Bet you didn't expect to be put to work this weekend. I've learned to expect the unexpected with Cooper, Park said lightly. Did that sound overfamiliar? Cooper shifted a little away from him and then, annoyed at himself, shifted back until they were practically touching. Ed didn't seem to notice anything. He was laughing. Yeah, Cooper never could go about things the way he was supposed to. Park and Ed laughed together at that. Irritated, Cooper took a firm step away from both of them, irrationally annoyed they were already getting along better than Cooper and his father did. Ed said, Know anything about demolition, Oliver? Park was an English professor, Cooper said. His dad and Park both looked at him, surprised. Before the tr- Before the BSI, obviously more deconstructing tropes than buildings. Park narrowed his eyes slightly, like Cooper was a suspect who had just let slip a clue and he wasn't entirely sure where it would lead yet. That's true, Park said slowly. My brother is in construction, though. Ed slapped Park's arm again like that was exactly what he'd been hoping to hear. boy, Come take a look at these blocks around the base and let me know what you think. As they discussed the teardown that was to take place tomorrow morning, Cooper was surprised by how angry he felt, especially considering he hated looking at the gazebo. Mom's gazebo. He never went near it after she died, and he wasn't the only one. Even now, as Ed crouched to show Park the concrete blocks at the bottom, he stayed a careful distance away from it and never once stepped inside. None of them ever did. His mom used to sit there for hours, reading or watching the birdhouse or just gazing out at the field while Cooper and Dean and all the neighbor kids played. Does Dean know you're tearing it down? His dad stopped pointing out the chipped paint. Your brother, he started and glanced at his watch. An old, sensible waterproof number he had bought himself after returning the Rolex Cooper and Dean had saved up to give him one birthday, years ago. Your brother is going to be wondering why we're late to dinner. I promised him I'd bring you two straight over. Dean had obviously not been wondering any such thing. He was taking a nap in the hammock outside when they rolled up to his house barely ten minutes later and only stirred when a barking blur tore down the long front lawn toward them. Beluga! No! Dean struggled to consciousness and out of the hammock, but he was no match for Beluga, an ugly tan and white cattle dog mix whose aggressive bark sounded like she was in the mood for some steak tartare. Cooper braced himself. Dogs didn't like him. Maybe because they could smell boogie on him, maybe because he gave off anxious, unstable energy. A big no-no in the dog-eat-dog world, according to a late-night Nat Geo binge. Beluga must have seen the same show, because her eyes zeroed in on Cooper. Beluga, heel! Dean finally disentangled himself from the hammock as Park drifted forward to stand at Cooper's shoulder and growled just slightly under his breath. Beluga stopped abruptly about three feet away. Her head dropped, huge ears flattened back, and her shoulders hunched and quivered like there was a great big invisible weight there. She whined and licked her lips, but no longer seemed aggressive. Wow, I can't believe that worked, 
Dean said, trotting over to them. He didn't look anything like Cooper. It was like they had evenly divvied up their parents' genetic material and Dean, being three years older, had gotten first pick. Cooper had been a skinny kid who worked out hard just to be a willowy adult with muddy, washed-out, brown-blonde hair and not particularly memorable brown-green eyes. Meanwhile, Dean had been graced with their father's broad, sturdy build while his hair and eyes were their mother's brown. So deep and dark it was almost black. Overall, it was a striking combination. Intimidating. Not a kid to be messed with, but then who would? Everybody loved Dean. The Dayton boys, people said, couldn't be more different. And though they'd technically divided up the genetics evenly, it was Cooper who always felt like the changeling. Dean and Ed slapped each other's backs, and then, to his surprise, Cooper was pulled into Dean's arms for a brief back-slapping hug. For a weird moment, even though he was taller, he felt every bit the kid brother again. I'm happy you could come, Dean said as he pulled back, looking as awkward as Cooper felt. Yeah, of course I came, Cooper muttered, embarrassed to remember how desperate he'd been to get out of this weekend. Uh, Dean, this is my partner, Oliver Park. Dean looked Oliver up and down carefully, his dark eyes seeming sharper than usual before he grinned and offered Park his hand. Welcome. It's good to finally meet you. Cooper frowned at that. He was sure he'd never mentioned Park to his family before besides the vague partner. Maybe Dean was confusing him with someone else. Maybe Jefferson. Before Dean could say anything else, Cooper clarified, We've only been together a few months. Park just, uh, transferred from another office. And before that, he was an English professor, Ed said patronizingly. Honestly, when's the biography coming out, Coop? Cooper flushed. Park said, Congratulations on your engagement. Thanks, man. Dean smiled more naturally this time and then pulled Park into a hug for good measure. Park stiffened. Like most wolves Cooper had met, he wasn't big on people in his personal space uninvited. Not that Cooper blamed them. Cooper started forward, unsure where this new physically affectionate Dean had come from and how he could get him to back off. Um... Just then, seemingly unable to take it anymore, Beluga let out a piercing whine moan and whatever invisible weight had been on her shoulders took her down to the ground and rolled her to her back. Dean laughed. The hell is up with you today, girl? He released Park and patted the dog on her exposed stomach. Beluga glanced between them and Park before whining again and staring determinedly away from both. Where are the girls? Ed asked. Kayla's trying on her Halloween costume, because, you know, the big day's only a month away. Soph's on the phone ripping the caterer apart. I came out here to steer clear of the bloodshed. That woman has the scariest passive-aggressive voice you've ever heard. Dean grinned while he said it, though, a note of awe in his voice. Ed huffed. I told you that fancy caterer stuff was going to get too complicated. Horace could have fixed you up with more wings and beers than you knew what to do with. Let me call up Art and get you a deal. Dean cut him off firmly. Sophie's got it under control, Dad. And if not, and we all end up eating roasted caterer, then you and Art can bring the beer. How does that sound? Cooper blinked. He'd never heard Dean disagree with their dad before, and he watched Ed closely, waiting for the sharp blow-up, but it didn't come. Idiot, Ed just said with finality, but not much heat. He started up the lawn grumbling. Dean shrugged and smiled at Cooper slapped him on the back again, and they all followed Ed toward the rambling ranch house. When Cooper was here in January, Dean had been living in a dingy little bachelor's apartment over a laundromat that always smelled like detergent. Pleasant and homey at first, but migraine-inducing after a couple of hours. He'd heard from his dad that Dean had bought this place with Sophie in the spring, but he hadn't been expecting it to be so, well, nice. Huge windows caught the setting sun, and pine trees around the property gave the place some privacy from the road. It felt like a million miles from the Jagger Valley they'd grown up in. And Dean was different from the guy he remembered, too. As kids, though he was only three years older, Dean had seemed as distant and unknowable as a star. He had the same burning intensity in everything he did, too. But now, here, he was chatting casually with Oliver about their drive down. And the weather and landscaping. He was calmer and happier and just different. Maybe Cooper wasn't the only Dayton who had grown up. The thought left an oddly bitter taste in Cooper's mouth he wasn't sure he was ready to understand. 
So he pushed it away and followed his family forward. Chapter 4 Somebody loves you, Kayla said to Park. Cooper dropped his fork. The six of them were eating pesto pasta with cherry tomatoes and Parmesan cheese at a large rustic farm table complete with benches. Cooper had somehow gotten trapped between his father and Sophie while Park was on the other side with Dean and Kayla. Oh, Park said, leaning down a bit to talk to her. She looked a lot like Sophie had at that age. Same big, dark eyes. Same rich, deep brown skin. Her smile even had the same crooked gap between her two adult front teeth that dwarfed the baby teeth around them, though Sophie had outgrown that bit by now. The biggest difference was Kayla currently had curling whiskers painted on her face and a pair of tawny felt cat ears propped up on her curls. Do I get to know who? Kayla pointed down. All of them leaned back on their benches to look under the table. At Park's feet, Beluga was curled up, panting with her eyes closed. She looked totally blissed out. I've never seen her sit through a whole dinner without begging, Sophie said. All right, I'm impressed. What did you do, bribes? Tranquilizers in your socks? Decoy dog? Park laughed and Beluga's head tilted toward him, eyes still closed, mouth still open, like she was laughing with him. Let's just say we came to a mutual understanding. Ooh, tough and mysterious. Sophie nodded her approval and then winked at Cooper. It was a trip spending time with her again. Even weirder to see her interacting with Kayla as a parent, and weirdest of all to see Dean do the same. Cooper and Sophie had been pretty close friends in elementary until everyone, kids and parents and teachers, started dropping not-so-subtle hints that boys and girls weren't friends. Couldn't just be friends, anyway. The awkwardness, the sense that adults were looking at them like they'd done something wrong or strange put an end to it eventually. But he had missed her. So Cooper had asked her to be his girlfriend because that seemed like the thing he was supposed to do to make his father happy and still get to keep his friend. It hadn't worked at all. Dating at that age just meant lots of giggling from their friends any time they interacted, and soon even that came to an end as well. Sophie was asking Park, Is that some sort of requirement to be in the BSI? Sounding all tough and mysterious. Do you get cool sunglasses? If you tell me, do you have to kill me? Ed snorted. I doubt that. They took Coop after all. Cooper focused on spearing a cherry tomato with his fork. Cooper's tough. Sophie said, tone intentionally light. Remember when Gabriel Bell dared us to jump off the back dock into the roped-off part of the marina? You know, the side where all the sea monsters live? She wiggled her eyebrows at Kayla. Yeah, why exactly did we think the sea monsters stayed in that section only? Because sea monsters can't swim under ropes. This is a fact, trust me, I'm a vet. Did you do it? Kayla asked, wide-eyed. Your Uncle Cooper sure did. Jumped in before Gabriel could get the first bark out after calling us chicken. Cooper felt an unexpected surge of pleasure at being somebody's Uncle Cooper and smiled gratefully at Sophie. Yeah, and then I froze in the water, too scared to kick down and swim back. He just tried to tread water in one place, keeping his knees as high as possible, absolutely convinced something had touched his ankle. Sea monster or not, something probably had. God, he'd hated that marina. But Cooper had done a lot of shit just because Gabriel Bell had told him to. Eventually, your mom had to jump in and save me. Sophie flapped her hand. Nah, it was teamwork. Not that Gabriel was jumping in to help. So I guess we know who the real chicken was. I saw some vote Bell signs on the drive-in. Is that Gabriel? Cooper asked casually. Nah, his sister Eliza, of course, said said. Finally campaigning for mayor. She's only been preparing for it her whole life. You remember how she is. Not really, Cooper said. He knew Gabriel had two siblings, Eliza and Ja-something. Jack. No, Jacob. Maybe. But they were at least ten years older than him and hadn't been around that much. Besides, neither of them had been the bell he'd had eyes for. Well, she's a shoe in Though rumor is this is just a stepping stone. She has her eye on governor eventually. Always has. I don't know what it is about this generation that thinks they're too good to stick around town. Hey, Dean said, what about me? Ed ignored him. I wouldn't be surprised if she ended up back here one day. Everyone comes home to the valley eventually. He looked at Cooper. 
Dean laughed awkwardly. Cue the organ music. Jesus, Dad, that didn't sound creepy at all. Anyway, what about you, Oliver? Ever do anything totally stupid on a dare? I'm one of six and smack in the middle. Stupid dares were actually a strict requirement of staying in the family. See this here? Park pointed to the scar that cut through his upper lip. I got this because of a dare from my siblings. What happened? Cooper straightened in his seat, practically holding his breath in anticipation of a rare tidbit of Park's personal life. After four months of Park never speaking about his past, Cooper wondered why he was so easily offering up stories now. Was it as simple as because he was asked? Or was he, too, trying to pull the conversation away from Ed's pointed comments? Once, when I was just a little older than Kayla, my older sisters dared me to jump out of a 70-foot pine tree onto the horse barn roof. Awesome, Dean said. He caught Sophie's eye and hastily added, I mean, how horrible and stupid. I bet you got into a lot of trouble. So, uh, did you make it? Sophie rolled her eyes. Oh, I hit the roof fine, then kept going right through it. Rotted infrastructure, Ed said with emphasis. Very dangerous. Cooper bit his lips so hard he wouldn't be surprised if he ended up with a scar himself. Park continued quickly. Fortunately, I landed in a stack of old blankets, but that was just luck, he said to Kayla, so don't you go trying it, even if cats do land on their feet. I'm not a cat, I'm a jaguar, she said primly. As an apex predator, we don't need to climb trees. Too right. Wait a minute, Cooper said. You're saying you fell 70 feet through a roof, and walked away with literally just a scratch. Actually, the scratch came later, he shrugged. My coat protected me. Fur coat, Cooper realized from Park's overly casual tone. He tried to imagine a child wolf-shaped park plummeting through a barn roof, but he'd never even seen an adult wolf-shaped park. He always left Cooper's apartment to do his necessary daily shifts and usually returned before Cooper woke up. Cooper never asked where he went or why he didn't just do it in the apartment, not wanting to seem voyeuristic, and Park never mentioned it. So if the jump didn't do it, where did the scar come from? Dean asked. Well, while my siblings were laughing their butts off at me, my youngest brother decided to give it a try and climbed up the tree. Beside Cooper, Sophie whispered, Crap, nearly silently under her breath. Indeed, Park agreed. He freaked out at the top and couldn't get down. I noticed first and went up to get him. He had dug his claws into the trunk and would not let go no matter what. Cooper's eyes widened, and he glanced at the others to see if they were confused by Park's casual reference to his brother's claws, but no one blinked, probably accepting it as creative imagery. I probably should have tried to talk him down, but I was impatient. So I just yanked him off and he lost it. Sliced my lip right open. Poor kid, Sophie said, both of you. Did you get down okay? I managed not to toss him. Barely. And I bet you've never let him forget it, Dean laughed. Park grinned, and the scar disappeared. Made a speech all about it at his wedding last year. Speaking of which, when's the big day? And just like that, the conversation shifted away from him and the wall of privacy was firmly back in place. Now, that was more like the park Cooper knew and, well, knew. Oh, not till the spring, Sophie said. That's plenty of time to get those pesky last-minute details done, like booking a caterer, buying a dress, settling on a venue, you know, background stuff. I'm going to be the ring bear, Kayla said. That's right you are, which reminds me, put get rings on the to-do list, Soph, Dean said. Sophie gave him a thumbs up. I have my outfit ready, Kayla added proudly. Do you want to see Uncle Cooper? Uh, sure. He didn't spend any time around kids besides Ava, and with her, they only ever talked about Boogie. Still, Kayla seemed pleased as she scurried away, easily escaping the bench, lucky girl, and disappeared upstairs. I think she's trying to shame us with her preparedness, Dean said thoughtfully. Oliver, consider yourself invited. You have until May to come up with an embarrassing anecdote about one of us to tell for a toast. Park glanced at Cooper with a strange expression on his face but laughed. Not his usual deep rumble. Something lighter and forced. Challenge accepted. So, how did you two meet? Sophie refilled Cooper's wine glass and then her own. 
Someone broke into the clinic and stole diazepam. I reported it, and Deputy Sheriff Dayton here showed up. In retrospect, I probably shouldn't have tried to tough out my cat allergy by insisting on searching the overnight kennel myself, but fortunately she goes for the eyes swollen shut type. Could have been you, Coop, I'd said. They used to date, you know, he told Park. For like a week, Cooper muttered. We were twelve. Dating just meant we were awkward and stopped talking to each other more than anything else. Park snorted. Sounds familiar. Ed leaned forward like he wanted to hear more about that, but Sophie said, Um, excuse me, it was more like a month, Dayton. But maybe, yeah, that was because we were too busy avoiding each other to do the actually breaking up. Okay, point. Still, you will always be my first love. She grabbed his hand and fluttered her eyelashes at him absurdly. Cooper laughed. He was surprised how nice it was to be around Sophie again. He didn't think he'd missed her. Not actively for twenty-plus years, obviously. But there was something soothing about being around her again. Now that would have been a good story, Ed pointed his fork at Cooper. Childhood sweethearts find each other again. Thanks, Dad, Dean said wryly. Real nice. I'm just saying, when I was your age, I was married with two boys doing what I loved for the town I love. What about you? Cooper thought of Fasser snarling and Simpson sitting on his chest with razor-sharp claws fully extended. True. Unlike Dean, I don't really get a lot of opportunities to flirt on the job. He caught Park's eye, flushed and murmured. Not with civilians. But are you happy sitting back in an office? Ed pushed. Rachel always said you'd... He broke off the way he always did when accidentally mentioning Cooper's mother. There was an awkward silence and then... I'm just saying you used to always want to be running around getting into trouble. I don't want you thinking you have to do some stuffy job because, well, I can't say I know why. I think Cooper still manages to get into plenty of trouble, Park said, and Cooper kicked his foot toward his shins. An inhuman yelp pierced the air and Cooper blinked at Park for a second before looking under the table. Beluga had moved to peer distrustfully at him from behind Park's legs. Shit. Language, Cooper Isaac, Ed said, nodding at the doorway where Kayla had snuck back in, wearing a little royal blue velvet suit jacket and matching pants and a different pair of ears, rounder and fuzzier and bear-like on her head. Er, sorry, my foot slipped. The dog looked like she knew a lie when she smelled it. He saw the same expression on Park's face right now. Somebody isn't very happy with you, Kayla said. Cooper didn't bother asking her who. That night, Cooper shifted under the cool sheets and tried not to look too closely at his surroundings. The posters of baseball players, all retired now, that he'd hung up across his bed for reasons that were about 40% baseball-related, the battered dresser with CD cases scattered across the surface, his room preserved in time as if he had just walked out. In a way, he had. Maybe that was the problem. Dean had stayed on longer moving back briefly after college, slowly dismantling his room until it was an empty office space without even a spare bed. But Cooper hadn't wanted to bring anything with him he didn't have to, and his dad had apparently left it all untouched, same as the day he'd left home at 17, as if Cooper might still come back one day looking for his Walkman. Lying in the dark, surrounded by his childhood things with the trundle bed pulled out and waiting, he felt like he was having a sleepover. He even had that same nervous energy. When Cooper was a kid, his dad rarely let him have friends overnight, so it was a big, exciting deal when it happened. He had that same momentous feeling now. Though he and Park had shared a room plenty of times before, here in his old bedroom, his father asleep down the hall, the uniformed stars of his earliest fantasies staring down at him, it felt different. The door opened and Park slipped in, returning from the bathroom. Hey, Cooper whispered. Park nodded at him and then looked around the room with a neutral sort of curiosity. He hadn't gotten a good look before. Cooper had insisted he stay with Ed while he set up the trundle and carried their bags in, wanting to limit the amount of time Park spent in here. He shouldn't have bothered. Park was taking it all in, darkness be damned. Cooper could see the quick rise and fall of his chest that meant he was sniffing the room. Cooper wondered what he could smell. He wondered if the years of sadness and laughter and anger and frustration and loneliness and longing had left some invisible mark on the walls. 
especially the longing, for something exactly like this. A man who saw him for who he was, accepted him, and could drive Cooper crazy. Though perhaps in his childhood fantasies he hadn't pictured this mystery lover sniffing his room quite so intently. Do you want to come to bed? Cooper shifted slightly on the too small mattress. It would be uncomfortable and risky, and it took Cooper's breath away how badly he wanted it. Park hesitated, then drifted over and sat on the trundle instead. A cacophony of screeches and whine sounded like a jungle brawl from the aged springs. Cooper laughed softly. Yeah, well, the same back at you, he said and caught the shine of Park's teeth. They sat in silence, and Cooper began to relax into the pillow, bone-tired from staying awake all the night before worrying. He had specifically wanted Park to come to the valley so they could talk in a new setting. Fix things. Come to an understanding, as Park would say. He should open his eyes and do that now. But the familiar, steady cadence of Park's breathing here in this room that had once been both his sanctuary and his prison made him feel safe, and he slipped into an almost drugged tranquility. Are you falling asleep on me? No, just resting my eyes, Cooper said. Or thought. He felt Park lean over and brush his lips against his hair. But he might have just imagined that as well. His mother's gazebo came apart in ugly chunks. Cooper had imagined it would be like a house of cards, toppling over into its original elements. Planks and beams and shingles all in a pile at their feet, as if ready to be reassembled again. That wasn't how it worked at all. Whether through solid construction or time melding its bones together, the gazebo was one whole entity now, and every toothed attack from Ed's prized machine ripped hunks away like flesh, with all its skin, nerves, and tissue trailing behind. Dean helped Kayla keep a steady stream of water from the garden hose on each new tear to control the dust and debris. It flooded at their feet in a discolored pool. Cooper looked at that instead. Okay, Park asked and touched his shoulder gently. Cooper twitched away from his hand and glanced automatically at his father, steering the excavator jerkily and yelling instructions no one could hear as he ripped to the gazebo again. Fine, why wouldn't I be? Park was quiet, and Cooper looked up at him. He looked... tired. Spiderweb lines crept out from the corners of his eyes and mouth, and he held his neck and shoulders stiffly. I warned you, Cooper said. Park quirked his brow. About? Cooper paused and then settled for a light tone. I warned you this weekend wasn't going to be fun. How horrible is the trundle bed? I've had worse nights. The last of the gazebo, a crooked, uneven spire that jutted into the sky like an accusation, crumbled under the machine's final strike, and Kayla cheered. Well, you look like you won't survive another. Oliver Zero, Mattress One. Park shook his head, smiling. Porcupine, he said. Cooper felt heat rush to his face. It was something Park called him occasionally in private when Cooper was being especially prickly. Whether it was meant out of affection or exasperation, Cooper wasn't sure, but it sounded intimate in a way they both usually avoided and tended to do unpredictable things to Cooper's physiology. We could switch tonight, Cooper said. Park looked at him and raised an eyebrow. Switch what? Cooper nudged him and then lingered with his shoulder pressed against Park's for a moment. Beds. I don't want you in pain. Not that a thirty-year-old twin is going to rock your world, but it's something. Park's eyes flickered with a sort of soft, pleased surprise, but he said, I literally rearrange every bone in my body on the daily. I promise a mattress is not going to break me. He poked Cooper's back. Some company on said mattress, on the other hand. Might not break you, but would certainly break the bed, Cooper finished with an incredulous laugh. That sounds like a challenge. He shook his head mournfully. And you used to hear so well. Park's response was lost in the noise of Ed driving the machine over the pile of debris, crushing the rubble and the few lilac bushes left standing. Sophie had suggested trying to save the plants by digging them up and transplanting them somewhere, but Ed had flatly refused delaying the demolition. Besides, I've always hated the smell of lilac. Dean? Coop? 
Dean had just shrugged, and Cooper followed suit. The lilacs, like the gazebo, reminded him of his mother's last days, just before the final move to the hospital, when she was too weak to move around much, and he spent most of his time visiting her in the gazebo. He supposed he should be just as angry that his father was destroying them, but the truth was, he hated the smell as well. Especially during the very last days of the flower's bloom, when the edges of the petals soured to brown and the smell thickened to an overpoweringly sweet rot, like a mouse forgotten in a trap. Across the field, something caught the afternoon sun in the second-floor window of old Mr. West's house and flickered a bright white light. Cooper squinted, but the light disappeared. Of course, Mr. West probably didn't even live there anymore, or live anywhere at all for that matter. He'd already been old and terrifying when Cooper was a kid, always watching the neighborhood kids play in the field. Still, it was the terrifying ones who seemed to live forever, and something about that flash tickled a sleepy memory in the back of Cooper's brain. I ran into your father sitting in the gazebo this morning. Cooper looked at Park, startled. What? he said, not sure he'd heard correctly over the destruction around them. Ed was sitting in your mother's gazebo. Cooper frowned, not sure what to do with that information, so he filed it away for later and focused on the second part. Why do you call it that? My... My mother's gazebo. You don't talk about her much, but nearly every time you have, you've mentioned that gazebo, Park shrugged. I took a guess. Cooper didn't say anything for a long time. She liked to sit there and watch the birds at the feeder. She was so happy she cried when a little bird family started nesting in the birdhouse. They had never had before. How old were you when she died? Eleven. Diagnosed with ovarian cancer when he was nine. His clearest memories of her were from when she was sick, but she'd still managed to cement herself in his mind as his ally parent. Rolling her eyes when Ed would go off on one of his lectures at Cooper, she would tell a joke and they'd both relax. She made everything lighter. Easier. He often wondered how things would be different with his dad if she hadn't died when he was so young. It was longer than they expected. She said she was hanging on for Dean to become bar mitzvah and make sure he didn't chicken out. Talk about a guilt trip. Park laughed. Did you have a bar mitzvah? Nah, not for me. All the personal responsibility, none of the gift cards. Dad made me keep going to Temple for a bit, but I don't think he even noticed when I stopped. He was pretty out of it after... afterwards. Cooper felt oddly guilty saying that. His dad always presented a strong front, and to admit, even if it was just a park, that he had once showed weakness felt like a betrayal. They got married out of high school, Cooper added quickly, as if that was the only reason Ed could be affected by his wife's death. Young. Yeah. Well, that was Dean's doing too, actually. But now Dad thinks anyone in their 30s and single is bound to die alone. Cooper suddenly felt uncomfortable and exposed. He realized with a jolt that aside from the cute little tree story last night, he knew about as much about Park now as he did within the first three days they'd met. Not that he asked that often. Accusing someone's relatives of being involved in murder and mass conspiracy tended to make chats about the fam awkward later. Cooper knew he had been raised by his scary, rich, alphazilla grandparents, but Park was frustratingly vague about his past. The one time Cooper had asked what had drawn Park away from academia and into the agency, he'd said, I wanted to fix things, and left it at that. What about your parents? Cooper asked now. Park looked away to watch the last of the gazebo being flattened beneath the wheels. What about them? His voice was flat, but the strain around his eyes and mouth had deepened. Cooper took a step back. Park rolled his shoulders and shook out his arms suddenly, like he was fighting a cramp. Sorry, maybe you were right and the trundle bed got to me worse than I thought. Cooper touched his arm gently. This house makes porcupines of us all. His words rang out across the suddenly silent yard as the excavator was powered off and he yanked his hand away. Ed hopped down from the control box and clapped his hands. Now we just gotta clear this away. Coop, stop gabbing over there. It's time for some real work. October or not, Cooper was sweating hard by the time they tossed the last of the rubble into the back of his dad's truck. That wasn't so bad, Ed said, closing the back with a final thud. 
His face was red and his mustache dark with sweat, but there was a look of satisfaction and almost relief in his eyes. Whatever, Cooper mumbled, rubbing at his stinging eyes. The dirt and wood dust stuck to his skin and made his eyes burn more. In the yard, they could hear Kayla singing to herself and swinging a shovel, smack, smack, against the big dirt hole where the gazebo had been. Ed clapped him on the back. We couldn't have done it without you. Cooper looked at him, surprised, and Ed continued. If you hadn't brought Oliver, we'd still be breaking our backs. Right. Yeah, he's handy like that. He's a beast, Ed countered, clapped him on the shoulder and squeezed. Cooper stiffened. No, he's not. Ed laughed. Whatever, Coop. The point is, you could learn a thing or two from him. You're skinnier than ever. Did you know I caught him sneaking out to go for a run at the crack of dawn? I told him he'd better save his energy for today, and it's a good thing he did. Yeah, I heard about that. Cooper paused, not sure if he should ask. What were you doing up, out here? Ed fiddled with the truck door and watched Kayla, who had given up hitting the dirt and was trying out digging for the moment. You used to do that. Sing to yourself. All the time. I can't sing. Believe me, I know. The whole neighborhood knew. Ed looked past Kayla to the field and the houses beyond like he was seeing a different time. Dad, Cooper hesitated. Why tear down Mom's gazebo now? Really? Ed sighed. Coop. He shook his head and looked at Cooper, then squinted. Are you crying? What? No. Cooper scrubbed again at his burning eyes. It's just the stupid dust. Last bit coming through, Dean called out. He and Park were carrying a chunk of support beam still attached to some shingles that Cooper was fairly sure Park could have carried on his own, literally single-handed. Cooper stepped aside as they tossed it into the back of the truck with a lot of grunting on Dean's part and a scraping groan from the already full truck bed. Cooper pulled the bottom of his t-shirt to wipe the sweat off his face again and then just pulled the whole damn thing off to use the clean inside instead. Whew, that's the last of it. Too bad Soph had that poodle surgery and didn't get to see my masculine prowess, Dean was saying, wiping his hands in his jeans. Actually, what with the whole wood spider incident, maybe it's for the best she wasn't here to see me scream, What is that? Ed interrupted. His voice was so sharp and urgent, Cooper automatically snapped to attention, his hand reaching for a weapon that wasn't there. But there was no threat. Ed was staring at Cooper with a twisted expression of anger and horror. Cooper blinked, a bolt of unease pulsing through him to see his father look so furious. What? That. Ed moved toward him quickly, hand outstretched, and in the corner of his eye, Cooper saw Park step forward, watching Ed intently while Dean just looked back and forth between them, confused. What happened to you? His eyes flicked across Cooper's body, and for a moment, Cooper thought he was going to make another critique of his muscle mass. Then he realized what that was and wished he hadn't. Oh. He tried to cover the bruises and scratches on his arms, just some bumps from the last case. It's nothing. You know how easy I bruise. Looks worse than it is. Does that look worse than it is? Ed stepped closer, pointing to the thick scars running down Cooper's belly. Park stepped closer as well, and Cooper stepped away from both of them, but pushed up against the truck. Because that looks like you were mauled by a... by a bear. Close, but no cigar. I wasn't. I just... Part of being in the BSI meant lying. He did it all the time. He'd been lying to his father about all sorts of stuff for a lot longer than he'd even been in the BSI. But something about the expression on Ed's face, like he was angry enough to kill, turned his mind blank. Cooper looked at Park, but his partner had that closed-off, empty mask firmly in place. Beyond him, Dean was frowning. It was nothing, a few stitches and I'm good as new. You are in the hospital? Dean asked. For how long? I don't know, a week? Cooper lied. Maybe longer? You hate hospitals, Ed said, so low Cooper wasn't sure he heard right. Yeah, well, they didn't really give me a choice of venue. Who did this? Nobody, it's nothing. Nobody? So you did it to yourself? Ed had grabbed Cooper's forearm right above the wrist and was squeezing so hard Cooper could feel the pulse in his fingers. He didn't pull or push him, just held him like a drowning man. Park had stuck his arm in between them like he was one second away from sweeping his arm out and knocking Ed across the driveway. Cooper felt a flicker of fear for his father and then immediately guilty for thinking that of Park. No, God, just some asshole I was chasing down, okay? Back off, Oliver. He swatted Park's arm away with his free hand. Park let it drop but stepped closer. When was this? 
I don't know, Dad. A while ago. Don't worry about it. I am your father. Don't you tell me what to fucking worry about. Cooper froze, and even Ed seemed shocked. He didn't shout, and he didn't swear. He'd always been a hard man, but firmly in control. In the yard, Kayla's singing had stopped. Dean? They heard her call cautiously. Coming, Dean yelled back, and then more quietly. Dad. Dad, come on. He stepped forward and touched Ed's shoulder lightly. Park was practically on top of them at this point, the four of them standing way too close, and Cooper felt the insane urge to just turn and run away and not stop running until he got home. His real home. In D.C. Dad, Dean repeated, and Ed looked up at him like he didn't recognize him. Cooper hadn't seen that look since his mother died. You've been working all day. Let's get some water, okay? Ed nodded, releasing Cooper's arm slowly and leaving white finger marks behind. Without looking at him or Park, he followed Dean into the backyard. What the actual fuck? Cooper whispered when they were out of sight. I haven't seen him like that since... I've never seen him like that. He thought he was shaking but realized the quivering was coming from Park, pressed against him shoulder to shoulder. He pushed him away. That goes for you too. What was that about? Why are you crawling up my ass right now? Park turned abruptly, walking away, taking a few deep breaths, and then circled back to Cooper. He looked upset. They don't know anything at all, do they? Cooper felt his heart stutter and restart, beating faster, sharper, until he could feel it in his throat. He said slowly, What do you mean? I mean your family doesn't know anything about you. He whispered, You know I'm not out with them. I told you that. I warned you. An echo of the words he'd spoken just earlier that day, but he wasn't joking anymore. The adrenaline swirling around his veins from before was settling and clotting into anger. Is that why you keep touching me? Trying to get them to figure it out? Because if that's it, Park, you can fuck right off. It isn't your decision. Whatever we are, it's mine. No, Park bit out. I'm not trying to out you. I'm saying they don't know you at all. Yeah, they don't know you're gay, and you're right. That's your prerogative. It's your family, and I'm not involved, as you keep reminding me. But what about everything else? The BSI? Cooper lowered his voice. You're upset because I didn't what? Tell them about werewolves? Is that what all those little hints were supposed to be last night? You wanted to know if I told them about... you? Park was shaking his head, but wouldn't look Cooper in the eye. What did you tell them you do at the BSI? Because it sounds like someone told them you work in the office all the time and don't go into the field at all. Cooper's face flushed at the accuracy of that, so there was no point trying to deny it. So what? It's easier that way. Think about how bad my dad is now with calling and shit. And that's when he thinks my job is boring and I bring shame onto the law enforcement family tradition. What's wrong with calling? Park said. Besides, you'd probably get along better if he knew what you did. Or some version of it, anyway. If he can't be proud of every part of me, he doesn't get to know the rest, Cooper hissed. I'm not some kind of fucking pick-and-mix bag. They didn't even know you were in the hospital. Park's voice was raised now, his eyes dilating and possibly glowing gold. Though through the haze of Cooper's frustration with his father, everything seemed brighter. You almost died, Cooper. Yeah, and... You think if he'd seen me tubed up in some hospital that would fix us? That he'd realize just how precious life is and forget all about what a disappointment I've always been to him? I don't know what kind of feel-good TV special you were raised in, but that's not going to happen. You don't know him. You have no idea what it's like being lied to by your family. Finding out you didn't know them at all. Not until they die out of nowhere and you can't even mourn them properly because they didn't trust you enough to keep you in their lives. Park's lip curled back as he spoke revealing slightly elongated canines. He had never flashed his teeth at Cooper before, but then he had never looked so angry before. Cooper had a feeling he wasn't the only one projecting. There was the taste of old wounds opening up in the air between them, rank and bitter. A shiver ran down Cooper's spine. Park looked away and scrubbed his hand over his face. After a moment, he said into his hands, I'm sorry. That wasn't... I didn't mean. The automatic words, that's okay, hovered on Cooper's tongue, and he bit them back. It wasn't okay. It was a mistake to bring Park here. Instead of making things better, he had just made them worse. Sometimes letting people get to know more about you didn't bring you closer. 
It just gave them more reasons to want to walk away. After a long moment, Park looked at Cooper again. His face was red from rubbing, but his eyes and teeth were normal, or rather restrained. Look, maybe I should... Park broke off as a strong breeze ruffled his hair. Cooper felt some more dust lodge in his eye and scrubbed at it, irritated and a little panicked. Maybe he should do what? Take a break? Go back to D.C.? But Park wasn't looking at him anymore. He had turned his back and Cooper could hear heavy breathing. For one horrifying moment, he thought Park might be crying. His stomach dropped. The thought of Park upset. Maybe even hurting. It pulled a wave of protective anger through him and an even stronger desire to wrap his arms around him and hold on until the tension in his shoulders melted away. Oliver? Park didn't respond. Please don't leave, Cooper blurted out. I'm sorry. Park shook his head abruptly and then snorted, like he was trying to clear a bad smell from his nose, and Cooper realized he had been sniffing the air and not sniffling. He felt a hot wave of embarrassment flood his face. Park was giving him an odd look, but then called out, Kayla? And jogged toward her, still digging and singing in the loose dirt where the gazebo had stood. Kayla, come here. What? Cooper followed Park to the backyard and Kayla hopped toward them. Kayla, can you go inside and find Dean for me? She frowned. I'm digging. Kayla, please go get Dean. This is important and there's no one faster. She made a face. Clearly not fooled and a bit insulted, Park thought she might be. She looked at Cooper questioningly. Stupidly, he felt a little smug she trusted him over Park as the adult had turned to. But whatever Park was up to, he felt confident there was a point. Go ahead, Kayla. Please. Trusted adult or not, he was not safe from her incredulous face either. Still, she pranced toward the house. Park crouched in the pit where she had been digging and started to scoop dirt away with his hands. If you're looking for somewhere to bury your bone, I can think of a few better places than that. Cooper joked weakly, confused and not sure if they were still fighting or not. Park grimaced, stood, and wiped his hands on his jeans. Somebody beat me to it, he nodded at the ground. Cooper took a few steps closer to see. At Park's feet, protruding from the dirt, was a row of brownish-white teeth, flat-topped, all crammed together in one tight row and still attached to the filthy bottom jaw of a human skull. Chapter 5 Cooper started to suspect something was wrong when the FBI arrived. Well, more wrong. He, Park, his dad, Dean, and Kayla had all been shuffled into the front room. This kept them far away from whatever was happening in the backyard, but with prime seats to watch a big black SUV pull to the curb in front of the house and two suits step out. Do you know them? Ed asked, and Cooper rolled his eyes. No, Dad, the FBI's a little bit bigger than the sheriff's office, he snapped, and Dean shot him a look. Cooper resisted the urge to stick out his tongue. It was hard not reverting back to childish rhythms here. The agents, a tall Latino man and an equally tall white woman, swaggered across the front lawn and into the house with such perfect synchronicity it had to have been practiced. It was moments like these that he sympathized with his father's disdain of the FBI. The agents headed straight for the back of the house, ignoring the front room completely. Cooper frowned and went to stand by Park, who was sitting calmly in the corner of the room. Something's up, he murmured. Park raised an eyebrow, expression otherwise unchanging. Besides the body just dug up in your father's yard? Cooper rolled his eyes. A skeleton, he corrected. It could be ancient or something. Park looked skeptical. Well, it had to be there before the gazebo was built, and who knows how long that's been here. Before my family moved in, at least. But now they're freezing us out. The Jagger Valley uniforms had started friendly enough, or as friendly as one could get over human remains. They'd all known his dad and Dean from the county sheriff's office, of course, but at some point, the tone had changed and the front room began to feel more like a holding cell than a safe place. And now the friggin' FBI? What the hell are they doing here? I know the Jagger Valley Sheriff's Department isn't exactly equipped, but this seems a bit much. With your father and brother's connections, it wouldn't exactly be ethical to have their co-workers investigate. Sure, if they were suspects, Cooper scoffed, but not this. Park glanced pointedly to the right, and Cooper noticed his family intently eavesdropping. 
he sighed and shut up. As far as they knew, Cooper and Park were the FBI. And they were. Sort of. But there was a distinct separation between the rest of the FBI and the BSI, one he doubted the newly arrived agents would let go without comment. The last thing he needed was suspicions from Ed and Dean that he was lying about his job, especially after what had gone down with Park. Just then, the suits walked in. Cooper watched their eyes take in the dynamics. The front room, like the gazebo, had been his mother's space while his dad had spent his time in the back rec room, and it showed, even after all this time. The brightly colored furniture peppered with cozy blankets, the little glass bird figurines she'd loved peering down at them from the shelves, the photo books on Patagonia she'd pour over, planning an elaborate trip that would never happen. Cooper didn't think a single item had been moved in the last 25 years. Kayla was curled up on the couch with Dean at her side reading her a book about South American amphibians. Beside them, Ed was tense and uncomfortable in one of his mother's straight-back chairs. Park was removed and separate on the other side of the room, and Cooper stood caught between the two groups. Both agents' eyes stuttered over Park, barely noticeable unless you were trained to look for these things. Cooper glanced back to try and see what they saw. Park was a big man, tall and powerfully built, and his posture was carefully arranged to look relaxed and innocuous. Cooper was used to this, but something about it seemed more effortful today. The raw power of the wolf was running closer to the surface than usual. He looked... dangerous. And the agents had noticed, too. Cooper stepped in front of Park, interrupting the agent's gaze. What's going on? I'm Special Agent Permelis, and this is Agent June, the man said. We just have a couple quick questions. This shouldn't take long. Cooper sighed. It shouldn't, but it would. And it did. First, a Jagger Valley deputy and friend of Dean's was asked to sit with Kayla in another room, and then they were each asked to introduce themselves, their reason for being here, and their movements through the day. It was harder than it sounded, and predictably, Ed interrupted to say Cooper and Park worked for the FBI as well. BSI, Cooper corrected and showed his badge when they asked. Whatever his dad was trying to do wasn't going to work. He remembered being an FBI agent himself and hearing rumors about the mysterious BSI. Even the FBI weren't aware of the true purpose of the Bureau. But it was hard keeping a secret, especially in the government, and most agents suspected there was more going on than the cover story. Those suspicions graded, giving the BSI agents a weird reputation. Many FBI agents disliked and mocked them, while at the same time were desperate to be a part of it and in on the secret. And, Mr. Park, you're also with the BSI. For how long? Not long. And you're in town for Mr. Dayton's engagement party? Yes. As a friend of the family, Primalis asked. Yes. Park's tone didn't change, but something about him, maybe the way he was watching Primalis with an almost detached, unblinking stare, raised the hairs on Cooper's arms, and he didn't think he was the only one. He had never seen Park make so little effort to put a person at ease before. Not unless he was confronting another wolf. Cooper watched the agents closely as they continued questioning, but he was almost positive they were human. Only humans would continue to push Park when he was like this, either ignorant to all the warning signs or, like Cooper, just pig-headed enough to pretend they were. So you were just finished clearing this gazebo away, Primalis gestured at Park's filthy hands. Could you explain again why you were digging around in the dirt with your hands, Mr. Park? I saw something. You saw something, while you were standing by the truck, June prompted, but Park just shrugged, face aggressively blank. Cooper almost felt sorry for them. Clearly not getting anything from Park, June changed focus to Ed, tone overly casual and friendly now, and Cooper breathed a sigh of relief. There was nothing subtle about his dad's back-off signals. Mr. Dayton, with a busy weekend ahead of you already, why'd you decide to tear down the gazebo today? Ed opened his mouth, shut it shook his head. I don't know. Cooper's eyebrows shot up. What? He glanced at Dean, who looked just as confused by their father's response. It was falling apart, rotting, right, Dad? Ed shrugged, but he didn't look at him. Cooper turned back on the agents. Why are you here? Why are you treating us like suspects? Primalis stared at him coolly. Just trying to figure out how a murdered man ended up under your gazebo. Murdered? Dean said. Without a doubt. Well, how should he know? Cooper said. 
That gazebo's been here for ages. Maybe you should find whoever lived here before us. Right, Dad? His father was shaking his head, lips pressed together and frowning. We also have a tentative ID on the victim, Alex Hardwick. Cooper could sense the stillness from his dad and Dean, the sudden tension, but feeling every inch the baby brother, he couldn't stop from babbling on, confused and playing catch-up. You mean like Mrs. Hardwick next door? Her husband, yes. But he... He left her. Recently, Cooper wanted to say. But of course it wasn't recently. It was around 25 years ago now. But he could remember Mr. Hardwick clearly. He'd always smelled of cigarettes and those hard cinnamon candies he sucked trying to cover up the smell. He'd laughed a lot a lot more than Mrs. Hardwick, and visited the field while the neighbor kids were playing to join them for a game of catch, though he didn't have children of his own. Thinking back on it now, Cooper realized he'd been a very handsome man. Blue-black hair, and snapping dark eyes. Cooper could remember feeling pleased when Mr. Hardwick ruffled his hair and gave him cinnamon candies, though he probably did it with all the kids. It was hard to marry the memory of that man to the empty bones in the backyard. Harder still, knowing Alex Hardwick had disappeared when Cooper was a kid and somehow ended up under the gazebo that had supposedly already been there. How is this possible, he said. The agents weren't looking at him anymore. They were looking at his dad. Why did you say the gazebo went up, Mr. Dayton? Ed jerked his head and avoided their eyes. I didn't... I didn't say I don't... remember. Cooper blinked. The obvious lie took the breath out of his lungs. Dean cut into the awkward silence. It was a couple years before Mom passed. I was in seventh grade, I think. Coop, you were nine, remember? Cooper jerked his head, scanning his memory for a time before the gazebo, but the results were fuzzy at best. He spent as little time as possible thinking about his childhood. After his mom had died, everything about those first eleven years was seen through a lens of loss and what could have been. And it hurt. It just hurt. So he stopped thinking about it, and eventually the less important memories had faded. That happened to be the same summer Alex Hardwick disappeared? Dean shrugged but said, yeah, I guess so. He glanced at their dad, but Ed was just staring into space. And did you have a company put the gazebo in, Mr. Dayton? Uh, company? Ed repeated back like he didn't understand the question. Cooper didn't get why he was taking this so hard. Was it disturbing that their missing neighbor had been rotting away in the backyard all these years? Hell yeah. But his dad was acting like they'd told him they'd just dug up mom or something. Dad, Dean prompted. No, I built it myself. Thought it'd be nice for... No wonder it's falling apart, huh? He laughed, his forced awkward laugh, and no one joined him. A uniform approached the room and hovered awkwardly in the doorway. Stop lurking and come in, Damien. Ed called, beckoning him closer. The man, Damien, waved back but didn't come in any farther, just looked at the agents and jerked his head toward the backyard, clearly uncomfortable. Excuse me, June said and went to speak to him in the hall. Ed blinked at their retreating backs and for a moment, seeing him look lost, embarrassed, and old, Cooper felt a strange surge of protectiveness for his father, something he'd never felt before. B.S.I. Bureau of Special Investigation, right? Primalis said thoughtfully. Remind me, what is it exactly you guys cover again? Especially violent crime, Cooper muttered, feeling like committing one himself. It was the standard response they were told to give, but while his dad was still out of it, lost in his own thoughts, he could see Dean listening with narrowed eyes. So he'd told his family he worked behind the scenes— Paperwork, mostly, and some traveling up and down the East Coast evaluating law agencies. A sort of oversight and research committee. Yeah, he'd lied. So what? And Mr. Park? Mr. Park? Primalis frowned. Park was staring into space, eyes half-closed like he was falling asleep or concentrating. Oliver Park. Dean was watching him with confusion, and Cooper punched him lightly in the arm. Park shook his head and smiled. I'm sorry, what were you saying, agent? Before Primalis could continue, June came back into the room and gave him a very unsubtle and significant look. We'll need to talk to you separately now. Mr. Ed Dayton, we'll start with you. Is there somewhere private we can speak? She looked at Cooper. 
uninterrupted. What? Why? What did you find just now? What happened? His dad seemed to finally get a hold of himself at that point and come alive, though not in the way Cooper expected. Cooper Isaac, enough. They're just doing their jobs. Of course I'll give a statement. Dean, take care of your brother. Cooper spluttered at that and looked at Park. But Park was watching Ed with his classic closed expression and didn't say a word as the agents led Cooper's father away. It was dark by the time the suit stopped the grilling and the crime scene guys started to pack up. Cooper stood in his old bedroom and looked over them as they finished removing the last of the bones. He had already watched them take soil samples and bag and tag all of his father's tools. It was a familiar scene, one he'd overseen plenty of times on the job, made surreal by the fact it was happening in his childhood backyard. The dark figures moving around in the shadows looked like aliens, imposters, and he had to stop himself from running out there and screaming at them to get out. They didn't belong here. Caddy corner to the yard, Mrs. Hardwick's house hunkered down in darkness. In her back window, overlooking the crime scene, Cooper could sometimes catch movement, so slight it could be the reflection of bat wings as they swooped and soared for their evening meal. Or it could be Mrs. Hardwick, doing the same thing he was, reviewing the reality of life for the last twenty-five years and making edits. While he had climbed into his mother's lap where she sat in her gazebo, a man had been buried, still meaty and whole, ten feet below them. While he had been getting his first kiss, flat on his back in the field, streaked with mud and under the stars, a man had been turning into desiccated flesh and bones, flat on his back, forty feet away. While he had fought with his father and lover just hours ago, a man's bones had been slowly revealed beneath Kayla's singing and stomping feet. And those were just the changes that he, a nobody, a random neighbor kid to Mr. Hardwick had to make. What new reality did his wife have to piece together after finding out her runaway husband had never made it farther than the neighbor's yard? Hey. Park came into the room and stood next to him. That took a while, Cooper said. I didn't think they'd even want to talk to you. Mmm, Park sighed, they're being thorough. What was that about before? In the front room? You were listening to what Damien told Agent June, weren't you? Park grimaced. Yeah. They found the murder weapon buried with the Vic. Okay, that's good, right? It looks like someone bashed his head in with a long-handled hoe. The hoe matches the other tools in your father's shed, Cooper. No, he said automatically. I mean, fine, I'm sure a lot of people have the same kind. Maybe. But his is missing. I noticed this morning, and so did the agents. Okay, so what? He doesn't even garden. Park held up his hands. I'm just telling you what they're thinking. What do you mean? I may have done a bit more eavesdropping just now. Good. That's good, thank you. Park was shaking his head. What, what's wrong? They're coming at him hard, Cooper, and he's... not really helping himself. Help himself? Why should he need to help himself? He won't answer their questions. Because he doesn't have to. Cooper protested, feeling uneasy, remembering the way Ed had completely shut down earlier. He's innocent. If you were in their shoes, what would you think of a witness with means, motive, and opportunity kept evading every question? Motive? What motive? Park looked away. I don't know. He paused. Then, they implied Hardwick was a bit of a flirt. Cooper laughed. And what, my dad freaked out? I know I've been weird about coming out to him, but I didn't mean to make it sound like he's a monster. They weren't saying Hardwick was flirting with him. Cooper blinked. My mom? No, that's ridiculous. You don't know my parents. You don't know her. I'm just telling you what they were saying. Cooper looked away from him back to the window. It was so dark now that his own reflection almost entirely blocked the outside scene. After a moment, Park's hand smoothed over his shoulder across his shoulder blades and down his back. Cooper swayed into the touch. Despite being kept waiting, each of them separate and doing nothing for hours, he was exhausted. A part of him, a big part, wanted to turn to Park to burrow into his warmth and strength and not come out till next spring. Are you okay? He straightened, pulling away from Park's hand. The FBI thinks my dad murdered our neighbor, Oliver. I'm fine. How are you? I've been better, Park smiled. 
Besides that, how are you? It's weird. I really thought that gazebo had always been there, you know? Even looking out now with it gone, it's not triggering any sort of memory of before. Well, you were young. Not that young. And old enough to remember Mr. Hardwick pretty well. Maybe because you associate the gazebo so much with your mom, you can't imagine it not being there. Cooper shuddered. She spent as much time as possible in that thing. Even after she was sick and got so cold so easily, I used to pull all the comforters off the beds and drag them across the yard to her. He laughed. Dad would get so furious, but he never took them back. One day he just bought a huge blanket and chest to keep out there all the time. Outside the tex wheeled a dark blue body bag away. It looked empty with so little left of the man. I liked him, Cooper said, watching them. Who? Your dad? No. Mr. Hardwick. He was so... bright, you know? One of those people everyone just gravitates toward. Flirt, huh? Maybe. I think it was more like charisma. Like you. Park snorted. Me. Yeah. I've always thought that. Even when I didn't want to like you, I couldn't stay away. Park tilted his head, staring intently like he was hearing something utterly fascinating, and Cooper laughed, feeling awkward. Anyway, Hardwick was one of those. He was unbelievably cool and so happy and handsome and... full of life. He paused. I used to think he and I had a special sort of relationship. Park frowned. No. God, not like that. He was never inappropriate with me. Not at all. But looking back, I think I had a little childish crush, or whatever the equivalent of a nine-year-old crush is. Not sexual, of course, but shit, I idolized him. Wanted to be him. Wanted to be near him. I just really wanted him to like me. Cooper shook his head. The more he thought about it, the more the memories became clear. Like unlocking dusty old boxes in his head. I was devastated when he left. I don't think I spared one thought for Mrs. Hardwick. I was too busy feeling abandoned and personally betrayed, as if he had cared about me any more than any of the other brats trailing after him all day. I remember thinking he'd ruined my whole summer break, he laughed, and then by winter break, I'd forgotten all about him. You fickle thing. Aren't I just? He sighed. I'm going to call Santiago and ask for some time off. I can't leave until this is all settled, not with this ridiculous suspicion hanging over my dad's head. Park nodded. I can stay too, as long as you need me. Cooper's heart skipped with relief and pleasure even as he flapped his hand at Park. I don't need... I mean, you're welcome to stay, but if you can't get the time off, don't worry about it. I already have it. He frowned. When? How? I let them know I was taking personal leave a few days ago, after the Ann Arbor case. Cooper blinked at him. I didn't know that. Obviously. Why were you going to tell me that before we got back to D.C. on Monday? Of course, Park said, so adamantly he sounded like he was convincing himself. Look, I just needed some time off. From what? The job or me? Park sighed. It's not like that. Okay, I'm asking you what it is like. Cooper... Park broke off, covering his face with his hands as if he had a headache, but not before Cooper saw a flash of wolf in his eyes. For the second time that day. With everything that had happened, Cooper had forgotten about their fight outside, and Park had let him. Just like every other time, he was sure Park would let it go and not bring it up again. Another fresh start. Another clean slate. Another new beginning. Suddenly Cooper didn't want it. The problem with constantly starting over was that you never got very far in the journey. I'm sorry, Cooper blurted. His heart was beating hard, but fuck it, what were they here for if not this? Park looked at him. He had that same odd look on his face he'd had when they first got to Jagger Valley that looked so much like nerves, but a little hopeful too. For what? Everything. Well, for earlier and for being, you know... Me. Cooper laughed awkwardly. What the hell, Dayton? Park said, sounding angry. That's a horrible thing to say. Relax, I just mean... 
I know, I've been a dick recently. I don't want you to think I'm proud of that or that I don't regret it. He sighed and fidgeted. I need you to know I'm trying to do better. These last few months have been weird with, you know, work and stuff. That doesn't mean it's okay to get short with you just because I'm stressed. A flash of understanding passed over Park's face. What they say does bother you. Of course it bothers me, Cooper retorted. How could it not fucking bother me? It's horrible being hated. I get that you're likely universally beloved, but still, don't tell me that's surprising to you. You don't say anything. You won't let me say anything. Because it's all so fair. My ex-partner was a bigoted, homicidal, piece of shit sociopath, and I didn't even notice. What does that say about me? There's a whole team still tracking down those disgusting videos, for God's sake. I don't deserve to do this job. They know it. I know it. And while you are being very sweet and protective of my feelings because, I don't know, I'm a good lay or something, you know it too. It wasn't your fault. Yes, it was. Considering these were things he'd been thinking almost daily for over four months, it was unexpectedly hard to voice them now to Park. Why? Because the guilt was still visceral. Because it had revealed things about himself he didn't like, and he wasn't sure he deserved redemption. Because it was humiliating. Because he cared what Park thought of him. Because he cared about Park. It was absurd to keep pretending like he didn't. Especially to himself. He'd started caring about Park during their first disastrous case together. He'd realized how much as soon as he saw him in that cage and thought he could lose him. Are you thinking of leaving the BSI? Park asked simply, and Cooper appreciated the dry, hard straightforwardness. Even if hearing the words he'd only skirted around himself felt as brutal as a jab to the windpipe. Breathtaking. Choking. I don't know. He tried to match the honesty. I don't know what I'd do besides this. And he didn't want to lose Park. That was why he was struggling with this building pressure to nail down their relationship. What were they outside of partners? It was all too tied up right now, everything in limbo at once. If he left the BSI, was he saying goodbye to Park as well? Until he knew that, was Park the only reason he was staying? No, he still loved the job, even if it didn't love him back so much these days. And he... Well, yeah, he was pretty fucking fond of Park, too, obviously. And what Park felt about Cooper in return was... Affection? Sure, yeah, Cooper's self-esteem wasn't quite low enough to think Park didn't give a shit about him at all, but did he care enough to keep seeing him if they no longer worked together and it stopped being convenient? Enough to stop hiding their relationship and actually go places in public when... No, if they didn't have the excuse of being partners to keep it on the down low anymore? If people knew they were sleeping together, it wouldn't matter if Cooper left or not. All the hostility he got now would just transfer to Park. Who would willingly take that on? Who the hell was Cooper to ask him to? Look, Cooper said, when Park started to respond with some no-doubt well-intentioned suggestion. Please don't say anything. Just because I'm complaining about something doesn't mean I want you to fix it for me. I've looked out for myself for a long time now. But you don't have to. I can handle it. I know. Cooper winced at the frustration in his voice. He remembered something Park had said to him back in Florence. I see why you don't apologize more often. You're terrible at it. He softened his voice. Believe me, I know you can handle it. You handle everything. You're always handling everything. I mean, even that story of you saving your brother out of a tree at, what, eight? Meanwhile, I apparently can't even remember being eight. Cooper threw his hands up, so I get it. I know. You're this ridiculous superhero, and you always have been. Shit, you might not believe in magic, but to me, you're as close to magical as anything I've ever known. And not just because of the whole werewolf thing, but because you're you. All special and brilliant and patient and funny and, you know, sort of good-looking sometimes, I guess. Park raised his eyebrows. But I also know I'm just... Uh, I'm not like that. I'm a mess. Honestly, at least lately. So it's embarrassing to talk about with you. And I really don't want you getting involved in my problems. It's not just that I can take care of myself. I want to. 
Can you please respect that? Park looked away for a long moment. When he turned back, his expression was thoughtful. Okay. I'll back off. But can I at least say something about something else? Something that is about me? Cooper shrugged, suddenly nervous. In that tree with my brother, I was pissed at him. I thought he was being ridiculous. A baby. I didn't want to wait for him to relax, so I tried to drag him down when he wasn't ready. He shifted. His first shift, which is hard in the best of circumstances, and I almost lost him. Not to mention what happened to my sort of good-looking sometimes face. Park touched his tongue to the scar through his lip. I try to use it to remember not to be impatient and... controlling. He gave Cooper a strange look, a little unsure, almost worried. I use it to remember that rushing other people risks losing them completely. So I try not to rush. But I screw up, too. I screw up a lot more than you know, so I hope you won't be embarrassed if you do want to talk about anything. Cooper frowned. You're not impatient at all. Or if you are, you've been doing a really good job hiding that from me. Hey, I never said I was bad at dissembling. That's my jam, Park smiled. But when there's something I really want, I'm very impatient. I think you know that. He gave Cooper an intense look and caught his fingers, massaging the knuckles. Cooper exhaled softly as tendrils of pleasure shot up his arm and heat flooded his face. I have plenty of my own flaws, Cooper, and I'm definitely not a superhero, Park added softly. Oh. Okay, Cooper said. He cleared his throat. But you are saying you're magical, then. Park quirked his lips in an aborted grin. Does that sound like something I would say? He leaned forward, and Cooper tilted his chin up instinctively, his eyes drifting closed. Park brushed their lips together so gently Cooper could swear he felt each individual nerve ending shared their own private kiss. They both inhaled each other's scent and taste for a moment before Cooper nudged Park's cheek with his nose, nuzzling the unshaven skin there, and Park surged forward and took Cooper's mouth in a real kiss. Cooper groaned and Park's tongue took advantage of the opening and explored his mouth as if frantically making sure everything was how he'd left it, and yes, okay, there was that impatience he'd mentioned. He rubbed his body against Park's and felt the first flickers of arousal deep inside spark to life shockingly fast. It had been too long. Why did he risk pushing this away? Speaking of which, suddenly he felt himself shoved gently but decidedly backward and cool air against his flushed skin where Park's hands and body and lips had been a moment before. His eyes fluttered open. Park was now sitting on the trundle bed, looking rumpled, aroused, and a little predatory. What? Cooper started, then heard the soft knock on the door. He jumped, called yes, and winced at the nervous pitch in his voice. Coop? His dad opened the door just as Cooper started forward and Ed stepped back into the hall, startled. Ah, hey, boys. Ed glanced over Cooper's shoulder at Park and then back at Cooper. Under his arm were some clothes. I thought you probably didn't bring anything decent to wear for tomorrow. Can't have you fishing in a monkey suit. Besides, it's already getting cold in the morning. On the water. Cooper blinked at Ed without comprehension, his brain still meandering its way back from that conversation. Who was he kidding? He was just thinking about the kiss. Tomorrow? You don't seriously still want to go fishing, he said finally. Dad, they just finished pulling our dead neighbor out of the backyard. Yeah, bad business, Ed muttered. Worse than bad, it's very bad, as in seriously no good. What did the agents talk to you about? Ed brushed him off. Nothing. Just the same basic questions they had before. Nothing new, Cooper pushed. Why did they keep us separate then? Nah, you know how it is. They just have to follow procedure. But, but nothing, Cooper. Now come on. When was the last time you got some fresh air? Today. Maybe you missed me. I was the one in a blue shirt digging up the murder victim. Ed gave him a hard look. That has nothing to do with us, as your colleagues will see soon enough. Here. 
for Dean's sake. He held up the clothes. I pulled up some of your old stuff from the basement. It wouldn't hurt to air overnight, mind. Cooper took the green cargo pants and huge red and black fleece button down and stared at them dumbly. The soft, fuzzy shirt unlocked countless memories of tucking his chin into the warm collar while standing, fingers red and wrapped loosely around a pole in angry silence with his dad and Dean. Hating being dragged on these stupid be-a-man bonding trips, resenting the painful charade of forced togetherness that just emphasized the gaping hole his mom had left in the family. I haven't worn this since high school, he murmured. Well, it doesn't look like you've outgrown it. Ed laughed his awkward laugh, but it sounded even more off than usual. He was uncomfortable. Why? Cooper suddenly remembered that Park wasn't the only person he'd fought with today. Except he didn't owe his father an apology, and he certainly didn't expect one in return. Why'd you keep this, he said. Ed rubbed his big hand over the back of his neck. DC isn't so far. I thought you might want to take the boat out some weekends. Didn't want you carting stuff back and forth. Cooper shifted the clothing in hands. Right, uh, thanks. His dad leaned past him again. I don't think any of Cooper's clothes would fit you, Oliver. Park was still sitting on the trundle bed, pawing through the carryall. He flapped a hand. Not a problem at all. I don't want to intrude. I can stay here. No, Cooper and Ed said at the same time and then glanced at each other, embarrassed. Cooper wondered if Ed was as reluctant to be alone together as he was after the awkwardness of that afternoon. Okay. Park said after a strained pause, well, I packed some jeans. Great, Ed said, smiling under his mustache. Dad, what about, you boys get to bed. Dean will be here at 4.30 sharp. Ed slapped the doorframe with finality, looking more like himself for the first time in hours. Coop, don't make me come in here and drag your ass out of bed, as usual. Cooper closed the door and listened to his father's footsteps down the hall. At some point, they had turned from a stomp to a shuffle. When? After his retirement? After this afternoon? Cooper looked at Park, who had lain back on the trundle and was watching him with his hands beneath his head like some kind of emperor on his divan. He looked wildly out of place in this room on Cooper's faded plaid sheets. I should... He gestured at the door vaguely and then turned out the lights and stripped, feeling Oliver's gaze on him. He hesitated, then climbed into his own bed. There really wasn't room for the two of them in a twin, but this time he let his arm hang over the edge. Park grabbed his hand and rubbed his knuckles gently. Sorry about that. Before, I mean, Cooper whispered. It's fine. It would have been a mistake anyway. Cooper twitched. I mean, with your father down the hall, Park said. Yeah, true. Well, we've got small creatures to be pointlessly and horrifically cruel to before dawn, so... Cooper punched his pillow and then kept punching it more because it felt good rather than any real attempt to improve the fluffiness. The mattress suddenly dipped behind him with a groan and Park slid into the bed next to him. You're joking, Cooper said, which came out more like a wheeze as half of Park's significant body was now overlapping his own. This isn't physically possible. Shh. Then... I'm magical, remember? Cooper's elbow jerked neatly into Park's ribs, and he got a thrill of satisfaction hearing Park's grunt. He said, Yeah, well, feel free to saw yourself in half any minute now, Houdini. Park repositioned himself, and Cooper winced, self-conscious of all the sounds the old springs were making, though surely, if Ed heard, he wouldn't think that both Cooper and Park were in the same bed. Cooper was living it, and he could barely fathom the idea. Park finally settled them both on their sides and pulled Cooper's back to his front. Ta-da, he said. Cooper rolled his eyes but didn't pull away, mostly because there was nowhere to go. The warmth and weight of Park's body acted like a sedative, and his thoughts started to slow. Cooper? Hmm? I think you're pretty magical, too, Park whispered into his hair. Cooper twisted away and tucked his nose into the crook of Park's forearm the hair there tickling his nose. Did I forget to mention you're also an idiot? Cooper said into his skin and then wriggled deeper so Park wouldn't see what he was positive was a hideously dopey smile. Chapter 6 You're losing him. Cooper bit his lip to prevent himself from yelling back at his dad. Pull back and then reel in when you drop your ro- I know. You know, but you aren't doing anything about it. 
Cooper ignored his dad and looked back at Park, who had planted himself against the wall of the small cabin at the bow of the dead rise. The sun was just starting to rise, and Park's face was shiny with sea spray, which was impressive considering he had flatly refused to go near any edge of the boat since they'd pulled out of Bell's Marina pre-dawn. Cooper felt a bit bad not picking up on Park's unease when they'd arrived, but he'd been too busy feeling uneasy himself being back at the marina and awash with old memories. His fear, anger, pain. The sudden give in his arms pulled Cooper's attention back to his rod. You lost it, Ed said. At this rate, we'll be going home empty-handed. We always go home empty-handed, Cooper muttered and pulled his line in. Ever since he could remember, his dad had taught them to throw the fish back. But then, his memory wasn't proving very reliable these days. Hey, did you ever fish with Mr. Hardwick? In his periphery, Cooper could see Dean jerk his head. Ed was suddenly focusing hard on picking out a new lure in his tackle box and didn't look up. No, not really, he wasn't the fishing type. I, I don't think Oliver is, either, Dean interrupted. And Cooper resisted the childish urge to kick him. All morning, Dean had been derailing any conversation Cooper had tried to have about Hardwick, his body, or the events of yesterday, and his dad was letting him. Are you sure he doesn't want to join us? I brought an extra rod, Ed said. Dean snorted. I'm pretty sure a lack of equipment is not what's stopping him, right, Coop? He elbowed him. Ow, what the hell? What are you talking about? Dean just shrugged and winked. Cooper frowned, confused, and looked back at Park, who was now sitting on the deck looking like the cabin wall was the only thing holding him up. He felt a wave of guilt for asking Park to come with him just because he wanted a buffer between him and his dad. Of course Park didn't like fishing. Who the hell did? Uh, I'm just going to... He gestured vaguely and went to rebate his hook by Park. Hey, you good? Park gave him a thumbs up, but didn't move or speak. He had one cheek pressed against the cold fiberglass, and when Cooper sat next to him, he could see Park's face was wet with sweat, not salt water. Sure you don't want to give it a go? Cooper said quietly. Park shook his head quickly, froze, then breathed in deeply through his nose. You'll feel better if you move around. You can use my rod, it's all ready to go. I'll tell you exactly where you can shove your rod, Park bit out. Joke's on you, I like that sort of thing. Park's lips tightened in an imitation of a smile. He murmured, I think I may need to admit something to you. Basketball isn't the only thing you're bad at, Cooper guessed. When you said fishing, I didn't know you meant on a boat. Well, it is Maryland, Cooper said. Park looked at him then. Expression difficult to tell behind the sunglasses he wore despite the overcast sky but Cooper could guess. Er, sorry, do you not like boats? Park took another breath through his nose and pressed his cheek back against the cabin wall. Boats? Boats are fine, it's the water that's the problem. Bays are supposed to be calm, placid, not... this. It can get kind of choppy, Cooper agreed. It's because the water is so shallow. That plus the wind makes a short duration, which basically means the time between waves are shorter than out in the ocean, where waves are more spaced out. Please stop saying the W word. Cooper's eyes widened, thinking Park meant werewolf for a moment before grinning. What word? Water? Wind? Wave? Park groaned and fully turned to press his whole face against the cabin. His words were muffled. Cooper, I love you, but if you don't shut up, I'm seriously going to punch you and then vomit all over you. Kinky, Cooper choked out. Suddenly, he felt pale and sweaty himself. I should, uh, get back there. I've been trying to ask my dad about Hardwick for two hours, and Dean keeps cutting me off, he babbled. I don't get what his problem is. He's saying all sorts of bullshit. Well, anyway... He tripped over himself, jumping to his feet, and stumbled away. Speaking of words they didn't say... But of course Park had been joking, not to mention half delirious with seasickness. Cooper certainly couldn't take it as a declaration of love. That would be insane, totally ridiculous. Back so soon? What are you grinning about? Ed said. What? Nothing, I'm not... 
Cooper shook his head. Hmm, couldn't convince him, huh? He's not really feeling the water. Should we turn back? Dean said. Um, Cooper hesitated. He didn't want to lose this opportunity to find out more about the neighbor. He also knew Park would be unhappy if he thought they'd turned around solely for him. But he hated seeing Park unwell. Maybe give it ten minutes and then we'll see? That gave him time to come up with some excuse and make it look like they'd needed to turn around for another reason. Honestly, Park seemed so inexperienced with being on the water, Cooper could practically just tell him the fish were all swimming toward land to head up the diner for breakfast, and he'd buy it. Sure, ten minutes. He just needs to find his sea legs, Ed said. Maybe, Cooper said doubtfully. So what did you mean, not really, when you said Mr. Hardwick and you never went fishing? Ed's eyes slid away from Cooper. We may have gone once. I don't know, Coop, it was over twenty-five years ago and we weren't exactly friends. You weren't? Did you say that to the agents yesterday? Dean interrupted. Timber! Cooper turned around to see Park now keeled over on his side and his own stomach flipped in sympathy for the first time that morning. Poor Oliver. Cooper took a step toward him, then stopped. He wanted to go over there and pull Park into his lap, but that wouldn't be helpful, or go unnoticed by his family. Dad, don't we have some Dramamine in the cabin? Dean asked, also watching Park. I don't think so. No, I think I tucked some in there for Soph a while ago, Dean argued. Not that you needed it. Better sea legs than me, but I think I left it here somewhere. Come look with me, Coop. What? I have no clue where it is. Why can't you do it? Cooper felt oddly reluctant to let Park out of his sight. I need your help looking. You're the fancy investigative agent. You're a deputy. It's for, uh, your friend. Dean stumbled over the word just slightly, and Cooper hesitated. His pulse picked up speed, and he felt a sudden prickling of anxiety at the back of his neck. Was that why Dean was acting so weird? Why he kept redirecting the conversation toward Park? Had he noticed something between them? Did he think he knew something? Fine, let's go look for some Dramamine, Cooper stomped to the cabin with Dean following behind. So, he crossed his arms, felt defensive, put his hands on his hips, felt stupid, and slapped his palms together loudly. What did you want to talk about oh so unsettly? Stop clapping. Why do you keep hassling Dad? What? Why do you keep asking Dad about Mr. Hardwick? Cooper scrambled to readjust. Well, let me think. For one thing, his murdered body just got pulled out from under Mom's gazebo. And? Dean said. And I'm writing a feature article for Home and Garden on Flesh for Fertilizer. What the hell do you mean, and? And I'm curious as to how that happened, obviously. So what does that have to do with Dad? Dean, you were there yesterday. You saw how they were looking at him, not just the agents, but the department too. His ex-men, your co-workers. They'll get over it. You also saw how he was acting. Now it was Dean's turn to cross his arms. So what? You think he killed Hardwick? Of course not, Cooper hissed. But honestly, if I didn't know him, he'd be pretty high up my suspect list. The guy was buried in our backyard. He was murdered with Dad's hoe. Dad keeps going all squirrely every time they ask him a question. The man who remembers exactly how many strikeouts I had in 6th grade Little League suddenly can't remember what year he built a gazebo? Dean frowned. How do you know that? About the hoe. I, uh, I heard them talking about it. Cooper hesitated, but Dean needed to start taking this seriously. I also heard something else. They're trying to say Dad killed him because Hardwick had a thing for Mom. Dean sucked his teeth, turned away, and started opening some of the cabin drawers. I know. I felt the same way. But it doesn't matter if it's crazy or not. As long as Dad keeps acting like this will all disappear by the time we land, things are going to get ugly. Dean pulled out the first aid kit they kept on board and started rifling through it. That's why I want to find out more about Hardwick. Maybe I could talk to them. Point them in another direction. Are you listening to me? It's not crazy, Dean said. What are you talking about? Mr. Hardwick? And Mom? Dean turned back to face Cooper, running a hand through his hair. They were together. What? Mom and Mr. Hardwick, or Alex. I guess. They were having an affair, okay? What? 
Cooper repeated, then shook his head. I mean, that's not... Why do you think that? I know it, Coop. I knew it then. I saw them together. He realized he was still shaking his head and stopped. Does Dad know? Yeah, we've talked about it. You've... For some reason, this felt more like a betrayal than anything else. Was anyone ever going to tell me? Why? You were way too young when it happened. And then after she... After everything, what was the point? It had nothing to do with you. It was her private life. It had nothing to do with me, either. I just happened to find out. I wish I hadn't. Right. Cooper felt a bit dazed and detached, like he was hearing the plot of a play and not the 25-year-old secrets of people he thought he knew as well as himself. Of his own mother. When did this happen? How long did it go on? I don't know the details. Dean paused and continued with feeling. But do you see why maybe it sucks for you to keep asking Dad about Hardwick and if they were fishing buddies or not? Cooper winced. Right, I... Sorry. He looked out the cabin window. Ed had somehow gotten Park standing, or swaying anyway, and appeared to be trying to coax him toward the boat's edge. I just... I thought her and Dad were... You know. What, exactly? It had always confused him why his mother had been with his father. They seemed so different. The sort of people you couldn't even imagine interacting well on an elevator ride together, never mind a marriage. And yet they'd stayed married through a lot. Two kids. Drawn out illness and the subsequent loads of debt. Ed had even stopped speaking to his own parents when they disapproved of Rachel's Judaism and their decision to raise Cooper and Dean as practicing. The only way Cooper had been able to explain it was love. That seemed incredibly naive now. How much can a child really know about their parents' internal life? He's always saying how he was married to his high school sweetheart and living his dream life at my age. You think maybe this might have come up at some point? You know he just says that stuff because he's worried about you. Cooper snorted. He does. You've always been a loner and now he thinks you're isolating yourself even more. Jesus, Dean, he muttered. How did this go from discussing his mother's lover to a critique of his own social life? I'm not isolating myself. I, I see people. Sort of. I'm not... He shook his head, not even sure what to say. Lonely? Alone? The two weren't even necessarily interchangeable. And they weren't necessarily true. Not recently, anyway. I'm fine. Dean moved to stand by him and looked out at the deck. You never talk about seeing anyone, dating anyone. You've never brought anyone home before. Cooper stiffened and looked at Dean, but his brother didn't look back. Yeah, well, like I said, I'm fine. Good, Dean nodded. So, is it serious? Is what serious, Cooper said. Dean jerked his head toward Park, now gripping the boat's edge like his life depended on it, while Ed was pointing out at the bay and yammering away like everything was fine. Cooper felt the hairs on the back of his neck stand up, but he forced a laugh. You tell me, Dean. Dad insisted on tearing Mom's gazebo down for reasons he mysteriously can't remember, uncovered the murdered corpse of his wife's lover, and is now the FBI's lead suspect. Yeah, I'd say things are getting pretty serious around here. Dean cut him off. You know that's not what I meant. You and Oliver. Is it serious? Cooper's heart jumped into his throat and his mouth went dry. For a moment he couldn't speak. He was completely frozen. He knew his eyes were wide, but his brain couldn't seem to remember how to narrow them without closing the lids entirely. So he just stared. A thousand replies flew through his head. We just work together. I don't know what you're talking about. He could say any of them, and he was pretty sure Dean wouldn't push it. That wasn't Dean's style. But it didn't feel right. Like bad karma, especially after the unusual openness of last night. As if lying about being nothing more than work colleagues might make it true. Alternatively, yes, I'm serious about him. In fact, I think I'm close to falling in love with him felt equally perilous. I don't know, Cooper said, honestly. The words came out not sounding like his voice. Dean looked at him, gaze searching. 
but you're serious about him. Cooper nodded. A swift jerking of his neck, so quick he wasn't sure if he'd really done it or imagined it, but Dean nodded back slowly, as if satisfied. Good. I like him. Not that you need my approval, but he's a good guy. Not much of a fisherman, mind you, but still, a catch. Heh. <laughs> Get it. Dean elbowed him in the arm and Cooper stiffened, not sure what was happening. He couldn't bring himself to even roll his eyes, never mind elbow back. He couldn't believe they were talking about this. The silence stretched between them, and Dean shuffles his feet as if preparing to walk away. Well, uh, anyway. Cooper wasn't ready. He hadn't been prepared to have this conversation, but was even less so for it to be over. It felt like one of those rare, important moments that couldn't be recreated. If he didn't say what he needed to say now, he wasn't sure he would get the chance again. Wait, how did you know? When you first got here, you moved around each other like a fighting couple, never touching but always super aware of each other's space. Soph noticed it first. Have to be a couple first to be a fighting couple, I guess. He grinned. Plus, you look at him like you left a winning lottery ticket in his ass. Jesus. I mean, how did you know about me? Dean wrinkled his nose, which Cooper recognized from when they were kids and Dean was embarrassed about something. I, uh... Do you remember Jeff Nichols? Cooper blinked at the unexpected blast from the past. Reedy, unsociable, death metal-obsessed Jeff Nichols had been his AP bio partner sophomore year. They weren't friends. Jeff could barely keep up a conversation, was more interested in trolling bands' message boards online, and gave off perpetually angry vibes. They had nothing in common. Well, one thing. Jeff had been figuring out his sexuality at the time, too. And while they'd been working on a bio project together, Jeff would come over and they'd do some other biological experimenting. Oh, fuck, Cooper said. You didn't. Yup, Dean said a little too cheerfully, nose still twitching a bit. I guess this was a recurring theme for me back then. Going places I shouldn't have and getting an eyeful. Well, I didn't see anything really. Just one day I busted into your room and you both looked all, you know, sweaty and guilty and scrambling away from each other. Plus, as good-looking as I am, I don't usually induce instant boners as soon as I walk in. Oh, God. Cooper covered his face with his hand and resisted wailing at the ceiling full Charlie Brown style. There was nothing but gentle amusement in Dean's voice, but Cooper couldn't help but feel 15 all over again. In other words, painfully self-conscious. Memories of he and Jeff jacking each other off under their gym shorts, too awkward and unsure to even take their dicks out, flooded his brain. Jeff fucking Nichols, Cooper groaned into his hands. Yeah, I gotta say, your taste in boyfriends has significantly improved. Hmm, maybe I shouldn't say that. Fifteen is tough for everyone. Even Jeff Nichols could be hot shit now. He wasn't my boyfriend, Cooper said indignantly. Just, ugh, why didn't you say something? Dean shook his head. Uh, never mind Jeff. Do you remember you? Teenage Cooper was always on edge. Nervy and angry and shit. I was legitimately worried your head would explode if I caught you off guard. Besides, I thought you'd tell me when you wanted to. Granted, I've been waiting for almost 20 years, and now you brought your boyfriend here, and I thought, shit, maybe he knows that I know, and I'm hurting him by not talking about it. Maybe that's why he never wants to come home, because he thinks I'm not cool with him being... gay? Bye. Cooper's throat felt tight. He wasn't sure he could respond to that. He hadn't known Dean had known, obviously, but the exhaustion and resentment that came from keeping parts of himself a secret and off-limits was a big reason for the distance that had grown between them. He realized Dean had asked him a question. Gay, he said, voice hitching just a little. I'm gay. It was decidedly anticlimactic after all that, but he wanted to say it anyway and make this his coming-out memory with his brother, not sophomore-year boners and ball sweat with Jeff Nichols. Cooper shuddered. Dean clapped him on the shoulder and then, startlingly, pulled him into a quick hug. Cool, was all he said, but he held Cooper tightly for just a beat longer than expected, and when Dean let him go, he looked a little red in the face, but happy too. Cooper needed a moment to clear his head. He looked back out the window. Ed had maneuvered a rod into Park's hands and was trying to position his fingers into a relaxed grip. Dad likes him too, you know. 
You're not going to tell me Dad knows I'm gay now, are you? No, I doubt he'd think that of you. Cooper blew out a puff of air. That hurt. You mean because it's so shameful? Dean's eyes widened. No, God, no, that's not what I meant. What did you mean, then? You know Dad. He's not great at imagining there's anything about his kids that he didn't put there himself. That rang more true than Cooper wanted to admit. There were many times he'd felt like he was just another of Ed's DIY projects, built from scratch. Maybe a lot of parents acted that way. But Cooper also felt like he did not come out the same as the picture on the box. And to this day, Ed was holding out hope for an exchange. Dean added hesitantly, That's why he's so hard on you. He doesn't understand you. And he doesn't understand why he doesn't understand. It's not fair, but... He shrugged. If there's something about you he didn't intentionally teach you himself, you might have to give him a hint. You know? Cooper huffed. He didn't teach me anything, what? Dean was smiling at him skeptically. I'm nothing like him. I'm a huge disappointment, as he keeps reminding me. You're way more like him than I am. I am not. Take that back. Dean shrugged. Whatever you want to tell yourself. But I think you should talk to him about this. You could go out there right now. You know I'd have your back. Your boyfriend would have... Well, he'd be at your feet from the looks of him, but still. Cooper absorbed that for a moment, imagining it. Yeah, I don't think this is a good time. What with the murder and all? Not to mention the fact that Park wasn't even his boyfriend. Dean sighed. Okay, I support you, whatever you choose, but... He trailed off. What? Never mind. No, what? Are you going to come back? Dean blurted. Cooper frowned at him. I mean, I see you less than once a year now. Dean scratched his head uncomfortably. Sometimes I think... Soon I'm not even going to see him that often. I don't want you to disappear because you think you can't, you know, come out to Dad, or whatever. Cooper fidgeted. I'm not disappearing. But you don't like coming here because of that, right? It's not just that, he said quickly. It's complicated. Dean narrowed his eyes. Complicated, like how the BSI actually investigates especially violent crime? Cooper crossed his arms, not sure what to say, and immediately on the defensive. Dean? He'd never felt more tempted to tell anyone about what he did. He felt close to his brother in a way he hadn't since... Shit, who knows when. Maybe since they were kids after Mom had died and Dean would let Cooper crawl into his bed downstairs and cry where their dad couldn't hear him. Even that quickly felt like he was burdening his brother rather than bonding with him and he'd stopped sneaking in soon afterwards, learning instead to push all those feelings away. He didn't want to lose this newfound closeness. For one wild moment, he even wondered if Dean's was exactly the outside opinion he needed. His brother was in law enforcement. He'd understand the dynamics of what he was going through and might even have a suggestion on whether to stick it out. But Cooper wasn't sure how he could explain any of it without telling Dean about wolves, and he couldn't do that. He just couldn't. The silence turned awkward, and Dean's expression shifted slightly to hurt. Right. You can't tell me it's top secret, right? I... Cooper shook his head. I don't know what to tell you. Look, never mind. I'm sorry I brought it up. It's just... Dean shifted in place. His dark eyes, so like their mother's, looked pained. Frustrated. Dad wasn't the only one worried to see those scars, you know. That's nothing. Nothing, Dean said flatly. You swear? Cooper opened and closed his mouth. I'm fine. Somewhere there had to be a record kept of the number of times he had said that while only half meaning it. I swear, he added, looking his brother in the eye. Dean exhaled, clearly relieved, and Cooper felt he'd made the right decision. Park wouldn't approve, but what was telling his family absolutely everything supposed to accomplish exactly? The very worst days of his injury, when he was only able to keep down liquids and was too weak to stand, had long passed, and Cooper had gotten through them fine and completely on his own. He needed Dean worrying about him now, months after the fact, even less than he wanted Park's B12 supplements surreptitiously showing up on his kitchen counter. I just wanted to make sure you're comfortable being here and not secretly dying, because... Dean groaned. 
Ugh, this is way more heart-to-heart -heart than I'd prepared for, but I was thinking you could be my best man. That is, if you're not busy with all those people you're seeing and violent crime you're solving. Cooper choked. You're really laying it all out today, huh? Well, I never see you. Gotta fit all this shit in when I can. So? I thought you'd want one of your friends, like Stephen or whatever. He hedged, feeling a bit like a trapped animal. This was... unexpected. I do want one of my friends. You. Dean eyed him critically, and Cooper was sure he could pick up on plenty of childhood tells himself. Look, if it's not your thing, no worries, just say so. No, it's my thing. It can be my thing. Cooper nodded finally. I'd be honored, and, uh, thanks. I think. Dean snorted. Good, I love the enthusiasm. So that's at least one day I'm going to see you. And Oliver, too? I wasn't kidding about inviting him yesterday. Cooper's face felt hot. I don't know, that's a while away. Only a few months. Dean's thick eyebrows scrunched down in confusion and he leaned in. Are you saying you guys won't make it that long? I think... Cooper said slowly, staring out at the deck. Park might not even make it back to land at this rate. Dean smiled and held up a small tube of Dramamine pills. Look what I found in between all the touchy-feely shit. Outside, Park had finally given up, dropped the rod to the deck, and was heaving over the side of the boat. Next to him, Ed kept slapping his back. Mmm, better late than never, Dean said doubtfully. For Park and the pills? No, there was nothing to be done now. But for everything else? Cooper thought maybe this time, yeah. It was okay. Chapter 7 I'm sorry. Don't be ridiculous, Cooper said, pushing Park's plate of pancakes toward him. So you're not a boat person. Now we know. Eat something. Isn't that my line? Cooper dutifully forked a bit of egg into his mouth. Around them, the sounds of the diner at early morning clinked and hummed, though it was still too early for any real crowd. Fishermen were still out on the water, and non-fishermen were still in bed. He felt relaxed, seeing no one he recognized and no one who recognized him. More than that, he felt... happy. He still wasn't sure what to think about Dean's revelation about their mother and Mr. Hardwick, but the rest of it had been, well... good. He still had the strange thrill of adrenaline in his blood. He'd come out to his brother, and it had gone well. And then Dean had asked him to be his best man, which was nerve-wracking. There'd be bachelor party planning to do, and obviously he'd have to be in Jagger Valley more than just one day. But it was also sort of exciting. For a long time, there had been a divide between him and Dean. Partly, it had been the age difference. But partly, it was all the secrets between them. For the first time in a long time, Cooper was beginning to feel seen by his brother. He hadn't anticipated how much different it would feel. You could have stayed with your family, Park said, fiddling with his food without eating it. I didn't want to interrupt your time together. After dropping them off at the marina, Dean and Ed had headed back out on the bay and wouldn't be back until it was time to set up for the engagement party that evening. I more than filled my annual family bonding quota this morning, Cooper said. He'd given Park a general overview of his conversation with Dean once they were alone and back on land. Not about his mom, or any details concerning Park himself, just... By the way, Dean's known him into dudes for twenty years. Also, I'm supposed to be his best man now for some reason. Hopefully not guilt. Park, still recovering from his seasickness, with his head between his knees, had just groaned in response but there had been a supportive sort of inflection to the groan, and Cooper thought the resulting mixed sound summarized his own feelings about the experience pretty accurately. He took a sip of coffee and scanned the handful of customers, most of them at the counter. Anyway, the conversation was getting a little morbid for me and not in a helpful way. Park grimaced. I missed the tail end of that. You didn't miss anything, Cooper countered. As they turned back around to Bell's Marina, Ed had yammered on about all the drowning cases he'd caught over the years with uncharacteristic chattiness. Whether he thought that was supposed to make Park feel better, or if he was trying to keep the conversation firmly away from the current case wasn't clear. Either way, he needn't have bothered. Park was too busy retching over the side of the boat the whole trip back to pay any attention. 
and after his conversation with Dean, Cooper was too uncomfortable to bring up Mr. Hardwick. Instead, he'd kept quiet, half listening to his father and half trying to figure out if there was anything he could do to make this whole mess go away. He'd really only come up with one possibility. Treat it like any other case. Cooper used to be FBI. He could do this, same as the agents. Plus, he had an advantage. He already knew who didn't do it. Cooper imagined Alex Hardwick as he was back then. Handsome. Friendly. Too friendly. I am a 30-something-year-old man having an affair with my neighbor. Her husband is a deputy. Somehow I end up dead in their yard. How? Why? The jealous husband of my lover knows, and... Cooper turned back into the diner. I want to go talk to Mrs. Hardwick after this. Park choked on his coffee. Excuse me? I want to look into the case, and I think the best place to start is Mrs. Hardwick. Primalis in June told me she'd never even reported him missing. Don't you think that's strange? What's strange is they told you that at all. They were just trying to poke the bushes and see what popped up. But it is suspicious, and I think it's the best place to start. If I'm lucky, she'll admit she killed him with my dad's hoe, tucked him in a hole, and everything will be settled by the party tonight. What's with the look? I know I'm a little woozy and dehydrated at the moment, but I could have sworn we were here in Jagger Valley to visit your family and not on official business, Park shook his head. Weird. I'm doing this for my family, Cooper sighed. Look, what you said last night, but what the agents think, it's true. And it was more than flirting. My mom and Hardwick, they, uh, did actually have an affair. It was not unexpected that Park didn't react, but a relief all the same. One of Cooper's favorite things about him was his unflappability, except when he wanted to get a rise out of Park. Then it could be his least favorite, too. Right now, though, he wanted reliable and non-judgmental, and Park didn't disappoint. He just tilted his head thoughtfully. Are you okay? Of course, Cooper said quickly. I mean, why wouldn't I be? I used to imagine finding out my real father was someone else and that we'd go live with him instead. Obviously, I wasn't the biggest champion of their relationship. He sipped his coffee. I'm disturbed more than anything. Not disturbed that my mom had a... a sex life, but that I might need to reconsider their relationship. Dad always made it sound like they were perfect together. But before she got sick, everything was just easy. But that's crazy. It's never easy. Not even when you really care about somebody. He risked a look at Park. So why should it bother me if my mom had a thing with hot Mr. Hardwick? Park made an amused face. Hot Mr. Hardwick? Well, you didn't catch him at his best yesterday. Anyway, when this comes out, you know it's just going to make their case against him stronger. You don't trust the FBI to find the right man? There was no criticism in Park's voice, just curiosity. But Cooper struggled for a moment. It was true. After Florence, he'd officially lost the last remaining faith he had in the justice system. It was imperfect and far too dependent on human bias and just systemically flawed. When he spoke again, his voice was lowered. Not that anyone in the diner would know what they were talking about. You and I both know that the agency doesn't always get the right person. He let that sit. Besides, you saw how my dad was yesterday. As long as he keeps acting guilty, they're going to treat him like he's guilty. And you're trying to protect him from having to dredge up old hurts, Park offered. Cooper scoffed. Oh, well, protect isn't how I'd put it. He pushed his eggs around his plate and speared a piece of pancake off Park's instead. All right, we'll talk to Mrs. Hardwick. We? Park quirked an eyebrow. You didn't think I wouldn't have my partners back on this. As you pointed out, this isn't our case. We are off-duty. So we are not partners off-duty? Cooper froze in the middle of going back for more pancake. Um, are we? Park shook his head with a bemused smile and didn't respond. Maybe that was his response. So, cherchez la femme. Isn't that a bit cliché? 
If my dad has a motive to kill Hardwick out of jealousy, surely Mrs. Hardwick does as well. Does Mrs. Hardwick still live next door? Yeah, I think so. Cooper searched Park's eyes for a hint as to what he was thinking. Things hadn't been smooth sailing between them recently, so to speak, and they'd called a ceasefire of sorts last night on any talk like that. But Cooper hadn't forgotten Park had asked for time off from work. From work with him. Are you sure about this? We'd have to do this outside the agency knowing. If they found out we were interfering in another investigation, well, what else can you expect from the BSI's most hated? Not to mention he might be out the door soon anyway. But your reputation doesn't have to take a hit. It's practically begging for trouble. Park didn't look worried. He looked drained, and his skin still had a slight yellow tinge, but he was smiling. And under the table, he nudged the inside of Cooper's knee with his own. Lucky for you, begging is my best trick. Cooper knocked on the front door of Mrs. Hardwick's house and waited. They'd walked the long way down the parallel street to get to the front of her house. It seemed inappropriate to knock at her back kitchen door, acting like a neighbor when he was hoping she'd confess to a murder. Not your usual cup of sugar visit. Plus, he had felt oddly reluctant to walk through his own backyard. He'd seen plenty of crime scenes before, obviously, most of them a lot worse than this but it was different when it was your own space. Death changed even the most familiar landscapes. Beside him, Park sniffed the air and murmured, Here we go, and then added, Oh, and French roast. A moment later, the door opened. Eva Hardwick was a short, generously curvy Puerto Rican woman with an exceptionally beautiful face. She looked younger than Cooper was expecting. Stronger, too, like she used her arms to lift heavy loads frequently. From the scrubs with cartoon characters on them she was wearing, he guessed the heavy loads were probably people. Yeah, Cooper could picture her wielding a hoe twenty-five years ago. Yes, can I help you? Mrs. Hardwick, I don't know if you remember me, but I'm Cooper Dayton. I grew up next door. This is my friend Oliver Park. Mrs. Hardwick took them both in without a smile. Okay. I wanted to say my condolences about what happened yesterday. It must have been a terrible shock. Mrs. Hardwick continued to stare at him, unimpressed. I know it's bad timing, but I was hoping I could ask you a couple of questions. About? Cooper hesitated. This was where a badge made everything easier. No one was obligated or even compelled to talk to him as a civilian. He eyed her skeptical face. I would like to discuss your late husband and my mom. Mrs. Hardwick didn't even blink, but she did step aside and gesture them into the house toward the kitchen at the back. The room was nice, much nicer than Ed's. It was sleek and modern with shining steel pans hanging above an island and a breakfast table under a giant window. Through it, Cooper could see his own bedroom curtains pulled shut, the shed, and the eerily empty skyline where the gazebo had been. Mrs. Hardwick offered them seats and fresh coffee, which Park took her up on then cut straight to the chase. The FBI told you about their affair, Alex and Rachel. Is that all you found out? No, I'm the one who told them. Cooper exchanged a look with Park. So you knew. Mrs. Hardwick smiled coolly. Alex was many things, but he was not a very subtle man, and I'm not a stupid woman. That must have been hard for you. You mean, was it so hard that I snatched and killed him? No though I can see why that would be easier for you. I wasn't trying to say. She cut him off impatiently. Like I said, I'm not stupid. I know it doesn't make Eddie look good, but I can't give you the answers you're looking for. I didn't murder my husband. Eddie? Cooper took a breath. I just want to know more about that time. I don't remember anything about it. Please. She looked down at her hands as if thinking. I remember you, you know the youngest in the neighborhood, so the other kids almost never let you play with them. I remember sitting right here, watching you lie in the field as a little boy, all alone, talking to yourself. Maybe you liked being alone. She looked up at him, eyes hard. Maybe your mother just wanted you out of the house for a while. Cooper kept his face neutral, and after a moment she sighed. Alex was friendly, handsome, chevre, and he didn't like to say no. I knew that when I met him. Many women loved him, and a lot of husbands hated him. 
It wasn't the first time he had been unfaithful to me. She tapped the side of her head. He'd left me up here a long time ago. I knew that. I stopped being angry about it long before he disappeared. She shrugged. Do I look like a woman who stays lonely, hoping her husband might come back? Cooper didn't know what to say. On the one hand, if Hardwick did have a long list of ex-lovers and pissed-off husbands, their suspect fool had just gotten a lot bigger. On the other hand, hearing his mom was just one casual fling amongst many felt... He wasn't sure what he felt. Which would be better as her son? That the affair had meant something, or that it hadn't? Or maybe Dean was right, and he should stop thinking about this in terms of himself. Is that why you didn't report him missing? You were glad he was gone? Mrs. Hardwick clicked her teeth and shot him a scolding look. I didn't need anyone gossiping more than they already were. Oh, that poor, stupid cow calling the police because her husband ran off with another woman. Park looked around the house. What about all this stuff? You didn't think it was strange he left it all behind? All of what behind? He wasn't a stuff sort of man. And you can buy plenty of new clothes with the money saved on alimony. Besides, she hesitated. He did take something with him. His case. Case? Alex was a journalist. He kept a briefcase with notebooks and papers for stories he was working on. He had all his paperwork in there, too. It was the only thing that really mattered to Alex. His work was the one thing he was faithful to. He wouldn't have left without that case. And you still thought he had just left, even when you never heard from him again? Why would I hear from him? She waited, looking back and forth between Cooper and Park, genuinely waiting for an answer. He had to admit it was effective. He couldn't come up with anything. She flapped her hands at him. There was nothing left to say. You think I should have waited by the phone, wringing my hands? I had my own life to live. And you were sure he'd left of his own free will because of a missing case and a couple meaningless affairs? Under the table, Cooper felt Park's knee press against his own. Cool down. Meaningless. She sucked her teeth again. A couple of days after Alex didn't come home, your mother came to see me. Cooper froze. She wanted me to report it. She must have been desperate to come to me. Mrs. Hardwick hesitated and looked out the window at where the gazebo had been. Alex had been acting off for a while. He worked longer nights than ever. I almost never saw him. It turned out your mother hadn't either. He wasn't with her. When I checked our accounts, I saw he'd been taking out cash withdrawals for months. She rubbed her fingers in the air. Big ones. When I called his office, they told me he asked for an unlimited leave weeks ago. It was obvious he'd been planning to leave me for a while. I just didn't realize until she showed up on my door, crying that he'd been planning to leave her, too. I told her if she was so worried, she could report him missing. Mrs. Hardwick's eyes narrowed, but her thick lashes couldn't quite conceal the sharp look she sent Cooper. She was married to police, after all. When she didn't, I figured she'd come to the same conclusion I had, that there was someone else. He'd been two-timing us both. It didn't surprise me. She hesitated. But now... Now maybe I wonder if she didn't say anything because she'd figured out what had really happened to him. What do you mean? She realized her husband had killed her lover, of course. You want to ask me why I didn't report him missing? Because I didn't care. You should ask, why didn't she? She's the only one who missed him when he was gone. Cooper focused on his breathing and tried to categorize this new information as he would in any other case. I am a thirty-year-old woman whose lover suddenly disappears. His wife thinks he's run off. I can't tell the police because my husband is... But he couldn't do it. This was his mother. His family. It felt like a violation to even try and put himself in her head. To even consider that... No. It also hurt realizing how little of what was going on in her mind he'd actually ever known or could imagine now. Why did she do or not do anything? How the hell should he know? He only knew an eleven-year-old's memories of her, colored and twisted by the pain of loss and fairly unconditional love. Park eventually broke the silence. You said Alex was a journalist. Do you think something he was working on could have put him in harm's way? Mrs. Hardwick laughed. You mean, do I think he was killed to keep quiet? Honestly, I hope so. I think he would have liked that. Alex always wanted to break a big story. 
but this is Jagger Valley. There wasn't any chance of that happening. He did write-ups on charity events and local competitions. The biggest thing he ever worked was some trial, and that was wrapped up over a year before he was killed. Killed. She repeated as if retraining herself to say it. For just a moment, her dark eyes looked sad, almost regretful, before hardening again. His pen is not the thing that pissed people off. You said he was acting strangely for a while. Do you remember when that started? Had something changed? Mrs. Hardwick frowned. It was over twenty years ago. But you must have thought about it since then. You must have wondered who the other, other woman was. Mrs. Hardwick stood. I think you should leave now. Please, Cooper said, standing too. Mrs. Hardwick, I know this is painful. I know it was a long time ago, but anything, anything at all would be helpful. You said you weren't angry at Alex anymore. Don't you want to find out who killed him? Because I know, I know it isn't my dad. She hesitated. A couple of months before Alex disappeared, the Doherty girl died. Rose? Doherty? Cooper tried to connect the sudden change in topic. She OD'd, right? Yes, of course. Everyone suspected she messed around with drugs. With that mother, eh? Can you blame her? But her death changed Alex. That's when he started staying out all night. He became irritable. Strange. I didn't realize they even knew each other. Not more than neighbors do. Mrs. Hardwick snorted, but there was little humor in her face. Haven't you been listening? Ours is a little more incestuous than your usual neighborhood, don't you think? You're saying Mr. Hardwick and Rose Doherty were involved? She was a kid. Nineteen. A year younger than I was when we married. And she was a junkie. Alex would have liked that. He was the sort of person who thought love could cure all evils, and he liked seeing himself as a savior. But he wasn't. Alex didn't understand what he did to people. The ways he hurt them. She reached up and undid her ponytail quickly, then put it back up neatly in the same place. For just a moment, Cooper glimpsed a few strands of gray in her dark hair and was reminded that what she was talking about happened a long time ago. He couldn't watch for the same tells. She'd had years to stop caring. Not even killers stay angry forever. He didn't do it intentionally, Mrs. Hardwick continued. But he only saw what he wanted to see. He didn't think further than the hunt, whether it was for his next story or another woman. What makes you think the relationship was sexual? Park asked. She crossed her arms, but the gesture was less aggressive and more self-soothing. For all her seeming lack of caring before, whatever they were going to talk about now was making her uncomfortable. After Alex disappeared, I packed up his stuff. There wasn't a lot, like I said, but I didn't want to see it anymore. In his drawer, I found a disposable camera only about half used. I thought nothing of it. But eventually, I got it developed. She turned to stand by the sink, gripped the counter, and looked out the window. There were... pictures. Cooper's own heart was beating fast, and he wasn't sure why. What kind of pictures? A lot of them were nothing. Nature shots, woods, animals, old knick-knacks, and empty chairs, but there were some of the Doherty girl. Intimate pictures? She was naked and filthy and roughed up, Mrs. Hardwick said bluntly. Roughed up like she'd been hurt? No, like she'd been rolling around in the dirt. The photos were all in the woods behind the field here. I put two and two together. They met there for sex. Alex snuck some commemorative photos and then just left them hanging around for me to find. Bastard. She added almost clinically. Such a goddamn best. She trailed off perhaps remembering why they were there and that he was now officially a murdered bastard. What did you do with them? I destroyed them, of course, though I did tell your mother. I thought she should know what kind of man he was, two-timing her as well, with a girl ten years younger than her, no less. Good of you, Cooper said, voice carefully even. Was she posing for the photographs? Park asked quietly, and Mrs. Hardwick stiffened. Miss Doherty, I mean. It's just that you said he snuck commemorative photos, and I wondered why. Of course she was posing. You think she was laying around with her tits out for the squirrel's benefit? Was she looking in the direction of the camera, though? It was twenty years ago. I don't know. 
Mrs. Hardwick fiddled with something in the pocket of her scrubs, her gaze distant, then added, Yes, she was looking toward the camera because I could see her face. I remember thinking she looked high. In what way? Mrs. Hardwick sucked her teeth, losing patience or starting to feel defensive. Cooper wasn't sure. She looked out of it. Her eyes were closed. We get addicts in the ER sometimes, and she looked like that. I don't know how else to say it. So she might not have been aware of the photos, Park said. Were they taken at close range? Mrs. Hardwick's eyes flashed. I think it's time you left now, don't you? Please, Cooper said, just a couple more questions. No. She took a deep breath. You're trying to make him into a bad man. Alex wasn't perfect. He wasn't even that good, but he wasn't what you're trying to say he was. He wasn't a villain, and your father wasn't a hero. He is a murderer, and the next time I see those agents, that's exactly what I'm going to tell them. What could you say after that? She let them out the back door, and not wanting to head back to his house, and thus through the crime scene, Cooper led them into the fields the properties butted against. He trudged aimlessly across the dying grass, Mrs. Hardwick's last words ringing in his head. Christ, he hadn't been expecting that. Any of that. My fault, Park said once they were far enough away from the house to be overheard. I got us kicked out. No, it was a good catch. If those photos were taken without Doherty's consent and she told someone before she died, could be a motive for murder, Park finished. He rolled his shoulders as if he had a sudden cramp. To be totally honest, it's a motive I can sympathize with. You said she OD'd? If Hardwick was using the photos to harass or blackmail, the stress could have played into her drug use and someone might have even blamed him for her death. His shoulders popped loudly and he sighed a little in relief. Or Hardwick was using them to threaten someone else. What do you mean, someone else? Mrs. Hardwick said she looked roughed up. That could happen from fucking in the woods, or... Park's lip curls back briefly, flashing his teeth in anger. Someone did physically hurt her. Maybe Hardwick. Though I don't know why he'd keep photographic evidence of it lying around. Maybe someone else who he then blackmailed. Either way, the guy's garbage. Cooper grunted in agreement. He had been... surprised and confused to learn about his mother's affair this morning. But he was repulsed by the possibility that it was with a man who, best case scenario, had taken advantage of a struggling young woman he was intimate with by violating her privacy and, worst case, had assaulted her. Either way, it was disgusting. Park was watching him closely. Are you okay? Fine. Cooper said quickly, and stopped walking. They were standing in the center of the field now. To his right, the shadows of evergreens at the edge of the woods looked stocky and aggressive as the sun crept toward noon. That stuff about your mom. I don't want to talk about that part yet. Park nodded, easygoing as ever. Okay. So what about Mrs. Hardwick? Is she still top of the list? Cooper raised his hands and dropped them. I don't know. The fact that she's the one who told the FBI about the affair definitely makes her less of a suspect. But if there was any chance of them finding out from a different source, and if Dean knew, I have to think other people did too. Then she might have decided it was safer to just bite the bullet, establish her status as the wife who knew and didn't care and thus has no motive. She might not have always been so blasé about it. It has been twenty-five years. Plenty of time to perfect your I-don't-give-a-fuck face. Trust me. And here I thought you came out of the womb with that expression, Cooper said. Park smiled. I still think it's strange she didn't report him missing, even with the cash withdrawals and disappearing case. Maybe. But if he was enough of an asshole to cheat on her with my mom and the 19-year-old neighbor or whatever that was, I can see why she might not have given a fuck that he stopped showing up, dead or not. But why didn't mom report him missing? Rachel Dayton had clearly been worried. Worried enough that she'd approached the wife of her lover. He couldn't believe his mom had known about Rose, whatever the situation had been, and not said or done anything to help. Would she have really thought he'd run out on her? What had she thought happened? She realized her husband had killed her lover, of course. He looked at Park and kept his mouth shut. There was no doubt in his mind that his dad had not killed Alex Hardwick. 
but Cooper didn't have the best track record when it came to men he'd put his trust in, and Park knew that. He was afraid his gut feeling was not going to be convincing enough. Cooper looked back at the house he'd grown up in. Yellow crime scene tape trembled in the slight breeze, and the excavator still stood with its digger half-raised like a perching vulture. Mrs. Hardwick is right about one thing for sure. It can't be a coincidence that he was buried in our yard. You think someone tried to frame your dad? I don't know, maybe? But the body wasn't discovered for 25 years. It's a pretty shitty frame-up. No, I don't think it was planned. The unsub didn't bring their own weapon. There would have been tools lying around everywhere, so they just grabbed the hoe out of convenience, killed him, and then panicked and buried him on sight. Probably not premeditated. A crime of passion. Sounds like there was plenty of that going around. Hmm. Cooper tried to imagine himself as Alex again, but he couldn't get a grasp on it. He couldn't sift through the information Mrs. Hardwick had given them and marry it to what he knew of his own mother. Couldn't tell what mattered and what didn't. Everything felt jumbled up in his head, and all he kept hearing over and over was Eva's voice calling his dad a murderer. He was taking out large sums of money and took time off work after Rose died. Obviously, it wasn't because he was leaving her like she thought, and apparently he wasn't spending those late nights with my mom either, Cooper said slowly, so the affair wasn't the only thing going on. Do you want to track down his old boss? Park suggested. Maybe Hardwick told them why he needed time off, or maybe he really was working on some story that got ugly. Cooper scanned the other four houses that backed up onto the field besides his own. No, I don't think so. Park followed his gaze. What are you thinking? Why here? If we assume it wasn't planned, then it was spur of the moment, an argument probably. Why here? Why would Hardwick be arguing with someone in our backyard? That doesn't make sense. Not unless the killer saw him there and went to confront him. And the only people who could have seen him back here are your neighbors, Park finished. If not Mrs. Hardwick, and I'm not ready to rule her out yet, then why else would the crime have happened here? Park nodded. That makes sense. So who was living in these back then? Cooper pointed at his own house. Me, Dean, my dad, my mom. He moved counterclockwise. Eva Hardwick, Alex Hardwick. Next in the Doherty's, a single mom with two kids. Both of them were older than me. They kept to themselves, mostly. The mom, Margaret, wasn't around a lot. Sometimes she'd take off for days, leaving her kids behind. Stephen was just a year older than Dean, so he spent lots of time at our house. He was really shy, but Dean can get anyone to like him. They're still friends today. I barely remember Rose Doherty. She OD'd at 19, so she must have been seven years older than Stephen, I think. They were really close. Stephen was devastated when she died. He paused. But I'm not saying I think he killed Alex. A small swing set was in the yard now, and it made the house look cheerier than Cooper ever remembered it being when Steve and Rose lived there. Twelve's a little young, Park agreed. What about Rose's mother? Or a boyfriend? No idea. I barely keep tabs on my own family. The last time I even talked to Stephen was at his mom's funeral, and that was probably ten years ago. But if something did happen with Hardwick and Rose, we should still find out more. Stephen must be going to the party tonight. I'll talk to him then. Cooper pointed across the field. Sal West, creepy old guy, or at least it felt that way as a kid. He was probably only in his fifties now that I think about it. My God, ancient, Park said dryly. Why creepy? Cooper dropped his hand, thinking about the flicker of light from the upstairs window. There was no movement there now. I don't know. Something about the way he talked, like you could see inside your head. I never saw him leave the house, but there was nothing in town he didn't know all about. Some of the kids used to say he was a vampire. Nah, they hate fishing towns. Blood gets too salty. Cooper jerked his head up fast. What? Park's lips were pressed tight together, but he was still quite obviously holding in laughter. Real nice. You wondered for a moment. Yeah, how stupid of me. Vampires would be ridiculous, but werewolves are totally normal. The grin flickered strangely on Park's face, and Cooper started to ask what was wrong. What about that one? Between West's and yours, Park interrupted him. Distracted, Cooper shifted, staring at the familiar house. It had undergone a lot of renovations and expansions over the years, 
but the upstairs windows still looked the same. It spent a lot of time in this field, in this spot, staring at one of those windows in particular. Cooper? Those are the Bells. They own the marina. The same marina as this morning? Yeah. Private, but almost everyone docks there. It's a long-time family business. Catherine and Robert Bell. Important people as far as Jagger Valley goes. Big house, Park remarked when Cooper fell silent again. They'll be glad you noticed. They've got three kids. Eliza is the oldest. The one running for mayor. Yeah, then her brothers, Jack, no wait, Jacob, and uh, Gabriel. Jacob and Eliza were both older, around Rose's age, I'd say. Gabriel was the surprise baby. He was only a couple years older than me. Park nodded. The older siblings might know if there was something going on between her and Hardwick. We could ask, but I doubt they were friends. Their parents would not have approved. Cooper carefully kept the bitterness from his voice, and Park didn't seem to notice. So, where do we start? We can't really ask people for alibis. We don't even know when he disappeared exactly. Hopefully we won't have to. All I want is to find some other potential leads for the feds to focus their attention on besides my dad. Maybe someone else can confirm what was going on with Hardwick and Rose or knows what he was doing on all those late nights. He looked across the field again. West used to watch us. From the window there. If he's still around, maybe he remembers seeing something. Park scanned the house again, and the irises of his eyes widened a bit and brightened to a warm gold. I don't know about that window, but that curtain on the ground floor keeps twitching. Someone's home. Cooper squinted, but his eyes were nowhere near as good as Park's. Hmm. He sees, but does he observe? Shall we find out, Watson? They trudged across the field, and the back door opened before they'd even fully crossed the backyard. Sal West waited in the doorway. To Cooper, he looked exactly the same as he remembered. Still a wiry white man with dyed black hair carefully combed to lessen the expansive bald real estate, and dark, hard, calculating eyes. He was probably in his early seventies, which meant he'd been even younger than Cooper remembered him being as a child, but that wasn't surprising. He had tried to avoid West as much as possible. He had frightened Cooper, made him uncomfortable. Embarrassingly, he felt a strange shiver now when West stepped out onto the patio and beckoned them closer. It was that same knowing smile that had made Cooper edgy all those years ago, patronizing and almost intrusive. Mr. West, I don't know if you remember me. Little Cooper Dayton, of course I remember you. Don't tell me you've lost another ball in my yard. West's voice was deep, but he spoke barely above a murmur, like he was trying to sound more feeble than he was. He looked past Cooper and scanned Park, then pulled the door shut behind them. Apparently, they wouldn't be welcome inside. This is my friend Oliver Park. I was wondering if I could ask you a few questions. Questions about Alex Hardwick, I assume. You heard about what happened yesterday? West inclined his head slightly and smiled. The valley isn't the easiest place to keep secrets. Not like living in the city, is it? Where did you end up? Do you see? Has my father been gossiping? Cooper said lightly. I admit I'm surprised. No, no, but like I said, there are no secrets here. West looked Park up and down again, and there was something almost excited about his expression, probably thrilled to see a stranger. The valley doesn't have tourists either. You live there as well. You must find that very confining a big man like you. Cooper raised his eyebrows. The hell, but Park just shrugged. I'm a city mouse. Mr. West, you've lived here for a long time, right? Cooper said. It was awkward, but how was he supposed to segue naturally from I'm a city mouse? Oh, forty years, give or take. How old do you remember, Mr. Hardwick? Better than you, I imagine. You were still a little thing when he left. West tapped a finger to his lips as if shushing himself. Or didn't leave, I suppose. Is there anything you could tell me about that time? About? Do you remember if Hardwick had any enemies or if he was acting strange at all before he disappeared? West reached up and rubbed the skin at his throat thoughtfully. You think Alex made someone angry enough to kill him? I'm sorry, Mr. West, Cooper said frowning. I thought you'd heard. Alex Hardwick was murdered. West flapped his hands at them impatiently. 
Yes, yes, I know, but enemies, that's very... Oh, I don't know, dramatic. Isn't it more likely that he interrupted a burglar or something? Cooper exchanged looks with Park. What makes you think that? There were some break-ins in the neighborhood that summer. My own humble home was victimized. Really? Did you report it? Of course, to your father, actually. Were any suspects ever identified? No, West said slowly. There were no arrests made. But you had suspicions, Cooper guessed. West smiled a weird closed-mouthed smile that finally made Cooper understand the word reptilian. He had to force himself not to take a step back. There was a girl living in the neighborhood then, Rose Doherty. Do you remember her? The name rings a bell, Cooper said carefully. What makes you think she's the one who robbed you? A hunch, West said. And I saw her go into the Bell's house once, through the storm cellar. I wasn't sure enough to call the police, weak eyes, but... He looked at Park, and there wasn't anything weak looking about them now. She was a troubled young thing. Did the Bells ever report a break-in? Not that I heard. They wouldn't want to look that common. Cooper couldn't argue with that, at least. You know that Rose passed away before Hardwick, though? So that doesn't support your interrupted burglar theory. Perhaps she had a partner. What partner? Well, I don't have a storm cellar, so someone small enough to slip into a window, I'd imagine. Her brother, perhaps. He was barely twelve, Cooper protested. I always found the Doherty's to be... unusually capable. West checked his watch, a heavy-looking deep gold vulgarity that dwarfed his wrist. Oh dear, I'm afraid we'll have to cut this conversation short. I have my own theft to attend to. I'm stealing some Gorham Sterling flatware from under a competitor's nose, but only if I can get the kill bit in on time. Please give my best to your brother and his lovely fiance. Good day, gentlemen. West gave them one last tight-lipped smile and floated back into his house before Cooper could get a word in. He had lost control of that interview. Hell, he'd never gotten control of that interview. West had skirted around Hardwick having enemies very neatly. Though it was interesting that Rose had come up again. So, first murder, then illicit affairs and blackmail, now a family of cat burglars, Park whispered as they walked out of the yard. And we haven't even left the block. I'm never going to believe you when you say you grew up in a boring town again. He's off his nut, Cooper said. There's no way. Stephen was out here putting the Eleven in Ocean's Eleven. I have a hard time thinking Rose was either. What do you mean? I mean the storm cellar might get you into the basement, but the Bells always kept the basement door locked from the inside. So maybe she picked the lock, or... More likely, someone inside the house let her in, Park said, nodding. You're saying Rose might have had a boyfriend to avenge her death, after all. Jacob Bell. He was her age, hot, Cool, rich, and knowing his mother Catherine, the sort of guy who would keep a romance with your local poor, fatherless junkie on the down, though, if he wanted to hold on to his allowance. Park raised his eyebrows as they started across the Bell's backyard. What? Just interested in this hot, cool, rich neighbor of yours. Also, unrelated question, how do you know the inner basement door stays locked? Cooper made an unimpressed face at Park and knocked on the Bell's front door. Somewhere in the house, a small dog started yapping. Interesting, Park said. Nope, it's really not. And what did I just say about not believing you when you say something is boring? You are seriously howling up the wrong tree. There is absolutely nothing interesting about my relationship with Jacob fucking B- The door opened, and Cooper felt like he'd been punched in the throat. Chapter 8 Cooper Dayton Gabriel might have been the first person in town who didn't look the same as the last time Cooper had seen him. He was a grown man now, pale skin less aglow, edges softer, and thankfully, the imperfections that had always been there were clearer to Cooper's adult eyes. But all that just made him more frustrated with himself when he felt his heart twinge, like flexing a temporarily forgotten sprain. Wow, look at you, you look great. Gabriel stepped outside and pulled him into a hug. Cooper's arms hung stiffly at his sides while a wave of emotions rose in his throat, nearly choking him. He could feel Gabriel's breath on his neck, his large open hands on his back. He 
feel the warmth of Gabriel's shoulder radiating against his face. There was a split second where he was frozen, overwhelmed by the familiar scent of someone who had once occupied so much of his mind. There was also a split second where he was overwhelmed with the urge to knee Gabriel in the balls. Both feelings brought back strong memories of his teenage years. Gabriel pulled back. It's been a long time. I wondered if you were coming home for Dean's due. Yes, Cooper managed. Well, I'm so glad to see you, Gabriel smiled. Age has been kinder to you than to me, I think. You look great, he repeated. No, Cooper said and felt choked again. Yes, no, he sounded like a nervous witness on the stand. He sounded ridiculous. He forced himself to say something else. You look fine. Gabriel laughed at him. Still a sweet talker, I see. Park coughed lightly beside him and Cooper twitched, feeling unreasonably guilty and more than a little trapped. This is my, uh, colleague, Oliver Park. Cooper flinched at himself, but to his credit, Park didn't react. Gabriel Bell, he shook Park's hand. It's great to meet you. Please, come in. I'd love to catch up. Cooper didn't move from the step. I didn't think you'd be here, in this house. I'm just visiting, helping put some last-minute stuff together for tomorrow. Tomorrow? Gabriel clicked his tongue. Careful. You're lucky my mom's out or she'd hit you with a speech and demand a donation. Eliza's got a fundraising event tomorrow at the marina. Did you know she's running for office? Wait a minute. He searched his pockets and pulled out a little round button pin with bright red lettering. Here we are. He handed the button to Park, who examined it. Vote Bell. Catchy. There's a surprising deficit of fun, positive words that rhyme with our last name, unfortunately, and nothing works with Eliza. Surely one of the worst hurdles women face in politics, Park said straight-faced. Very true, Gabriel said, seemingly oblivious to the sarcasm while pulling out a second button. But if anyone can overcome, it's Eliza. Stop by tomorrow. Listen to what she has to say. I think you'll really like her platform. He slipped the button into Cooper's front shirt pocket and patted it. Your support would mean a lot to me. He looked into Cooper's eyes, hand still resting against his chest, and smiled. Cooper took an unsteady step back. Actually, we wanted to talk to her about something else. Her and Jacob. Your parents, too, if possible. Gabriel laughed. So you want to talk to anyone but me? Careful there, Coop, or I might start taking it personally. Cooper ignored that. Can you tell me how to contact them? Well, only my dad's here right now, but Jacob should be back any minutes, and we're all going to your brother's party tonight. Everyone? Why? Gabriel looked at Park. Is he always this warm and welcoming? I thought he'd have outgrown it by now, but... His expression shifted to something amused. Looks like some people never change. Cooper flexed his fingers behind his back, wishing he'd need Gabriel after all. Well, it sounds like it's a busy time for you. I'll just have to catch the rest of your family tonight. Will you calm down? He rolled his eyes. I'm joking. Come inside. Please. He wanted to say no and walk away with every fiber of his being. But they had come here to ask questions, and the only thing he wanted less than being around Gabriel was letting Gabriel scare him away from what he wanted, just like he was a kid again. Great, this won't take long, he added, more an apology to Park than anything else, as if he was responsible for Gabriel's behavior. The inside of the house was about as pretentious as the outside had led him to expect. There was more than one huge empty vase in a corner. The furniture was all muted whites and grays that never looked sat on, and the walls had the occasional piece of hotel art that would have been an excellent place to hide secret messages. They were so forgettable. It was expensive, bland, and exactly what Cooper had always imagined the inside of Gabriel's house would look like. Whatever Park thought had happened, he'd never actually made it farther than the basement. The only odd thing was all the furniture was up against the walls, though the reason for that became obvious when they entered the living room. Robert Bell sat tilting a bit to the side in a large electric power chair. A number of tubes connected him to the machines around him. His gray hair had been cut close to the head and his once plump face hung deflated, making him look much older than he was. At his feet, an old Bijan Frise sat up, watching them wearily, sniffed the air, and growled. Massive stroke, three years ago, 
Gabriel offered, walking over to his father and adjusting his head a bit so it wasn't at such a painful-looking angle. I am so sorry, Cooper said. Can he hear you? Sure, but I don't know how much he'll understand. He still has some good days, but this isn't one of them. I'm here to keep an eye on him while Mom and Jacob are out. Hello, Mr. Bell. It's good to see you again. Cooper tried anyway, just in case. He added a little awkward wave that would have prompted the Robert Bell he remembered to viciously mock him under the pretense of just joking around. As a father, he had made Ed look reserved and warm. But Robert didn't react, and after a moment, Cooper turned to find Gabriel watching him with an expression torn between softness and annoyance, which summed up a good deal of their childhood relationship, actually. He can't answer you, Gabriel said tightly. Then, in a gentler tone, You don't mind talking in here, do you? If you don't think we'll bother him. You said Jacob lives here? Yeah. Mom needed help after... You know. And Jacob was, uh... in between careers at the time. The Bichon had stood shakily and was creeping toward Park, tail between legs. Here. Gabriel reached into his pocket yet again, and Cooper half expected another button. Give her one of these, and she'll be your friend for life. Park delicately accepted the crumbly dog treat, his expression extremely unimpressed. I always thought Jacob would take over the marina, Cooper said. Nah, Jakey was more interested in starting his own business. He has a moving company now, you know. Deliveries, too. And Eliza's always been all about politics. So I took over the marina. Cooper stared. What happened to being a painter? Gabriel's face twisted to something ugly before settling into a sort of skeptical smirk. What happened to being an FBI agent? Ed says you're in, what's it called, the BSI now? That's like management or something, right? I didn't realize you two speak. I always liked your dad. And he's at the marina every day since his retirement. Gabriel paused, contemplating Cooper. He talks about you a lot. About how busy you are. How you're always in important meetings. He smiled slowly, like he knew that was just an excuse used to avoid Ed, and Cooper suddenly wished he hadn't lied to his father. It felt wrong to be allied against him with Gabriel of all people. But still, not really like those old secret agent movies you loved, is it? Did you ever picture yourself doing what you do today? Well, out of the corner of his eye, Cooper saw Park delicately sniff the treat and shudder. There were some surprises. Look, I'm not trying to be an asshole. I'm just saying we all make compromises. You got out of the valley like you always wanted, but are stuck doing paperwork. I took over my parents' business, but I still get to flex my creative muscle sometimes. Now we don't just do boat repairs. We do decals, too. Gabriel sat on the couch and patted the cushion beside him. Please, sit. There wasn't room for all three of them, so Park took the armchair pushed up against the opposite wall at an awkwardly removed distance. The dog immediately curled up at his feet. See? Gabriel pointed. Told you the treat would work. Park grinned, showing all his teeth. Cooper recognized it as a distinctly unfriendly look between wolves, but of course it went right over Gabriel's head. His canines were a little larger and pointier than usual, too. Not something your average, unaware human would necessarily pick up on, but Cooper spent more time in Park's mouth than average. He cleared his throat. Gabe, did you hear about what happened yesterday? Alex Hardwick, right? That name was a blast from the past. This town really couldn't keep a secret. Fortunately, it was finally working to Cooper's advantage. I can't believe he's been dead all this time. I would have sworn he skipped town. Gabriel leaned back into the couch and crossed his legs, the tip of his boot brushing Cooper's knee. Cooper pulled back slightly. What made you think that? Well, all the valley girl drama, of course, Gabriel grinned. Actually, you know what's funny? My mom's been taking credit for his running off for years. Awkward as heck for her now. Cooper lowered his voice and glanced at Robert Bell, who was staring out the window and apparently not listening. What do you mean? What did Hardwick have to do with that or Catherine? Across the room, Park cleared his throat and raised his eyebrows. He looked a bit like a disgruntled chaperone. Valley girl? It's a stupid local beauty pageant that's almost more ridiculous than the name implies, Cooper explained. A low bar, I know. 
It's a competition for young women that requires skill and excellent academics, Gabriel corrected. It provides thousands of dollars in scholarships every year and is a huge boost to a college application. Your mother was on the board, wasn't she? Yes, she was a former Valley Girl winner herself. So was Eliza. Gabriel looked at Park. I know it sounds silly, but every year the young woman who won got a ten grand scholarship. Nothing to sneeze at back then. I wouldn't sneeze at it now, Cooper countered, if I actually got the money. But they didn't, did they? That's not true, Gabriel said with exaggerated patience. And that misconception is exactly the reason why Mother hated Hardwick. He threw around accusations of embezzlement and ruined Valley Girl's good name. Good name was a distinct overstatement, Cooper thought. He said, but those accusations were true. Weren't they? No. Well, it's complicated. The year before, there was another board member, Ron Bartucci, who was mishandling funds. He was fired, and the actual cops did their job. It was a dark time for Valley Girl, but the public understood that he was one bad apple. The rest of the board could have handled it and moved forward with all the good work they do, if not for Hardwick. He covered the trial, and his articles hinted that Bartucci hadn't been working alone. There wasn't any indication of that at all in the investigation. It was total bull. But he implied the whole event was corrupt. He never came right out and accused my mother, but he was doing his best to drag Valley Girl down. They almost had to cancel that year. Donations and contestant turnout was so low. Sounds like she had reason to hate Hardwick, Park said. Must have been a relief when someone stopped him from writing anymore. Cooper stiffened and tried not to let the surprise show on his face. Park wasn't usually so brusque in interviews, and it was weird to hear it now. He was the smooth one, the charming one. Not here, though. Gabriel laughed. You're joking. He looked at Cooper in disbelief and then back to Park. You're not joking? You think she had him killed? He made a face and seemed to reevaluate Park. This time his gaze was a lot less friendly. I don't know what dog-eat-dog -dog world you're from, but there's a much simpler way of stopping someone from libeling you here. Suing them. Your mother sued Hardwick? She warned him she would. She felt she owed him that at least. Called it a neighborly courtesy. A lawsuit would have bankrupted them. Hardwick did the smart thing and backed off. The pageant went on, and later that summer, he disappeared. It wasn't a big deal. I really only remember the guy because Mother's basically been saying good riddance to bad rubbish on loop ever since, because she thought he ran, and because he was in the wrong, not because she actually did anything wrong or, he glanced at Cooper, inappropriate. Gabriel's mouth twisted a bit, an expression Cooper recognized from when they were kids and Gabe would regret something he said, like he could suck the words back into his mouth. The regret used to be enough to earn Cooper's forgiveness back then. Surely recognizing you were a shit was the first step to not being a shit. Pure naivete. But now the look just clued Cooper in to what Gabriel had really meant. It seemed plenty of people had known about the affair after all. I didn't mean... I'm not saying I think your mom... Did you ever have a break in here? Park interrupted. And mysterious new attitude or not, Cooper was thankful. A break in? No, never. Gabriel seemed to be losing patience with what was obviously an interrogation on Park's end, and not a friendly catch-up between old friends, or whatever the hell he thought they were here for. It's not really that kind of neighborhood. Only murders allowed around here, then. Park said, voice tight. What a relief. What about Rose Doherty? Cooper asked. Do you remember her? In his chair, Robert Bell made a sound of protest or discomfort, and Gabriel stood and fiddled with one of the machines nearby. Stephen's sister, he said over his shoulder. Your families were close, weren't they? Sort of. Remind me, when was it that she dated Jacob? Gabriel looked up, startled. They weren't. I mean, they didn't. That's weird. I swear I remember them together. You must have been confused. Cooper channeled his best Sal West reptilian smile. Maybe. It wouldn't be the first time, right? He wanted Gabriel to take the bait. To say something, anything about the past. About that day. 
It didn't have the effect he was going for. Gabriel surprised him by sitting back on the couch closer than before and putting a hand on his knee. Cooper glanced automatically to Mr. Bell, who was back to calmly staring out the window, and then to Park, watching him with an almost identical expression to the Bichon at his feet, emotionless, but focused and anticipatory. Cooper felt oddly stirred by it. Gabriel followed his gaze and seemed to notice the intensity of Park staring as well. He slowly removed his hand with a frown. I guess we were both pretty stupid back then, huh? He said lightly, vaguely, avoiding the challenge. It probably wasn't what he'd meant, but it was hard not to look at Gabriel and his unwillingness to acknowledge what had happened between them even now as a grown man and not feel stupid indeed as the very last of his childish longing slipped away. Yes, I guess we were. They left shortly afterward. Cooper unwilling to wait around any longer for a chance to speak to Jacob, who, despite what Gabriel insisted, was apparently not arriving any minute. Not when it meant spending more time with Gabriel, who had nothing else to say about Hardwick, flat out refused to talk about Rose Doherty, and became increasingly interested in turning the conversation back to their childhoods or whatever make-believe version of their childhoods he was choosing to remember anyway. Cooper briefly wondered if Jacob was avoiding speaking to him purposefully, but that didn't make any sense. How could he possibly even have known they were there? It's not like anyone really knew they were looking into the case, and he wanted to keep it that way. The last thing he needed was the FBI agents to feel like he was stepping on their toes, at least not until he had an actual lead to give them that would get their attention off Ed. At this rate, that wasn't happening soon. Well, that was a waste of time, Cooper said as they walked the forty feet from the Bell's backyard to his. We could have just waited for tonight. And miss out on these. Park held up his vote bell button between pointer finger and thumb. Cooper noticed the plastic was now cracked and the metal pin mangled before Park stashed it back in his pocket. The pageant embezzlement stuff was interesting. Eva Hardwick made it sound like he never covered anything high profile at all. I don't know if there's a motive there, though. Gabriel was right. There are easier ways to stop someone from harassing you. Unless Hardwick was on to something, and Catherine Bell did have something to hide. Maybe, Cooper paused, standing in his backyard. Right here, he was directly in between Hardwick's house and the Bells. He could see the second-floor window of West's house and the now tidy back garden where the Doherty's had kept nothing but weeds. As a backdrop to it all, the pines of the forest stood, gathering darkness as the morning finally shifted to afternoon. He tried again to imagine himself as Hardwick just thirty years old, younger than Cooper was now. A bad marriage, an affair, a lawsuit, and some kind of fuckery with a young troubled neighbor. No wonder people thought he'd run. Cooper was getting antsy himself just thinking about it. He looked at Park and saw that his eyes were closed and his arms were crossed like he was hugging himself. The spidery lines at the corners of his eyes had deepened. Cooper felt a wave of guilt. Park hadn't exactly had the most pleasant start to the day, and he'd been dragged around and forced to work ever since. Cooper hesitated, then asked, Is everything okay? You seemed a little... tense back there. Park's eyes flickered open, and they were larger and a bit more gold than usual. Your old friend's a dick. He wasn't my friend. Park raised an eyebrow. So he's just someone from your childhood you talked about your hopes and dreams and favorite movies with? Know thine enemy, Park. Fine. Your old nemesis is a dick. Occupational hazard. Usually I'm the only one who gets bothered by that sort of thing, though. Park didn't respond, so he pushed. Do you want to tell me what's up? Park's voice was flat. Your old nemesis wants to fuck you. Cooper couldn't help it. He laughed. Okay, sure. Park blinked at him, then walked under the crime scene tape right up to the edge of the disturbed dirt where the gazebo had been and examined the hole they'd pulled Hardwick out of. Startled, Cooper ducked under the tape to stand by him. I'm getting strong traces of rotting leather, paper, and rust, Park said without looking up from the ground. Is this your audition for crime scene sommelier? The unsub probably dumped that case Mrs. Hardwick was talking about in here with the body, which is why it never turned up. That must be how they identified him so fast. Park was still avoiding his eyes. 
Cooper hesitated, examining the tenseness of his shoulders and running over their conversation in his head. You know Gabriel isn't really genuinely interested in me, he said finally, startling Park into looking up at last. He's just fucking with me, using flirting to get into my head so he can manipulate me later if he needs to. That's his old M.O. Seriously, I would know. I'm an expert at looking for signs of real attraction in Gabriel Bell. He took a breath. The longing may have been gone, but the old hurt was still there. Less sharp, less threatening, but still something to avoid thinking about. More out of habit than anything else. Park was watching him closely now. It's not just mind games. He wants you. Badly. He added, not quite under his breath. I can smell it pouring off of him. Cooper stilled. What do you mean, smell it? Arousal. Need. Want. You know, the whole shebang. It changes a person's scent. Can you do that with every emotion? Know what everyone is feeling? Cooper could hear the worry in his own voice, and from the look Park was giving him, so could he. I can't read minds. Park tried to laugh it off awkwardly, but Cooper didn't join him. After a moment, he added, It's not sophisticated. More of a primitive thing evolved for, a uh, mating and survival. So stuff like sex and rage are more noticeable since. He paused, and his face seemed to flush slightly. Joy, if I'm very familiar with the person. We're pretty familiar, Cooper noted. As far as sticking your nose in places goes, it's hard to imagine it's possible to get more familiar. It's not just about proximity, Park mumbled, avoiding his eyes. But yes, I know your sense. Very well. And do you do that with me? Sniff out what I feel? Park looked unsure, like he didn't know what to do with this conversation. It's not really a conscious thing. I'm not trying to pry. It's natural for me. Like just needing to have my eyes open to know this is bothering you. I'm not bothered, Cooper said quickly. That was a lie. He felt intensely vulnerable right now. He amended. I just don't like being an open book. Park laughed again, loudly and abruptly this time, like he couldn't hold it in. Cooper, I would need a sixth sense to even remotely consider you easy to read. Cooper tried not to look so satisfied. Your button man, Gabriel, on the other hand, Park said, practically had I want you back going in skywriting. There is no back, Cooper shrugged. He was a year older, so we didn't hang out or anything. But he started being nice to me when my mom died. I developed a substantial crush on him in middle school. Did he know? Cooper snorted. Yeah, he knew. He could hardly miss it, not when I told him. Park's eyebrows shot up. You told? Did he have to answer three riddles first, or was it just the usual run-of-the-mill Scarborough Fair reenactment? You think you're funny, but I was a lot more forthcoming back then. Cooper winced. It was still one of the more humiliating experiences of his life. Funny how that worked. Logically, he knew he'd embarrassed himself way worse plenty of times when he was older, and thus should have known better. But it was that memory of lying in the field and rolling over to whisper into Gabriel's shoulder that he loved him, that he'd always loved him and always would, while Gabriel pretended to be asleep, that his mind flinched away from the most. Anyway, it was definitely not reciprocated. What happened? Nothing, Cooper said immediately. Well, we practice kissed in his basement for a summer, he said with finger quotes. Then school started, and that was it. He was... not interested in admitting he knew me. Definitely not as a boyfriend, not that we ever were, but not as a friend either. And that was it? Mmm, Cooper said. More or less. He remembered standing on the dock waiting for his father to finish talking shop with another boatman and seeing Gabriel with a couple friends going into the boathouse, a huge warehouse at the marina that was half dock and half water inside where they stored and repaired boats. He remembered the excitement and trepidation that always came with seeing Gabriel still painfully there, though his friend hadn't really spoken to him in months. He remembered his father pushing him to go hang out with the other boys, to make friends, and his subsequent nervous approach. Things had been awkward between them since school had started again, but that didn't mean they couldn't still be friendly, right? 
This was the same boy who had hugged him when he tearfully admitted to being angry at his mother for dying. The same boy who had kissed him nervously between taking turns on his Game Boy. Except it wasn't. Gabriel didn't say a word while his friends laughed at Cooper. And he didn't do a thing when they stuck him under an upside-down rowboat, too heavy for a skinny 14-year-old to get out from on his own, and left him there, trapped in the darkness, with the smell of bay water all around him and the raw-skinned feeling of betrayal inside. Taking the memory out now and re-examining it, he felt something different from before. Something new. Rage. For better or for worse, and it was definitely for worse, Gabriel was the first person he'd admitted romantic love to, and it had turned around and done something worse than just break his heart. It had made him afraid of ever giving said heart to anyone again. Gabriel, snobby shit that he was, didn't deserve to have that kind of lasting influence on his life. Cooper risked a look at Park. Not that love was necessarily what was going on here, seasickness and post-sex endorphins aside. He liked Park a hell of a lot, but they'd only known each other four months. Known being a distinct overstatement. It was way too soon to think like that. Right? Or was that the old anxiety talking still? The fear that the person you thought you loved would inevitably leave you alone in the dark? Cooper wondered who he'd be without any of the negative experiences of his life. Was it even worth asking? Park made him want to find out. Cooper reached out and grabbed hold of his hand, and Park looked at him, startled. Hey, Cooper said softly. I... Park tilted his head questioningly, expression blank, but his grip on Cooper's hand tightened almost painfully. I think we should get ready for the party now, Cooper said. There isn't much else we can do here. Park stared at him for a long moment, then nodded. Whatever you want. He started to pull away, and Cooper tugged his hand toward his chest instead and felt large fingers flex in his grip, like Park was stopping himself from grabbing back. But, Oliver? Thanks for doing this with me. I know, it's not exactly the weekend off you signed on for. Park's smile was pleased, but also a little puzzled. Yes, it is. I'm with you, aren't I? Fuck the neighbors. Fuck creepy Mr. West and Mrs. Hardwick and especially Gabriel. Cooper surged up and kissed Park, who made a tiny noise of surprise and then happiness that got lost between their lips. For the first time since arriving in Jagger Valley, Cooper felt completely at home. Chapter 9 Cooper was struggling with getting his tie just perfect when he heard Park come back from his shower. They still had about an hour or so before Ed and Dean were due to get back, and they could all head over to the venue to help set up. But Cooper wanted to get dressed now. God forbid his father see him hesitate over which shirt he was going to wear and tear into him for being fussy. You look very nice, Park said from the doorway. Hmm, maybe if I could get this to lay right, that would be true. I do this all the time. You've seen me do this all the time, so why can't I fucking get this tie on today? He pulled it out to start over. Nerves. What for? I'm not the one getting tied down. You think marriage is getting tied down? Oh, no, I guess not. Not for Dean, anyway. Park crossed the room behind him, and Cooper caught his reflection in the mirror and immediately fumbled the knot. Uh, is that what you're wearing? Park looked down at his long, muscular body, naked except for a towel. Too much? Yeah, you're way overdressed. Park smiled, then tossed his towel at him, which hit Cooper and fell at his feet. Better? Hmm, Cooper hummed, and watched Park's reflection get closer, drinking in the lines and angles of him until Park was standing right behind him. If you're into that sort of thing, I guess. You need help with that? Park reached up and gently took the tails of the tie from him and slowly began to loop them together, his fingers so light and nimble they just barely brushed the hollow of Cooper's throat. There. He tightened the tie, then smoothed it. The palm of his hand continued to travel down Cooper's belly, making the scars there tingle, and came to a rest in his belt buckle. How's that? Show off. Cooper let his head fall back onto Park's shoulder, which was still wet and shower-warm. You know, seeing you here in my old bedroom, dressed like this, or... Undressed like this makes me think. 
Teenage Cooper would have freaked. Park snorted. Seriously, you're reminding me so much of an old favorite fantasy that I'm a little worried I'm going to wake up in a minute and be 16, miserable, and unbearably horny all over again. Should probably make the most of it while you can, then. Park pressed his nose to Cooper's hair and inhaled. How'd this fantasy go? He swallowed excitedly. Oh, all the classics, tall, dark, and handsome strangers showing up in my little suburban bedroom to seduce me in secret. Stranger? Park started to undo Cooper's belt slowly, almost absentmindedly. And you just let this guy in? Well, he has this problem, you see, an overwhelming lust that only I can satisfy. I just don't have the heart to turn him away. What a humanitarian. Park unzipped the pants and with a nudge slid them down Cooper's legs. That's me. Totally unselfish, he agreed, voice hitching as Park's fingers traced back up his thighs, across the bulge in his underwear, and hooked into the waistband. So, this guy shows up in your bedroom and tells you about his problem and asks for your help. No, no, he demands it. He gets rough with me, tells me I have to do what he says or else. This lets me off the hook because I really want him to use me however he likes, but don't want to admit it. In the mirror, Park met his eyes and raised an eyebrow. Put that back down, I said seduced by a stranger, not deduced by Freud. Teenage Cooper had some shit to work out, okay? Huh. That doesn't sound like you at all, Park said easily, already moving on to kiss his neck lightly and pull his underwear slowly down to his ankles, crouching as he went. Cooper smiled. That was another thing that made sex with Park so nice. He understood that kink was evolving, fun, and didn't try to pin Cooper down on why he wanted what he wanted or when. He just paid attention, read his desires, and rolled with it, as Cooper in turn happily rolled with Park's. He could feel Park's breath against the back of his thigh, right below the tail of the button-down he still wore. Park's fingers traced up and down the inside of his legs. You're shaking. He stood and kissed Cooper's ear. You're going to need something to hold on to. Grab the dresser. Cooper immediately put his hands down, bending a bit as he did, and Park took a step back. In the mirror, Cooper looked at himself in shirt and perfectly laid tie and nothing else while Park walked around him, examining Cooper like he was on display. Naked and moving in that strangely delicate and silent way of his, so at odds with the size of his body, there was something almost wild about him, unmannered and unrestrained. Cooper shivered and Park's contemplative look shifted into a soft smile. Are you going to stare me to orgasm or what? Cooper snapped impatiently, then jolted when Park's hand smacked his ass. Not hard enough to hurt, but enough to leave his skin buzzing and warm. If that's what I wanted to do, yes. Park's hand soothed over the reddened skin just under the shirt tail then slapped him in the same spot again. Harder this time. Park met his eyes in the mirror again, checking in with him, making sure this was what he wanted. Okay. Yes, please, Cooper whispered and whimpered as Park's hand snapped out again with a filthy thwack. He felt his shirt pull up slightly, and the touch of air on his ass distracted him for a moment before Park's hand came down on his other cheek. One, two, three times, then switched back again until all Cooper could focus on was the heat of his skin, the sting of Park's hand, and how hard his dick was. You're going to do what I say now? Cooper nodded, and Park cupped the flesh of his ass gently, his hands cool. Good. Stay. He fetched a condom and lube from his bag while Cooper watched in the mirror. What are you going to do to me? Whatever I want. Park's slicked fingers massaged the outside of his hole, relaxing the muscle. Are you going to let me in here, or do I need to spank you again? Cooper groaned, spread his legs as much as he could with his pants still around his ankles, and bent over farther so that his cheek was resting on the dresser. Park's fingers slipped inside of him slowly, teasing and testing while his other hand smoothed up Cooper's spine and grabbed hold of the neck of his tie. He twisted the fabric around until it was flipped and the tail of the tie was wrapped around his hand and positioned at Cooper's throat like a leash. He tugged lightly. Move for me now. Cooper started to rock back and forth, plucking himself on Park's fingers. Faster, Park demanded, and Cooper immediately obeyed, pushing into the stretch. So eager to please. 
You're going to be a very good fuck, aren't you? Cooper gasped against the dresser top and felt the tie pull at the base of his throat again. Two insistent tugs. Look up, Park said. Watch yourself. He dragged his head up, feeling drugged, and stared into the mirror at his own reflection. He looked wrecked. His shirt and hair were sweaty. The makeshift collar pulled his head up at an odd angle. His lips were parted, gasping, and his eyes were heavy, nearly closed. You're beautiful, Park said, then added quietly to himself. So beautiful. Cooper felt the flush of pleasure race across his skin, warming him inside out. No, it was even brighter than pleasure. It was joy, pure and simple, lighting him up, erasing the shadows, burning away the twisted knots of anxiety and fear like dry tinder. He half expected to see himself burst into flame right there in the mirror. Park pulled his fingers out and Cooper bit his lip to stop from whimpering at the sudden loss. He craned his head to watch Park roll a condom on and slick himself up with more lube. Park ran his other hand over Cooper's head, wiping the sweaty strands of hair out of his eyes and stroked himself lazily, showing off. Do you see something you like? Cooper nodded, throat dry. Know where it's going to go? Inside me? His voice was embarrassingly hoarse, nearly shaking. He swallowed a couple times. Got it in one. So you're going to relax that tight ass and take good care of me, isn't that right? Park said, and Cooper nodded again. You want that too, don't you? It's okay. You can admit it. I won't tell anyone how easily you bent over and begged for a stranger's cock. Cooper's hips flexed back involuntarily, and he groaned. I need to hear you say it. Park said gruffly. Tell me what you want now. To take good care of you, Cooper whispered. To feel you inside of me. Park positioned himself at Cooper's entrance. And what do you say? Please, Cooper cried, his voice giving out as Park pushed into him. All Cooper could feel for a moment was the concentrated burn and the obscene pressure before his body surrendered and the sensation changed, first from an invasion to a deep, throbbing satisfaction and then to the overwhelming desire to move. He tried to flex backwards again, but Park's hand held him in place. Oliver, he pleaded, I need you to fuck me. Park took hold of the tie again and pulled it up right below Cooper's chin. I will, when I want to. First, you're going to need to hold on nice and tight. Cooper regripped the edges of the dresser and looked into the mirror past his own reflection. His pulse jumped. Park was staring down intensely at where their bodies were joined, his eyes huge and shimmering gold, but there was nothing aggressive about them at all. Instead, he looked almost bewildered, tentative and gentle. Cooper felt another tugging, inside his chest this time. He got the weird desire to step out of the roleplay for a moment and turn around to press his lips against Park's and laugh. It was all too absurd being back here rewriting his history in this room. It was all too good a kind of good that couldn't be contained any longer and burst up into his throat and out his mouth until he was grinning like an idiot and a sound like a small exclamation escaped his throat. Park met his eyes in the mirror, questioningly. Checking. Cooper shook his head, afraid to open his mouth again and be surprised by what confessions came out. He flexed around Park's dick and gave him the most pleading look. Please. Take me. Use me. Park ran a finger over Cooper's lips roughly, like he just needed to touch, and then began to move. Slow, long pulls at first that sped up into a punishing rhythm that drove Cooper down farther until he was flattened against the wood, muscles trembling and the dresser knocked against the wall over and over. Cooper was gasping and begging, the tension in his body building fast, when Park abruptly stopped moving. In charge or not, Cooper nearly turned around and snapped at him he was so frustrated, but when he peeled his face off the dresser to complain, Park's reflection didn't look teasing. In fact, he was just staring off into space and frowning. What? What's the matter? Cooper said before he heard it too. The beeping of an open car door coming from outside in the direction of the driveway. Cooper made a noise somewhere between anger, worry, and arousal, and Park's attention jumped back to him. Park looked at him for a moment, then hauled him up to standing by his throat and whispered in his ear, If you want me to stop, pinch me. The arm around Cooper's waist tightened, holding him in place, and the hand at his throat moved up and covered his mouth.
Cooper didn't expect the spike of arousal that shot almost painfully through his balls, and he groaned, tasting Park's sweaty palm. Shh, you've got to be quiet for me now, Park murmured, then snapped his hips forward and continued to fuck him slowly. Cooper squeezed his eyes closed. He should have been freaking out, or at least less aroused. But instead, he felt bizarrely powerful, righteous, and even with Park's hand over his mouth and arm over his body, he felt free. Fucking this man, getting fucked by this man, owning the many facets of his desires in this room that had witnessed years of doubt and self-recrimination, felt like vengeance. No, better. Justice. Outside, he heard the sound of car doors slamming, and Park adjusted him efficiently so he could get a better angle and sped up. He took hold of Cooper's dick. Look at what a good fuck you are, Park whispered, stroking in time to his pumping hips. He tightened his hand over Cooper's mouth. Being nice and quiet and taking my dick like you were made for it. Cooper felt his body spasm and his balls tighten as he teetered on the precipice of orgasm. Downstairs, the front door opened and muffled voices floated up. He bit into Park's palm and heard him hiss. If you're very, very good, I'm going to put you on your knees and paint that pretty ass with my cum until it's... Cooper jerked uncontrollably, exhaling hard beneath fingers and released over and over, shooting across Park's hand and up his own shirt front. His muscles gave out and he collapsed backwards with only Park's arms holding him up. Or were they holding him down? He floated, only vaguely aware of Park pulling out and lowering him carefully to the ground. He winced when the carpet touched tender skin of his ass and the unpleasant scratchiness pulled him back to his senses a bit. Cooper pried open his eyes and looked up at Park, kneeling beside him, his expression strange and his eyes still wide and gold. He peeled off the condom and started to stroke himself. Cooper rolled lazily to his belly and tilted his hips up a bit, letting his ruined shirt fall forward and exposing himself. He heard Park's sharp inhale and within seconds felt him ejaculate across his ass. Cooper listened to his heart rate slow, the beat and the endorphins lulling him into a meditative state for a while. Eventually, he peeked over his shoulder. You're still here, Cooper whispered, his sex-saddled brain half confused as to why his fantasy was sticking around post-orgasm and half pleased. Park's smile was wry. He leaned down and pressed a kiss to Cooper's lips. What can I say? I have a hard time walking away from you. His expression shifted to something worried before amusement took over once more. Unfortunately for your dry-cleaning bill. Cooper looked down at his sweat and semen-stained shirt and groaned theatrically. But inside, he wasn't upset. Not even a little. The price of feeling this hole didn't even come close. I kind of thought you'd have gotten better at this by now, but you're still the worst dancer I've ever met. Cooper winced and looked down at Sophie's shiny heels. Sorry, did I step on you again? You'd need to pick your feet up off the ground in order to step on mine, Sophie countered. Thank goodness I traded up. Her eyes scanned the room and she smiled. Cooper looked over his shoulder and saw Dean dancing a wild and completely offbeat swing with a squealing Kayla. Well, a tiny bit, anyway. You make him very happy, Cooper said. The feeling's mutual. She not so gently pushed Cooper until they were moving across the floor rather than shuffling in place. It still wasn't quite dancing, but even he had to admit it was an improvement. Cooper happily let Sophie lead and looked around the room. They'd rented out a large event room at a local inn. It was simple, elegant, and packed. Groups of people, many of whom he recognized but couldn't name, stood around chatting and laughing. Still more people Cooper had yet to see had spilled outside onto the sloping backyard where he could faintly hear children playing while their parents supervised. Inside... The open bar had convinced more than one couple to claim the center of the room as an impromptu dance floor. It was nice. A bit too crowded for his tastes, but Dean and Sophie were both outgoing and well-liked, and seemed totally at ease navigating all the socializing and matchmaking strangers they thought would get along. He wondered how many of those people were getting to know each other by gossiping about the body in the backyard. He's over there, with Ramon. Cooper startled out of his thoughts and followed Sophie's gesture to see Park sitting with a couple of Ed's oldest friends. Cooper's father was nowhere to be seen. Sorry, Sophie said with a mischievous look. I thought you were looking for Oliver. Dean said you were only just showering when they got back to the house. What were you two doing all day? Working, Cooper said, flushing. Most of the time. In that case, don't listen to what your dad says. You've clearly found your dream job. 
and it's got great benefits. Benefits that look especially good in those jeans, she winked. I'm assuming Dean talked to you about this morning. Don't be angry. I spent most of the afternoon grilling him. Honestly, I don't know what kind of interrogation tactics you use in D.C., but if you ever need any tips, call me. I'm not angry. It's just... It's a weird time for Park and me, so this on top of it is... Well, it's a lot. Sophie studied him closely. Do you want to talk about it? As your very serious ex, I have unmatched insight into your heart and soul. Or I can pull out the old paper fortune teller if you want. Pick a number and I'll answer any question you want about your relationship. Cooper laughed. Can it answer if I'm actually in a relationship because that's my main question? Sophie gaped. I thought you were... Never mind, you're beyond my help. We need to bring out the big guns, consult the Ouija board. Honestly, some supernatural help might be what it takes, he said. What is it about Dayton men that makes them so unwilling to talk about their feelings, Sophie sighed. It's messed up. Hey, Dean seems to be doing fine. He did nothing but open up this morning. You know how much work we've done to get him to that point? I insisted he start talking to somebody before we moved in together because I don't want my kid growing up to think men aren't allowed to be vulnerable. Well, it's working, Cooper said. He's a kitten. But it's still hard for him, Sophie said frankly. The only reason it might not have seemed that way this morning is because he's so worried about you. Cooper quirked his eyebrow questioningly. He told me about your scars. Christ, he muttered. What therapy does he go to when he gets too talkative and open? The way he described them. I know that's not just a superficial wound, Cooper. Plus, I noticed how you were cutting up your food at dinner. Multiple small bites. Overchewing. That's recommended for someone who's missing part of their stomach. Cooper stopped dancing. You've lost significant weight and your nails are cracked? A sign of early or slight malnutrition? Jesus, Nancy Drew. Sophie wasn't in the mood for jokes. You don't want to tell Dean or your dad about it, okay, but if you want to talk to someone, don't forget. We are still friends. He exhaled. It was harder to dismiss when put like that. More, he didn't want to dismiss her. Gently, he started dancing again, and Sophie followed suit. They'd moved halfway around the floor when Cooper said, It was my small intestine, actually. Lost about six and a half feet of it. Sophie just nodded like this was expected. It made it easier to keep talking. It was bad for a while, but I'm adjusting now. I'm relearning my body's needs, he added using a phrase his GI doctor liked. Good, she said. No surprise, no pity, just calm acceptance of the facts. Maybe he had a type, Cooper thought. Maybe all the best people he'd been with were unflappable. He didn't necessarily need that strength in his life, but damn if he wasn't drawn toward it. Cooper took a deep breath, feeling lighter than he had in a while. Thanks. It wasn't a lot. He'd barely said anything, but just knowing there was someone that he could say more to was enough. Instinctively, he glanced back at Park. Hard to miss, even in this crowd, and easily one of the most striking men in the room. Tall and broad in dark jeans, t-shirt, and blazer, he was bending down and squinting hard at something Ramon was showing him on his phone. Cooper smiled. For all his superpowers, Park still refused to bring his reading glasses with him out in public. Park wants to help, he said to Sophie. With my recovery, I don't know why that's so hard for me. Park looked up at him suddenly, as if he'd heard his name. He smiled at Cooper, tentatively, questioningly. You're allowed to not want help. Just because it's good intentioned doesn't mean you should feel forced to accept it, or feel bad for not wanting it. Yeah, Cooper said, still staring across the room. It's just... Park's head jerked to the right suddenly, and he frowned at something across the room. Cooper followed his gaze and stopped dancing. What the hell? Sophie turned. What is it? Who are those people talking to Ed? Trouble, Cooper said shortly and stalked across the floor, dodging dancing couples with Sophie at his back. Agent Primalis, Agent June, what are you doing here? Mr. Dayton, we are having a private conversation, Primalis said, something in his expression satisfied, like he had expected Cooper to come charging over. The loose cannon son, sure to just make things worse for his father. That's funny, Sophie said, stepping forward, because this is a private party. I know Dean's got a lot of friends, but I don't remember seeing your names on the invite list. Ms. Odell, Primalis started. It's Dr. Odell, Cooper said. Dad, what's going on? Ed wasn't meeting his eye. 
He looked rumpled and smaller than usual in the old suit he only took out for funerals, and there was just the faintest hint of mothballs in the air. It's fine. They just had some follow-up questions. It's nothing. Nothing that couldn't have waited until tomorrow? Sophie said primly. This is a homicide investigation, ma'am. I'm sorry it can't be postponed to a more convenient time because of a party, Primula said stiffly. Cooper gritted his teeth. Yes, of course, every agent knows the first 24 hours are essential. Oh, no, wait. Is that first 24 hours or years? Well, it's certainly interesting to know the BSI's opinion of cold cases. I guess you guys have a statute of limitations for... Primulus broke off, and his sneer flickered with annoyance at something over Cooper's shoulder. Cooper didn't need to turn around to know who had joined them. Sorry I'm late, everyone, Park said easily. This is my first pissing contest. Wasn't sure when to jump in. Mr. Park, was it? I'm not surprised to see you, but as I was just telling your friend, we're here to talk to the older Mr. Dayton only. Have you even spoken to any other suspects, or did you just spend the entire day trying to dig up something against my father? Because you're not going to find anything, and coming here trying to embarrass him isn't going to get you anywhere either. June spoke up. Unlike you and your productive day, you mean? You should know we've already informed your supervisor that two of her agents are interfering with an ongoing investigation. Well, shit. Cooper didn't dare look at Park. He was surprised he hadn't heard from Santiago yet. She was probably still drawing breath for the imminent explosion. Either that, or she had just quietly put in his papers for termination from the BSI. Though he would not be surprised if she had the means to put a hit on him as well. But Park didn't deserve that. Frustrated, Cooper snapped. I don't see much of an investigation to interfere with. If you were running your own, you'd know that Hardwick pissed plenty of people off. His reporting on the Valley Girl scandal, his messed up photo collection of Rose Doherty, the scraps of possible motives they'd spent the entire day collecting sound humiliatingly feeble now. Primalis and June exchanged amused looks. You think someone killed Mr. Hardwick over a beauty pageant? She said. Tell me, did any of these enemies you're alluding to have a physical altercation with the victim shortly before his disappearance? What are you talking about? You assaulted Alex Hardwick, didn't you, Mr. Dayton? Cooper laughed. What? Who told you that? My father would never hit some- Ed was shaking his head at him, a stricken look on his face. Dad? Mr. Dayton, again, we can certainly continue to speak here, but perhaps you would prefer if we finished this conversation down at the station. The blood drained from Cooper's face as he imagined his father, the former Sheriff Dayton being interrogated in his own old building. He could already see the defeat and the shame setting into his eyes. No. Mr. Dayton, is my father under arrest? Cooper! Ed scolded, finding his voice at last. That's enough. I don't want you to get any more involved. You've done enough as it is. What the fuck is that supposed to mean? I did lose my temper and hit Hardwick. I should have said so yesterday, I know that. I'm fine with going to the station to clear up any questions. I'm sure everything will be sorted out soon. His voice was painfully even. It was his on-duty voice, the one he used to calm down hysterical witnesses. Ed looked at Sophie. I'm sorry about this. I didn't mean for... He shook his head and without looking at Cooper walked away with Primulus and June following behind. I can't believe him. Cooper watched them leave the room. Yeah, why does that guy hate you? And what's up with the interagency rivalry stuff, Sophie said. I mean, I don't believe him. My dad, why is he just giving up like that? And I can't believe he hit someone. I need to follow them. No way, Sophie put a restraining hand on Cooper's arm. No offense, but right now, I think you just piss them off more. Let me find Dean and we'll go to the station. It's your engagement party, Cooper protested. You should stay here. Look, they caught me off guard, but I can be professional. Stay here and I'll go. I don't... She broke off, looking over Cooper's shoulder. Hey, are you okay? He turned to what had caught Sophie's attention. Park's face was sweaty, and his normally light brown skin looked bloodless. Almost ashy. Dark circles that hadn't been there minutes ago were starting to form under his eyes. Cooper instinctively reached up and brushed his thumb across one. I'm fine. Park gently pushed his hand away. No, you're not. Oliver, you're shaking. Sophie had grabbed his wrist and was taking his pulse. Your heartbeat is elevated. You should sit down. Park's eyes drifted closed, and he licked his lips a couple of times. I just need a moment. He swayed forward, and Cooper grabbed him, feeling the full weight of his body for a millisecond before Park jerked himself up again. Sorry, still a little seasick. Sure, delayed onset seasickness. That makes total sense. 
Sophie said brightly as Park started to tip back over. Cooper grabbed hold. What's wrong with him? I have no idea. You're a doctor. I'm an animal doctor. It's a bit different, and I'm officially ruling out heartworm. She reached up and fried open one of Park's eyelids, revealing just a glimpse of his wolfy gold before he jerked back and away from them both, ripping out of Cooper's arms. Whoa there, Sophie said. Easy. Not loving this bedside manner, Park said stiffly, eyes squeezed shut. None of my other patients have ever complained. Your pupils are crazy dilated, she frowned. Did you take something? Park shook his head and rubbed his hands over his face aggressively. You took Dramamine on the boat, remember? Cooper looked to Sophie. Who knows how old that was? If Dean fucking poisoned my boyfriend, I swear to God I'm going to kill them. Do you think he's having some kind of allergic reaction? No. Park seemed to pull himself together, his eyes passably human again and straightened shakily. I just got a little vertigo. I'll be fine. Go after Ed. I'll follow you. He took a step forward, inhaled deeply, then bent over and put his hands on his knees. In a minute. I don't. The urgency to follow his father and make a scene at the station had faded, overshadowed by his worry for Park. He didn't want to leave him. Cooper had never seen him like this. This unwell. He looked even worse than he had on the boat that morning. Could it actually be some kind of delayed seasickness? But no, he'd been fine just minutes ago. Not to mention all afternoon. There's a bathroom downstairs. Sophie's voice was gentle but commanding. Take him there, sit him down, and splash some water on his face. I'll talk to Dean and we'll go to the station. Kayla can go home with my parents for tonight. She squeezed Cooper's arm. We'll figure this out. Cooper nodded, grateful again that Sophie was not the sort of person to get flustered. Thank you. I'm sorry. Call me when you know something. Of course. She kissed his cheek quickly. Take care of him. She went to look for Dean. Come on. He tugged a non-protesting Park out of the room, his silent acquiescence almost more worrisome than anything else. Cooper led him down the stairs and into the bathroom, then turned on the sink and tested the water temperature. Here, come stick your head in here, okay? Oliver. Park was leaning up against the bathroom wall, his eyes closed again. He was breathing heavily, almost panting like he was in pain. What's the matter? Do you feel dizzy again? Cooper reached up to put the back of his hand to Park's forehead. Before their skin could touch, Park's hand was wrapped around his arm tightly. His teeth, sharper than usual, grazed the thin skin of Cooper's wrist and his eyes were open and blown out, the whites barely visible on the corners. Cooper felt a thrill of something run up his spine. Fear, arousal, a previously unexamined combination of the two. Before Park dropped his wrist and turned his face away so quickly only the slight ache and dampness of spit on skin proved he'd been there at all. Sorry, Park mouthed without making a sound. Cooper's hand stayed frozen midair a moment before he tentatively reached the couple inches farther to touch Park's forehead. You're burning up. Park rocked his head back and forth until Cooper's hand was petting his hair and Cooper jokingly scratched behind his ear. Park hummed and pressed his nose to his wrist. You smell nice. He licked the same spot. Taste nice. He began mouthing his way up Cooper's arm. Park. Oliver, seriously, what are you doing? This is not vertigo. Am I going to have to get your drink tested for roofies or did someone squirt a flower in your eye? Park's face was pressed against his armpit by now, and he nuzzled there for a moment. Cooper squirmed at the ticklish yet bizarrely arousing sensation, and Park's hand seized his hips, spun him around, and pushed him against the wall. Oomph, Cooper managed before Park's mouth came down on his and kissed him with a strange undercurrent of desperation. Cooper responded distractedly, kissing him back while his mind whirred with questions. Pushed up against him heavily, Cooper could feel Park's body shaking, and he tentatively raised a hand to his shoulder. As soon as he touched him, Park jerked away. He took a step back, head hanging low, and didn't meet Cooper's eyes. Get out. Cooper stared. What? I need a couple minutes alone. Please. Oliver, you're obviously not okay. I'm fine. Please, just... Park looked up and met Cooper's eyes. I had too much to drink. No, you didn't. I'll be fine in a couple minutes, but not while you're distracting me. Please, Cooper, trust me. Just trust me. Cooper looked at him for a long time. He did not want to leave Park alone, but felt conflicted after his conversation with Sophie on how he wished Park would respect his own boundaries when it came to caregiving. Was this the same thing? He had no clue. He had no idea what was even going on.
but he did want Park to know he trusted him. Okay. Fine. But I'll be right outside, and if you collapse and die in here, I swear to God I'm going to resurrect you and kill you myself. Mm, mouth to mouth. Park jerked his head at the door. See, you're distracting me again. Two minutes. Cooper left and leaned against the wall opposite the bathroom, straying to hear the thump of Park's body hitting the ground. How the hell had the night gone so badly? He didn't know what to worry about more. The fact that the FBI was having a chat with his father over assaulting a murder victim, or that the always unshakable Park was shook and then some. Or maybe he should fix it on the fact that he'd called Park his boyfriend earlier right in front of him. That was... not intentional. But if worse came to worst and Park questioned him about it, he could just blame a fever dream. Christ, Aiden, you're an asshole, Cooper muttered to himself. He heard voices coming down the stairs, and a moment later Stephen Doherty appeared holding the hand of a small boy, probably five or six. Cooper, is that actually you? Stephen, hey, I didn't see you upstairs. We just now defected from a pretty intense capture the flag battle outside. Latrine break, Stephen winked. Cooper laughed. His brother's old friend was just as overgrown and gentle giantish as the last time Cooper had seen him at Dean's graduation. He was tall and broad with blunt features, noticeably red hair, and a ton of freckles at various stages of fading. It was a face as familiar to Cooper as his own family's, except for that all the familiar baggage, and seeing it now soothes a little bit of his nerves. At one point in his childhood, Cooper had seen Stephen every single day. Margaret Doherty hadn't been the most present sort of person, he wasn't sure if that was a direct result of losing her daughter or a long-standing struggle with mental health, but the result was Stephen had spent a good amount of time over at the Dayton house growing up, mostly by design. Ed wasn't the type to badmouth other people's parenting, which was why Cooper had never forgotten when he'd raged at Margaret Doherty after Stephen had shown up on their steps scratched up, underfed, wearing torn clothes, and desperate to hide the fact that his mother hadn't gotten out of bed in days. Stephen had barely spoken two words together back then, and it had always confused Cooper why his brother, with all his friends, had taken this silent and awkward boy under his wing so defiantly when Dean generally had the emotional awareness of a spoon, or used to. But after today, Cooper was starting to realize he'd underestimated his brother. "'It's been forever,' Stephen was saying, shaking Cooper's hand. "'This is my son, Callum. Callum, this is your Uncle Dean's baby brother.' "'Son, wow.' I'd heard a rumor, but had to see it to believe it. Hey there, Callum. You're telling me. Say hi. Callum, as red-headed as his father, but much more petite, had moved from holding his dad's hand to clutching his thigh, and was hiding behind him shyly. In his arms he squeezed a stuffed white horse. Stephen rolled his eyes jokingly at Cooper. He takes after his father. He gestured at the bathroom. You waiting? Uh, sort of. My friend got a little sick. Too much, uh, sugar. Mmm. I had a couple glasses of sugar myself. Sophie knows all the ingredients to a great party and pours them generously. Stephen winked and raised his cocktail glass in a toast. Where do they take off to, by the way? I can't find Sophie or Dean anywhere. Or did I just answer my own question? Um, Cooper glanced back at the bathroom door. I didn't see them leave, he said honestly. Well, there's enough people up there that I doubt they'll be missed. Though I'm pretty sure Dean said if anything happened to him, it was your job to make sure the roof got raised and the conga got in line. <laughs> yes, you know me, Cooper said, a regular party animal. Stephen propped his substantial bulk up against the wall. At his side, Callum sat on the floor and started combing the horse's mane with his fingers. Cooper glanced at the hall, but they were alone. The sounds of the party were muted and distant. Actually, Stephen, can I ask you a couple questions? Of course, he grinned. Is this about potential bachelor parties? Because Dean already told me I've been ousted as best man. He also might have said something about me making sure you don't get him into any trouble. He waggled his thick red eyebrows, which indicates to me an inner party animal, after all. No, not that. Um, maybe we could talk without little ears? Stephen frowned. Cal, love, why don't you stay right here and wait for the bathroom? Daddy's going to talk to Mr. Cooper. They walked about 15 feet down the hall. Stephen seemed utterly relaxed, mildly curious, and genuinely pleased to see him again. Cooper knew he hated talking about the past. One of the reasons he knew so little about Rose was because Stephen had always refused to talk about her. He didn't want to bring any of this shit up now. He had just taken a step forward in his relationship with Dean. What kind of damage would forcing this painful conversation with his best friend do to that? 
For a moment, he considered slapping Stephen's arm, telling him he really did want to get his advice on bachelor parties and didn't want to bring up the possibility of strippers in front of the kid. Cooper exhaled loudly. He couldn't. Even with his partner out of commission for the moment, he was determined to carry on the investigation. He was working on borrowed time. Who knew when Santiago would call and cut him loose? Frankly, even if she did fire him right now, it wouldn't stop Cooper from following this case through. Not after seeing the defeated slump of his father's shoulders as he left his own son's engagement party. Not after hearing his father. His father had punched the murder victim in the face and hidden that fact from the FBI. You heard about what happened yesterday, yeah? Stephen's smile froze in place and his body seemed to still for just a moment before he responded casually. Yeah, I couldn't believe it. Alex Hardwick, crazy. Did you remember him? Stephen looked down at his drink and swirled it contemplatively. Not well, he was a journalist, right? Look, Cooper took a guess. I already know him and my mom were having an affair, so don't bother sparing my sensibilities there. What I want to know is if he was also sleeping with your sister. What the fuck, Coop? Stephen hissed. He glanced down the hall toward his son, but Callum was now racing his horse from wall to wall and wasn't paying any attention. It's just a question. It's just bullshit is what it is. Mrs. Hardwick thinks there was something between them. Cooper paused, unsure what to say about the photos. Well, she doesn't know what she's talking about. There was no affair. He was, what, in his thirties? She was only nineteen when she died, for fuck's sake. Which means you were twelve. How do you know what was going on? I knew my sister, okay? She liked Hardwick. He tried to help her out. But there was nothing sexual going on. What's this about? Cooper frowned. It was the first positive thing someone had said about the man yet. What do you mean he was trying to help her out? She was going through a bad time, you know that. She was... unhappy. So how did Hardwick help with that? Stephen hesitated, then shook his head dismissively. I don't know. Like you said yourself, I was twelve. Stephen, if you know something, no. Cooper looked at him critically. The old, stony Stephen of their childhood was back. The one who would stare you straight in the eye and lie to your face when asked if he'd eaten that day or if he'd been to school that week. He was hiding something. Protecting someone. But why? What was the point now after all these years? Whatever it is, it can't hurt Rose anymore, Cooper said softly. But it can help uncover the truth. He reached out to touch his arm and Stephen shifted just subtly out of reach. Cooper froze, then put his hand back down. What? A cold, heavy pit solidified in his stomach. He pushed it down deeper. There were any number of reasons Stephen didn't want to be touched by him. It didn't mean... Forget it. He had a murder to solve. You don't understand. It's not just Rose's secrets, Stephen was saying. He looked down the hall at his son. Why are you dragging all this up? They just pulled Hardwick's bones out of my backyard. My dad's not handling it well. My sister had nothing to do with that. Besides, Ed's tough. Stephen. He lowered his voice to a whisper. The FBI just crashed the party and took him in for questioning. Stephen's eyes widened. Dean and Sophie followed them to the station. His station. He may be tough, but like I said, he's not handling it well. I don't want to see him hurting. I don't think you do either. He's always been good to you. You're as much a son to him as I am. More. You know that's not true, Stephen said automatically. He made a face and took a step toward Cooper. Look, someone was bothering her. I heard Rose and our mom talking about it once. Someone had taken some photos of her that would have ruined her life. She didn't know who. The photos just started showing up in the mail with demands for money. I got the mail then, so I'm the one who found it. She cried and begged our mom to help her. His mouth twisted. She just said Rose had gotten what she deserved for being so... careless. He took a deep breath and looked at Cooper. You're right. Your dad was more of a parent to me than Margaret ever was, and I'm sorry I can't help him now. But Rose had nothing to do with this. Hardwick wasn't the one harassing her. He was helping her. He loaned her the money for the payoffs and promised her he'd find out who was doing it. He said he'd fix it. Why would he do that? Stephen opened his mouth and a piercing yelp rang through the hall like an animal in terror or pain. Both he and Cooper whipped around. Park was out of the bathroom and standing at the end of the hall where Callum had evidently run into him and fallen backwards. 
The kid was on his butt and staring up at Park like he was the most terrifying thing he'd ever seen. Cooper barely had enough time to register the scene before Stephen disappeared from beside him and was suddenly down the hall and tossing his wide-eyed son behind him toward Cooper. He then shoved Park back, and an enormous snarl echoed through the hallway. Oliver! Cooper ran toward the men. What the hell are you? But it wasn't Park who had growled. It was Stephen. Chapter 10 Stephen's teeth had elongated, and his normally blunt features seemed sharper. His eyes had widened to a glowing green-blue, and he was leaning forward, right in Park's face, emitting a constant growl. Park wasn't making a sound, and his teeth weren't out, but his lips were tightly pressed together, and the whites of his eyes had all but been obliterated by luminescent gold. They were both staring at each other, unmoving, the tension in the air suffocating. Oliver... Cooper stepped forward, and Park's eyes darted toward the movement just before Stephen took advantage of his distraction and slammed into Park, knocking him hard into the wall. "'Stay the fuck away from my kid!' Stephen's voice came out like an electric bass, low and graveled. "'I didn't touch him!' Park spat out, barely intelligible from his tight jaw. His whole body was shaking, but his expression didn't seem afraid. It was more like he was straining to hold something up, or in." back off me. No, first you're going to stay away from my family. I have no interest in your family. And stay away from the Daytons. Park's lip twitched, and then suddenly it was Stephen up against the wall. Their position switched. Daddy! Callum yelled when Stephen tried to knee Park and was suddenly flying down the hall and landing in a sprawl of limbs. Two leaping jumps and Park was crouching over him. Now he was making noise. The kid ran down the hall faster than Cooper could, threw himself onto Park's back and bit down on his shoulder. Park grunted, reached back, and grabbed at the child, and Stephen roared up, looking terrifying. Park slammed him back down and held him there with one hand around his throat, while he pulled Callum up and off him with the other and held him dangling in the air like a puppy. Enough, Park said, his voice different than usual. Frightening. The kid stopped wriggling immediately, and Stephen's whole body shuddered, though his face was still twisted with fury. Oliver. Cooper finally reached them. He grabbed Park's shoulder without thinking and felt his body go eerily still under his fingers. He let go. Let's all just back away, okay? Park didn't move at first. Then he carefully lowered Callum to the floor and, after another hesitation, released Stephen, stood, and quickly backed away pulling Cooper with him. Stephen was on his feet as soon as Park stopped moving and had whisked his son up and behind him piggyback style. No one spoke. The silence was oppressive. What had happened had really only taken under a minute, but it felt like hours. The party, feet away and carrying on obliviously, seemed like another world. None of the wolves moved or even blinked. So, Cooper said finally, a tu, Brute? He was ignored, but at least whatever stare-off had been happening before was broken. Stephen pointed one clawed finger at them. Don't come near me or mine. Or what? Park snapped. Oliver, Cooper said, appalled at the aggression in his voice. Or next time it won't be an even fight. Oh, was that what this was? Cooper stepped forward. Stop it. What is wrong with you, Stephen? He didn't even know where to begin. Stephen looked at him. Cooper, I don't know what you think you know, but you don't. I know everything. I mean, I didn't know about you, but I know about this. Cooper made claw shapes with his hands and shook them vaguely in front of his own face. Beside him, he saw Park roll his eyes. Wait. Something clicked into place. An essential piece to the puzzle that finally started making the overall picture just a little bit clearer. If you're... Then so was Rose, right? He looked to Park for confirmation. That's what you meant about Rose's secrets not just being her own, isn't it? Stephen's eyes flickered a bit in acknowledgement. What's your point? Cooper tried to remember Mrs. Hardwick's exact words. Nature shots, woods, animals, old knickknacks and empty chairs. And Rose Doherty, naked and filthy and roughed up, like she'd been rolling around in the dirt. Is that what the blackmail was really about? Someone found out she was... 
He glanced at Callum, who was still on his father's back and had buried his face in his jacket. A werewolf? Cooper mouthed. Stephen frowned and said, He knows what he is, and we're not ashamed of it. Of course not. Why would Cooper think it was shameful? I didn't mean... Stephen shot him a look, and the words died in Cooper's throat. I'm sorry, he said instead. Stephen hesitated, then slid his son off his back. Go upstairs and find Mom straight away. Tell her we have to go. Wait, you don't need to leave, Cooper said as Callum raced down the hall and disappeared up the stairs. Yeah, I really do. With a park here. And not just a park, but... Park growled again, silencing whatever Stephen was going to say. Cooper shot him a look, but was ignored. Please, Cooper said, can you tell us more about the blackmail? Stephen looked at Park, and Cooper got the distinct impression a conversation was happening without him. It wouldn't be the first time. Park might not be able to read minds, but he didn't need to, and all wolves were excellent nonverbal communicators and had a rich system of body language and facial cues that Cooper was still struggling to pick up on. Finally, Stephen broke away, expression a little resigned, and looked back at Cooper. I don't know much. I was just a kid, too. Rose and I were close. We had to be. He ran his tongue across his teeth, which were still extended. Yes, someone was blackmailing her for being a werewolf. It was a different time then. We had no one. We were... alone. He looked at Park and scowled. Completely alone, get it? And she obviously couldn't go to the police. So she turned to Hardwick? Why? Cooper paused. Unless he was... no. But he was aware. Some humans are, you know. Stephen gave him a look too exhausted to be truly amused. I guess he'd spent time with a pack when he was living in Puerto Rico. He recognized the signs and had already guessed about Rose, so when she got the note and our mom wouldn't help, he was the only one she could turn to. Who was blackmailing her? I told you, I don't know. Hardwick took care of everything. He paid the price and got the photos back somehow. And then held on to at least some of them, Cooper frowned. And what did he want in return? Nothing. Not really. Stephen's eyes became distant. Rose was the one to offer. She told me about it. Her big plan to pay him back. She was going to sign up for this pageant thing that Hardwick was obsessed with. The Valley Girl pageant? Cooper said. Yeah, that's it. I guess he thought there was something shady going on and she wanted to help him find proof from the inside. He smiled. She thought it would be fun. And did she? Find evidence? Stephen looked him in the eye. No. She died. Cooper winced. Stephen. He took a step forward but stopped when Stephen shook his head. That's all I know. I told you, it has nothing to do with Hardwick's murder. I'm leaving now, and no offense, Cooper, but I don't want to see you again for a while. Not while you're with him. Cooper nodded mutely, and Stephen backed up most of the hall and then spun and hurried up the stairs. Jesus, Cooper muttered, staring after him. Stephen Doherty was a wolf. Quiet, shy, awkward Stephen Doherty, who was Dean's best friend and always let Cooper play hide-and-seek with them and had once given him half his cake slice when Cooper had dropped his on the floor and Ed refused to cut him another. Cooper had known him all his life, but he'd never really known him at all. Jesus, he repeated, looking wide-eyed at Park. Do you think Dean knows? About what? Do you think he knows the way to San Jose? Cooper said sarcastically and made a face bewildered the question needed clarifying. Do you think he knows that Stephen is, you know, another total dickwad from your childhood? Park said dryly. Shut up, he is not. What is all that about, anyway? You guys went from zero to sixty over nothing. He got protective of his son. From what, you? You're not exactly the boogeyman. You don't see me the same way other people do. Park's expression was unreadable. I don't know about that. Cooper looked away, scuffing the toe of his shoe against the floor. Shit, Callum left his horse here. He went to pick the forgotten toy up. You think I can catch him? I think that would be a bad idea. He doesn't want to see you again, remember? Yeah, but it kind of sounded like that was just because of you. How did he know who you were? My family is well known around the East Coast packs. You know that. I thought that was just Maine, Cooper said, trying to wrap his head around it all. 
On their first case together, he'd seen how Park's ex-pack had influence and power back in Florence. But finding out that reputation spread all the way down here was forcing him to reevaluate the little he knew about them. And what was that other thing Stephen had started to say? Not just a Park, but a... Why did Park interrupt him? Or maybe he doesn't want to see you and to get grilled about the worst time of his life again. The silence rang between them. Park blinked hard. Sorry, I'm... Still a little wound up. No, you're right, he doesn't want to see me. A wave of guilt came over Cooper. That wasn't at all how he'd wanted that to go. But it had been informative. Hardwick was not the blackmailer. At least not originally. Whatever Stephen said about it being Rose's idea to infiltrate the pageant, there was still a bad power dynamic over there. A vulnerable, isolated girl with only one adult in her life willing to do the decent thing. It wasn't unexpected that she'd feel an unnecessary degree of gratitude. Maybe he'd even counted on it. Manipulated her to carry on his obsession with investigating Valley Girl. But what did that have to do with Hardwick's murder? Rose was already dead by then, and her overdose wasn't criminal. He wasn't the one blackmailing her. But someone could have still blamed Hardwick for Rose's death, potentially, yeah. Pageants weren't the healthiest environments, Espionage wasn't known for being great on the nerves, either. Her drug use could have picked up during that time, indirectly making Hardwick responsible. But in that case, his killer would have had to know about the blackmail and the subsequent Valley Girl infiltration. Who? Stephen. Cooper didn't even want to think it, but he'd obviously adored his sister. They'd dismissed him before because of his age, but being a wolf made him stronger and larger than most twelve-year-olds. Rose's mother, Margaret. She had to have felt guilt for not helping her own daughter when she needed it most. Cooper couldn't even imagine the devastation of losing a child. Margaret may not have been parent of the year, but she'd have felt something, and in the darkness of that something had likely cast around for someone, anyone, to blame for her loss. The real blackmailer, whoever that was, would have known at least part of the story as well. But why would he or she have gone after Hardwick? Not to avenge Rose, surely, Not when he could be seen as equally responsible, if not more so. Finally, Alex Hardwick. Obviously, he hadn't killed and buried himself, but he might have told someone about the blackmail. Eva, maybe? After Rose's death, he could have been the one to feel the most guilt and been driven to confess his part in it all. He'd used her. Some might even argue he'd used her worse than the blackmailer had because he took advantage of her gratitude. He'd called in a debt when there'd been only basic human decency. And all for what? Because he couldn't let the suspicion of embezzlement on the Valley Girl board go? What had he even expected Rose to do about that? As a competitor, yeah, she'd get closer to the action than Hardwick could, obviously, especially with threats of a lawsuit coming his way, but short of breaking into the board member's personal files? Cooper exhaled abruptly. You've got something, Park said. At some point he'd moved to sit on the floor. He still looked a bit ashy, but better than before. What are you talking about? You were doing that thing you do. You know, the thing where you space out and talk to yourself and then grunt and tell me who our new suspect is? I don't grunt, Cooper said, mortified. Did he grunt? He definitely talked to himself. He really had to work on that. Especially with ears like Parks. Especially when so much of his inner monologue these days revolved around said big-eared partner. He fidgeted. How are you feeling? All better, Park said, standing. I told you, it was nothing. Now tell me who we're going after. Cooper ran his hand through his hair, smoothing it, already afraid to look rumpled and less than perfect. Do you think the coast is clear upstairs? There's someone up there I want to talk to, though I know she's not going to want to talk to me. Catherine Bell was still managing to hold court at a party that had absolutely nothing to do with her. She had to have been in her late 60s or early 70s, Her hair was a shocking white, and she was sitting in a chair someone must have carried over for her, wearing tailored pants and a silver silk top that emphasized her willowy frame. To Cooper, she looked as intimidating as ever. This is the woman you think took a hoe to Hardwick, Park murmured beside him where they watched her talk about how proud they all were of Eliza and encouraged the crowd groveling at her feet to come to the event tomorrow. It truly will be inspiring. Park shook his head. She doesn't look like she could hoe a weed. It was twenty-five years ago. She would have been in her prime. 
Besides, it doesn't take a lot of strength to kill someone like that if you get the angle right. Wants to knock him down, right here at the temple. Finish the job when he's stunned on the grass, and then you've got gravity working for you. Cooper demonstrated a quick, brutal swinging motion toward his feet. Boom. Easy. What? Park was looking at him with distaste. Remind me not to get on your bad side. Cooper crossed his arms. Oh, so you think I have a bad side? Park snorted. Anyway, she would have been stronger then, and poetically, I doubt she'd have seen Hardwick as anything more than a troublesome weed. She always had a certain understanding of who's worth what. With herself firmly at the top, I assume. Of course. The marina was her family's business, actually. She only changed the name after she was married, God knows why. It's made her very important in town. Well, wealthy and well-known anyway, which are the building blocks for power, if not importance. I think that's why she and Robert have been grooming Eliza for politics since she was born. Park raised an eyebrow. It's like Catherine's version of having a title in the family. She'd get her hands in all the behind-the-scenes action, maybe even swing a few laws the marina's way. A scandal like embezzlement would have completely derailed those plans. It sounds like you may have some pre-existing... opinions about Mrs. Bell. Park looked extremely skeptical, almost amused. It also sounds like a soap I watched once. If by pre-existing you mean opinions formed from my previous interactions with her, say around the time of the crime in question, then yeah, you bet I do, Cooper paused. Of course, Robert Bell would have been capable of killing Hardwick then too, and he's maybe just as Machiavellian as his wife, he murmured, thinking. He glanced at Park, who was shaking his head. Look, I see why you're being defensive. The Bells remind you of your own family, the ruling class of Florence. Park started to protest, but Cooper continued. I'm not saying money leads by necessity to evil. Your relatives are probably perfectly nice, but I know these people, and I think Catherine at least would absolutely kill to protect her own interests. I'm not being defensive, Park said with a touch of impatience. And just so you know before you meet them, very few of my relatives are perfectly nice, actually. I just think it would be irresponsible not to point out that your feelings about the Bells may be clouded by your relationship with the youngest, dickiest one. Cooper barely even noticed that Park was still harping on there being a relationship with Gabriel. His attention had snagged on something else. What do you mean, meet them? Did something happen? He lowered his voice. Something you think the BSI is going to get involved with? Though Park's family had been cleared of any wrongdoing during his and Cooper's first investigation together, it had become quite clear that as an old, large, and powerful pack, they considered themselves out of the law's reach. Park didn't talk about it much, but Cooper imagined he would find it difficult to choose sides if it ever came down to it. Pack or not. Is that what Stephen had started to say? What? No, nothing like that. I just meant... Park broke off, looking curiously flustered. I didn't mean meet them under a professional capacity, but, you know. Cooper shook his head, not getting it. Well, I'm here with your family now, Park said. Cooper laughed without humor. Yeah, and I apologize for that already, right? If I didn't have such an unusually competitive waitlist of biggest regrets, that fact would make top five. Can I just say for the record now, if I ever do run into any blood relatives of yours, for whatever reason, I hope to God there's significantly less murder. Right, okay, well. No promises. Park looked distracted. So, are we going to interrogate this devil incarnate in orthopedics or not? Cooper frowned, puzzled at his abruptness. Was Park still not feeling well? He waited, but no explanation was forthcoming. Let me take the lead here, okay? She hates me enough that she'll want to get under my skin, and we might be able to use that to get her to talk more. Park shrugged, still not looking directly at him. It's your show. As they approached, Catherine caught Cooper's eye and murmured something quietly to her hangers-on, who tittered and scattered as good courtiers do. I heard you were in my house today, she said once he was in earshot. That was it. No greeting or normal acknowledgement of recognition, just an observation delivered without ornament. That was Catherine's way. Never aggressive or outwardly hateful, she would never have been able to acquire the social acclaim she had if she was, but... She did make the absence of courtesy into a sort of art. The art of war. Yeah, I was hoping to talk to you and your son. I can't imagine what you and I might talk about, and... She looked confused. Didn't you... Hmm... 
have your chance with Gabriel? Confused like a shark? Not him. Jacob. I wanted to talk to him about his relationship with Rose. Rose Doherty. Her pale blue eyes showed no sign of recognition. Not even a flicker. But he wouldn't bet against her in a staring competition with a marble statue. You remember Rose, of course, Cooper continued. She lived across the field from you, competed in your favorite pageant, and broke into your house to find evidence that you too had embezzled funds from Valley Girl. Catherine folded her hands in her lap carefully. Of course I remember Rose, a very troubled young woman, I'm sorry to say. But she didn't break into my home, and before you continue, please know that I take slander of the dead, she paused, and the living, very seriously. It's not slander if it's true. She was seen entering your home via the storm cellar. Not the usual guest entrance, is it? He paused. Unless you're saying she was there to see Jacob, in which case, yes, I am still hoping to speak to him about their relationship. Is he here? Gabe did promise me he would be. Cooper looked around the room theatrically. Catherine's voice was slightly steelier now. Jacob is home attending to his father. Cooper frowned at that. Why would Gabriel have lied? Or was Jacob again avoiding seeing him? Why? Regardless, there's nothing to talk about. There was no relationship between him and the... Girl. He's home, you said. I'll have to stop by later to confirm that. She tilted her head. I hadn't realized you'd decided to make your father proud after all and join the sheriff's department. He must be very happy. She matched Cooper's pronounced scan of the room. Where is he now? I know I saw him speaking to those FBI agents before, but that was almost an hour ago. Cooper viciously bit the inside of his mouth and beat back the ashamed and nervous little boy she somehow knew still lived inside him. He was grown now. He had faced down worse threats than Catherine Bell. In theory. I know Rose was sneaking into your house to look for evidence of embezzlement, he said flatly. That's not a question, it's a fact, and I think it's a fact you're familiar with. Maybe because you caught her in the act. Maybe because you grew suspicious on your own. Why else did you think she signed up for the Valley Girl pageant? A sudden yen for tiaras? I had hoped that she was interested in bettering herself, in turning a new page. A hope that was lost when she overdosed on methamphetamines in the middle of the competition. Overdosed, Catherine repeated slowly. Truly tragic, but not murder. So I can't imagine why you are delivering these questions as threats. No one's threatening you, Mrs. Bell. I'm just asking why Hardwick approached you with the evidence Rose found before her death, rather than go straight to the police. Was he hoping for a payout to keep quiet? Or did he just want to see your face? She stood shakily, her expression alien, twisted into pity like she was looking down at a small child who was humiliating himself. She was a tall woman, five eight or nine by Cooper's guess, and her heels put her within a couple inches of his eye level, but not above it. Still, Cooper had a feeling Catherine could look down on him from hell. I can see why you'd like to think so, she said, voice dripping with sympathy. It must be hard to have already lost your mother and now your father, too. I would also like to make up a silly story to comfort myself, but that's all it is. A story. Alex Hardwick never approached me with evidence because there was no evidence to find. This is all a fiction that's gotten out of hand. She was seen sneaking into your house to see me. Cooper turned, startled by the interruption. A woman had approached. She was an inch or so shorter than Catherine and had relaxed honey blonde hair, a friendly if unremarkable face, and the same beautiful brown eyes as her brother. Eliza, what are you talking about? Catherine snapped. The presence of her daughter seemed to throw her more than anything else that had happened so far. Rose was sneaking into our house to see me. Cooper glanced at Park and raised his eyebrows. Why would she do that? We were friends. She held out her hand to Park. Hello, I don't believe we've met. Eliza Bell. Oliver Park, I work with Cooper. Of course, Cooper, good to see you again. She shook his hand, too. Her skin was strikingly soft and her grip gentle. Cooper had to resist the urge to cradle it in both hands like some kind of creepy old man. Oliver Park, I don't suppose you're a relation of Delia Park in D.C. Park tilted his head slightly. My cousin, he acknowledged. I didn't know you had family in the city, Cooper said, surprised and momentarily distracted. Why would you? She hasn't broken the law, Park said coolly without looking at him. Cooper frowned. 
I would be very surprised to hear if she did, Eliza said, and even her laugh was soft and soothing. Cooper had no idea where she'd gotten all these pleasant traits from, but he could see how she'd done so well for herself in government. There was something very comforting about her presence. I had the pleasure of meeting Delia Park several times at charity events when I was working in the urban planning department. She's one of the largest patrons of housing development, Eliza was explaining to her mother. Really? Catherine reevaluated Park carefully, then smiled, her whole demeanor changing when she saw what she was looking for. Old money. Breeding. Power. Are you in town for long, Mr. Park? I'm afraid not. I'm sorry to hear that. Though if you have the chance, I hope you come by the marina tomorrow. My daughter is having a little campaign event I think you would enjoy. Do you like live music? There will be wonderful bands there and food and speeches. Mom, please, he doesn't live here. He can't vote for me. Eliza offered them a sympathetic look. It's like running for high school class president all over again. My mother is so involved she puts my campaign manager to shame. I'm sorry, is it wrong to be proud of your children? He may not vote for you, but he can listen to your wonderful speech. And write a wonderful check, Cooper had no doubt. Eliza, if you don't mind, you said before that you were friends with Rose Doherty and that it was you she was sneaking into the house to see. That's right, we were very close. Why was this the first time he was hearing of it? Why was it a secret? Why did it involve the basement? Cooper knew why he and Gabe's friendship was subterranean, but was Eliza saying she and Rose were close romantically? Sexually? Eliza didn't look like she felt the need to clarify. Was that because of the people around them? Or did it really not cross her mind that many would hear that and consider a non-platonic relationship? Park, back to his charming interrogator persona, bless him, finally said in a genial but perplexed voice, I'm sorry, Ms. Bell, I'm a little confused. Is it normal around here to have your friends enter through the storm cellar? Well, okay, maybe he wasn't quite back to full charming status. Eliza smiled sadly. We didn't want people to know we were friends. We'd only started hanging out when she signed up for the pageant. She was new to that world, so I'd give her tips on how to speak, what to expect, and what to wear. I even gave her some clothes and stuff from when I competed. She didn't want people to think she was trying for favoritism or had an unfair advantage. As it would have been, Catherine said stiffly before Cooper could get a question in, but I don't see why you would hide this from me. Sometimes you could be a bit judgmental, Mom. Catherine tossed her hair behind her shoulder, irritated. Eliza took a deep, steadying breath and explained, Rose was going through a difficult time. I'm sure you know about that. She was struggling with a lot of drugs, methamphetamine specifically. We talked about it almost every day. I was terribly naive then. I thought I could be enough to help her get clean. I was afraid if I told my mother she wouldn't approve and would stop me from seeing Rose. I wish I had told her now. I know an addict needs much more of a support system than one teenage girl. She reached up to play with a delicate gold chain at her neck, a comforting gesture. I'm responsible for Rose's death. Darling, no. Catherine touched her daughter's arm. There wasn't anything you could have done. I could have said something. Gotten her real help. I saw her getting worse, struggling more, using more, but I never imagined she would die. It's so hard to see mortality at that age. She looked back at Cooper, and now he could see a little of her mother in her. That stony, unforgiving determination shining through her eyes so like Gabriel's. I regret what happened every day. Her words hung in the air, the ringing truth in them impossible to deny. Then the real woman was gone, and the politician was back. That's why one of the initiatives I have as mayor of Jagger Valley is to implement earlier substance abuse prevention education at the middle school level. Before either of the Bells could ask Park to estimate how much he cared about children's health in a dollar amount, Cooper asked, Did Rose ever mention why she signed up for Valley Girl to begin with? From what you've been saying about her, it doesn't really sound like something she'd have been interested in taking on at that time in her life. Rose told me about that journalist, if that's what you mean. Poor Mr. Hardwick. I know he wanted her to look into the possibility that my family was involved in the embezzlement. She glanced at her mother apologetically. After we got close, Rose admitted to me that's why she first signed up. Catherine clicked her teeth. But I told her there was no embezzlement and she trusted me. She actually cared about the competition by then. We talked about her getting off the meth and using the prize money to go to college and get a fresh start. Eliza took a shaky breath. She really genuinely wanted to win. 
Maybe, Cooper thought, or... He had a vague idea from late-night reality TV binging that pageants were expensive to compete in. If Hardwick was as obsessed with digging into the embezzlement scandal as it seemed, Cooper could see him possibly funding Rose's wardrobe. But maintaining a meth addiction was expensive, too. If she was using as much as Eliza made it sound, maybe Rose had kept stringing Hardwick along even after Eliza told her there was nothing to uncover in order to use her rhinestone fund for Crystal. But would she have really just taken Eliza's word for it? Maybe she was onto something in the embezzling investigation after all, and that's why she was sticking around. So she just admitted to you that she'd lied to you and been spying on your family and you thought it was okay. No big deal, Park said. That would not have flown in my family. I was hurt, Eliza said slowly. Of course I was hurt. I was a teenager, everything was painful then, but she was my best friend, and... She smiled. Like I said, I was a teenager. I couldn't imagine life without her. Cooper asked, How do you know Rose believed that there was no embezzlement? Perhaps she was smart enough to recognize the truth, Catherine said. The unlike you hung in the air between them. Eliza glanced at her mother with slight, almost fond disapproval, then gave Cooper an apologetic look. I'll tell you the same thing I told Rose. We'll give you whatever files you want. Look at my family's bank statements from that time. Look at our phone records. Whatever you need to clear up once and for all that there was no embezzlement on our part, it's yours. That's very generous of you. No, it's selfish, she said. I'm confident that my mother is innocent, but even a rumor can ruin a campaign, so I think you understand why I'd rather this not come up again while I'm running for office. She paused. I will always feel responsible for my friend's death. But my mother is not, and she certainly did not murder Alex Hardwick over non-existent proof of a crime she did not commit. Soon after the Bell women made their goodbyes, Eliza, shaking both their hands again and promising any help she could if they had more questions, and Catherine re-extending her invitation to the fundraising event tomorrow to Park, and Park alone. When she moved to Cooper, she rested her hand lightly on his arm and leaned in close. Will you be staying in the valley much longer? Why, do you think I'd enjoy coming to hear the wonderful music at the marina tomorrow too? Cooper said sarcastically. Her hand tightened just slightly. I hope you do. Gabriel regrets he couldn't make it tonight, but he had a previous engagement with the fiancé. Did he mention Katie this morning? Cooper shrugged. Sweet girl. Beautiful girl, I just thought you should know in case you planned on staying. But perhaps I'm mistaken. It's not like there's anything here for you to leave your nice life in D.C. for. She leaned in. Again, I'm very sorry about your father. She squeezed his arm once and followed her daughter away into the crowd to schmooze or threaten some other poor sucker. All right, Park said, watching them walk away. She's not my favorite either but seemed genuinely surprised to learn Rose was ever in and out of her house or friends with Eliza. Unfortunately, he would dearly love to see Catherine arrested. Cooper checked his phone. There was a text from Dean. No charges, just more questions. Don't come, dropping Dad home soon. He showed Park the message. That's good, right? Park said, handing it back to him with a frown. He cleared himself. Or it just means they want to wait until they can make an extra solid case against him because they know when charging the ex-sheriff they'll need it. Who knows what they'll dig up next, but at the rate they've been going, it'll be soon. Meanwhile, our investigation is back at square one. Cooper ran a hand through his hair, tugging at the strands. Focus. You think your father's hiding something else? A couple hours ago, I would have said he would never have assaulted someone, so who knows? I was thinking, Park said slowly, but what you said to Mrs. Bell and why Hardwick would confront her rather than go straight to the police. Some kind of shakedown, Cooper said, but I'm really starting to doubt there was any embezzlement. They were both way too confident just now. Right, but it made me wonder. Why didn't Hardwick tell the police about Rose's blackmailer after her death? Wouldn't he want to stop him or her from doing the same thing to someone else? Cooper lowered his voice. I thought the, uh nature of the content would have made that impossible. Park shook his head. You heard, Mrs. Hardwick. In one picture, there's an animal. In the next, a naked girl. Your average unaware is not going to see that and think, oh, duh, werewolf. They're going to think, this guy was a perv and cheapskate, and he used that roll of film for more than one purpose. Cooper considered that. 
there wouldn't be any, uh, in-between shots, he asked delicately. He still had never seen a change himself, but imagined it the way he'd seen on old movies. Some kind of agonized, stop-motion American werewolf in London-style transformation with middle stages where the person was neither fully human nor wolf. Park made a face, apparently guessing at his train of thought and disgusted by it. With a disposable camera's shutter speed? No. Which is another thing. Why hold on to the photos after Rose's death? I don't know. He was trash? Or, Park said, what if the person Hardwick was actually threatening to shake down was not Catherine, but whoever took those pictures? The real blackmailer, and he was going to use the camera as collateral. You mean the original blackmailer, Cooper corrected wisely. So Hardwick tries to turn the tables and gets hoed down? Park shrugged. It's just a thought. No idea how he'd figure out who took the photos, though. Cooper repeated Park's earlier words, a suspicion forming in his mind. He was a cheapskate. Mrs. Hardwick said there were lots of random crap on that camera besides Rose. Nature shots into animals, yeah, but also old knickknacks and empty chairs. Who takes pictures of old knickknacks and empty chairs? Based on my last trip to Chelsea, too many people. Besides artists, maybe someone who needed to photograph stock? Sal West buys and sells antiques for a living. He's also creepy enough to blackmail Rose, easy. Cooper slapped his hands together, and a couple people around them jumped and looked over. Let's go have a word. Park's eyes widened. Now? No, you're right. We should wait for my dad's court hearing. I'll need something to distract me then. Fine, Park grumbled. We can try. But if he's sleeping, don't look at me to huff and puff and blow his door down. The neighborhood was quiet. Ed wasn't home yet, and the house was dark and eerily still. Cooper hoped it just meant Dean and Sophie had taken him somewhere else, and not that he had been held up at the station after all. Mrs. Hardwick's house was also dark. Cooper wondered if she'd gone out. Where did one go the day after discovering one was a widow? Depended on the marriage, surely. Not that she'd really been married for the last twenty-five years. Choice of outing also probably depended on whether or not she'd killed him, he reminded himself. He hoped that was the case and immediately felt bad for thinking it. But he needed this done with and over needed his father to stop being questioned by the FBI, needed to get the hell out of Jagger Valley. There was a light on at the Bells. Jacob, home with Robert, probably. Cooper was tempted to go talk to him first. It would be satisfying if just to piss Catherine off. But what was there to say? Rose hadn't been sneaking in to see him. That seemed definite now. And what else could Jacob tell him that they didn't already know? No, the Bells were a dead end. Hardwick's death couldn't have anything to do with the embezzlement if there was no embezzlement. As much as he wanted to get under Catherine's skin, he didn't particularly want to see Gabriel again either. Not because of what she'd said about him being engaged. That was fine. It actually really was. For the woman's sake, Cooper hoped Gabriel was genuinely in love with the fiancé, and not just in it to please his mother. But as far as lost loves went, Gabriel was not one he was holding on to. All of his anxiety around Gabriel came from him being a painful mistake, and Cooper was just about ready to forgive himself for that. He just didn't need to be around Gabriel and his manipulative personality to do it. Are you sure about this? Park said as they walked up to West's. I'm sure I want to accomplish at least one thing today, Cooper said, and knocked on the back door. The house was dark too, but he didn't believe West had gone out. The old man was always here, watching out those big windows of his. That was probably how he'd first noticed something was up with Rose. He'd seen her going into the woods a few times and followed her, maybe just out of curiosity, maybe to try and catch her using and blackmail her for that. What a bastard. Cooper knocked again, hard. He looked at Park, who was tilting his head and frowning. You hear something? No, Park said after quietly. There's no one inside, but... He trailed off, sniffing the air. What is it? Park's eyes flickered in the dark, and he'd gone very still. Is... Park suddenly took a step back and then kicked in the door. What the fuck, Oliver? Cooper yelled. His voice echoed around the quiet field. The door had slammed into the inside wall and swung back into place. The center panel now cracked. Park didn't answer, just pushed past it and into the house. Seriously, what is going on with you, Oliver? He hissed when Park disappeared deeper into the darkness. Cooper cursed. He looked behind him, but no one seemed to be coming out of their houses to investigate probably because they were inside with the doors bolted, busy calling the cops, he thought miserably. 
Fuck it, he muttered and followed after Park inside. Maybe he'd get lucky and share a cell with his dad. He was the only relationship in his life Cooper hadn't had an overly personal conversation with today, and digging out an underground tunnel with a spoon was as good a time to share feelings as any. The inside of the house was pitch black, much darker than the outside without the moon or the faint glow from the bell's windows. It was also so quiet that Cooper's own breathing sounded like furnace bellows. He squinted, desperately trying to see. Something about the space felt wrong, still and watchful, and his scars tightened painfully. He wished he had his gun or taser, or frankly, his see-in-the-dark partner would do in a pinch. Very slowly, his eyes adjusted and the shadows around him started to take shape. Many shapes, tall and surrounding him. Cooper's hands went up into fight position, and his heart beat deafeningly in his ears until he recognized the shadows as stacked furniture. Lots of it. Ornate chairs standing on tables. Hip-top vases that reflected the very little moonlight that was coming in from the outside. Art deco lamps with swooping necks, looking naked with no bulbs in their gaping mouths. For someone who never left the house, how did West transport all this stuff? Cooper walked through the foyer into a dark living room equally packed with antiques. There were stacks leaning against the walls and tables, covered in thick cloth canvases here as well. He lifted one and found an oil painting of a woman reclining on a grass clearing, her translucent white gown slipping down over even whiter breasts while some sort of half-man, half-goat creature poured wine from a golden chalice into her mouth. Was everyone having a better weekend than him? Oliver, Cooper called again, softly. The air was so heavy it felt impossible to speak over a whisper, and heard a creaking above him. He located the stairs, which were also stacked with boxes and tchotchkes, and carefully picked his way up them without tripping to the second floor. The first room he poked his head into was clearly West's bedroom. A huge canopied bed took up the majority of the space. Beside it, a camera sat on a tripod. It was pointed out the window toward the field and not, thank you God, at the bed. The flash in the window, Cooper thought. How many years had West sat up here spying on his neighbors? He shuddered. West could have been watching them in the field. With a lens like that, he could have seen Park's eyes change, which explained those weird little comments about a big man like him feeling confined in the city he'd been dropping this morning. He would have recognized what Park was, just like Rose all those years ago. A wave of anger swept through Cooper like a fever. Had there been other wolves since then? Other lives ruined? Across from the window and tripod, there was a neat little Queen Anne against the wall. On it, a laptop sat open its screen still on and casting a white-blue glow around the room. A Word doc file was open. Cooper moved closer to read, I killed Alex Hardwick. I'm sorry. I can't go to jail. Hello? Cooper yelled very loudly now. The noise felt bad and invasive in this house. Here, Park called back, and Cooper followed his voice down the hall and finally into a dark bathroom. For a moment, the only thing he could see was Park's eyes inhumanly reflective and the brightest thing in the room. Then he noticed the sleeves of Park's shirt were plastered to his skin and dripping onto the tile. What's going on, Cooper said, but by then even he could smell the metallic tang in the air. Park reached behind them and flipped the light on. Cooper winced at the sudden brightness and reached up to cover his eyes until the spots cleared. Then he saw West in the bathtub, naked and half-submerged in a pool of bloody water. Chapter 11 Sal West bought and sold antiques with a blackmail business on the side. He takes nude photos of Rose Doherty without her permission and threatens to go public with them unless she pays him. Doherty confides in her neighbor, Alex Hardwick, who provides the cash in order to identify the blackmailer, then steals the photos. West reports a break-in, but can't admit what was actually taken without confessing his own crime. He confronts Hardwick instead, and things go badly. So he kills him and buries him under your gazebo. Agent June took a deep breath and held up her hand when Cooper tried to speak. I'm not done. Twenty-five years later, Hardwick's skeleton is dug up, and afraid that his crimes would come to light, West confesses to his murder in a suicide note and slits his own wrists. Now tell me, is that right so far? Cooper leaned back in his chair and pressed his thumbs into his aching eyes, trying to get at the pounding headache behind them. They'd been in West's living room for hours while the techs processed the scene upstairs. Beside him... Park was sitting on the edge of his seat, head in his hands and tapping his foot manically. It wasn't helping the headache or the interrogation. 
Yes, that's my interpretation of things. Is it your interpretation? Primula said from his position, leaning against the wall behind a seated June. Or is it the truth, Mr. Dayton? I can only tell you what I think. I don't know anything. Clearly. June held up her hand again, this time to silence her partner. Let's, for argument's sake, say we believe you. Let's say that West was a blackmailer. It isn't incongruous with what we know about the man. Then let's say that he was blackmailing the Doherty girl with nude photos. Not exactly blackmail material being naked, but I can accept it. We all do crazy things to avoid being embarrassed. Then you say, instead of going to the police, Doherty asks a neighbor for help. Now this one's a little harder for me to wrap my little head around. By your own accord, they had no relationship prior to this, so why Hardwick? She didn't wait for an answer, which was good because Cooper didn't have one. At least not one he could share with the unaware FBI. But okay, I can accept that too. Teenagers do crazy things. Hardwick then takes out thousands of dollars for a girl he barely knows, which neatly explains those pesky little cash withdrawals, robs West, and then holds on to the camera that Mrs. Hardwick remembers and tells you about 25 years later. Now, even if that's right... It still doesn't explain why you two broke into Mr. West's house this evening and just happened to discover his body. We were here to ask Mr. West some questions, Cooper repeated for the hundredth time, and when a 72-year-old man didn't immediately answer his door at nine o'clock at night, you broke it down? Remind me, who is it that decided that? Park picked his head up from his hands, though his leg didn't stop jumping. That was me. I had reason to believe Mr. West was in distress. June's face puckered in disbelief. And what was it that gave you that impression? Park shook his head. Have you called my supervisor yet, Margaret Cola? Mr. Park, you don't seem to understand the situation you're in. You're not in the position to be demanding we do anything. Unless this Cola woman is the one who forced you to break and enter a man's home this evening, I really don't see what she has to do with you answering my question. Park crossed his arms and closed his eyes. Are we boring you, Mr. Park? Primulus asked. Park bit his lip and didn't answer. What does why we're here have to do with anything? Cooper said. If you want to charge us with B&D, fine, go ahead. It wouldn't stand up a minute in court, and it won't change the fact that West killed himself or that there's a suicide note upstairs confessing to Hardwick's murder. If you have another theory as to why that happened, I would love to hear it, but it's not our job to come up with a satisfying motive for you. No, that's true, June said thoughtfully. And I'd agree with you totally, if West had killed himself. But he didn't. Cooper stared. Beside him, even Park's leg stopped twitching for a moment before starting up again. Worse than before. What are you talking about? I saw the body, I saw the note. Our M.E. has yet to give an official statement, but Sal West sustained blunt force trauma to the back of the skull minutes before his death. The wound didn't have time to coagulate and would likely have made West lose consciousness. So he slipped and fell in the bathtub. How many suicides have you seen where the person slit their wrists while standing up? There was also no evidence of his skull hitting the bathtub. We did, however, find blood in the kitchen. June was watching Cooper critically, analyzing his reaction, surely. West was murdered and his suicide staged, sloppily at that. Cooper swallowed, his throat so dry it caught and clicked. Why would anyone do that? he asked roughly. Well, we can assume it's the same person who wrote that note. In other words, someone who wanted very much for us to think West killed Hardwick and to stop our investigation. Hardwick's murderer, Cooper breathed. That's certainly a possibility, June said, nodding slowly. Another possibility is it's someone who cares about Hardwick's killer. Someone who knew we were getting closer to making an arrest and tried to throw us off the trail. Cooper stared at each of the agents, searching their faces for signs of humor. Really, really bad humor, but still. Anything but what they were suggesting. He saw nothing. You're insane. You're both insane. I did not kill West. But someone did. And neither of you can provide us with a logical explanation as to why you were found inside West's house or why you, Mr. Park, were covered in the victim's blood. You didn't find us here, Cooper said exasperated. We called you. Maybe killing him was harder than you thought. Messier, too, June looked at Park. 
Once you realize you are covered in evidence, it would be safer to phone it in yourself and pretend you got the blood on you while checking West's pulse. Why the hell would Park kill him? Cooper shouted. He doesn't even know the guy, and he obviously didn't know Hardwick. We've been watching you, you know. Both of you, Permala said. You're very protective of Mr. Dayton, aren't you? So when you thought your lover's father was going to go down for murder, you decided to take matters into your own hands. Cooper's breath stopped. How did they... Park laughed harshly. I forget, for which anniversary do you give blood of thine enemy, five years or ten? You think this is funny? Park stood, and both Primalis and June flinched slightly. He looked... bad. His expression was cold with a steady undercurrent of contempt, but whatever flash of illness that had come over him at the party seemed to be back in full force. He was ashy gray, sweating, and trembling. His impatience was also at a near unrecognizable high. I didn't kill anyone. Mr. Park, you need to stay seated, Agent June said calmly. No, he snapped. What I need is some air. Unless I'm under arrest, you can't keep me here anymore. I didn't kill West. No, you just broke into his house because you got a feeling he was in distress. How would you know that? Unless you're saying you're the one who caused his distress. How long were you alone in the house for? I'm done talking to you. Even Park's voice was shaking now. I need to get out of here. Guilty conscience, or are you overdue for a fix? I can't breathe in here. The smell... Park bent over suddenly and put his hands on his knees, panting heavily. Cooper jumped up and went to him. He's been sick. Please, can we just go outside just for a minute? He's not sick. At least not the kind of sick you're talking about, Primalis said. He's going through withdrawal. Look at him. It's obvious. He doesn't even use, Cooper hissed. Park, are you listening? Park's body was shaking so hard now his teeth were clattering together. Cooper touched his shoulder. Oliver. Fine, he gritted out. Just need a moment. Come on, let's get you out of here. We're not done here, Permalis said. Yes, we are. He needs a doctor. Park gripped Cooper's arm hard. No doctors. He looked him in the eye. It's just a dizzy spell. I'm okay. Fine, but we are getting out of here. Cooper started to gently tug Park toward the door when Primalis got in their faces. He knew what the agent was going to do the moment he saw him, the dislike and scheming determination in his eyes, but there wasn't time to warn Park. The agent's hand shot forward as if to seize Cooper's shirt front, and Park stopped him midway, grabbing his wrist before Primalis could touch Cooper. Park let go almost immediately, but it was too late. He'd stepped, or grabbed, right into the agent's trap. Primalis's face practically glowed with self-satisfaction. Oliver Park, you're under arrest for assaulting a federal agent. He cuffed Park's arms behind his back. Maybe an overnight visit will help you remember what you were really doing in here tonight. A little incentive to... How did your boyfriend put it? Come up with a satisfying motive for us? You baited him, Cooper snapped, so angry he was borderline breathless. I'm not going to let you do this. Do you want to get charged as well? Cooper, don't. Park still looked ill, but his face was almost eerily calm now. His eyes nearly closed like he was falling asleep on his feet. I'll be fine. Call Santiago. Tell her everything. He stumbled when Primalis pulled him out of the room. June started to follow, and Cooper stopped her. You just made a huge mistake. Perhaps, she looked at him, contemplative. Or perhaps it's time for the BSI to realize they're not above the law. Cooper had gone through some pretty bad phone conversations with SAC Santiago before, but this one was up there. Fortunately, she heard him out without comment as he explained everything that had happened over the last few days, from discovering Hardwick and running their own unofficial investigation, to discovering West after Park had smelled blood from outside the house and his subsequent arrest. He only left out Primalis's insinuation that Park and Cooper were lovers. Maybe he shouldn't have. Maybe this was the time to come clean, but it felt wrong making that decision by himself for the both of them. All right, let me make some calls, Santiago said briskly when he was done. It's too late to put anyone on it tonight, but if what you're saying is true and they're just trying to rattle Park with a bogus charge, they won't hold him past the morning. That's only a few hours away. Cooper checked the time on his phone. 
It was almost 2 a.m. now. That didn't comfort him much. Any amount of time Park spent in a cell was too long, especially when he was clearly unwell. He hadn't told Santiago about that part either. He didn't even know what to say. Park has had two dizzy spells. They may or may not be affecting his judgment. That just sounded weird and not serious enough to mention. He was also a little worried she'd jump to the same conclusion as Primalis and think Park was on something. They're just jerking us around because they're pissed, he said. And whose fault is that? I cannot pretend to understand why you thought it was a good idea to undermine an ongoing investigation you are personally connected to, because clearly it's in such good hands. But you're the one who put Park in this position. Cooper bit his lip. Yeah. He was. None of this would have happened if not for him. If he hadn't been so selfish, Park could be home in D.C. sipping those over-the-top sugary cocktails he favored and reading that ridiculous brick of plath poems he'd been dragging to their sleepovers recently. Instead, Cooper had asked Park to come here, argued with him, asked him to hide who he was, asked him to risk his job and help him undermine an official investigation, got frustrated when Park jumped to protect him, and finally got him arrested. There was such a fine line between the two, help and protection, sometimes he didn't know what he wanted. It wasn't fair. He hadn't been fair, and now Park was suffering for it. Cooper hung up with Santiago shortly afterward and got out of the car parked in the driveway where he'd made the call in case his dad was home and asleep. He let himself back inside as quietly as possible. The house was dark and silent, but he was too hyped up to go to bed. It felt incredibly wrong to wait around until morning. He needed to be doing something. He crept into the kitchen and got himself a glass of water, and then moved to the back room to check if there was any activity still happening at West's. That's when he realized he wasn't alone. Cooper jumped, his gut cramping and water sloshed over his hand and onto the carpet. Ed was sitting in his favorite armchair in the dark, head down. He was in his pajamas. Cooper hadn't even known he owned pajamas, and his left arm was at a funny angle, held a little separate from his body and bent, as if offering to escort an old woman onto the dance floor. Ed didn't move or react, just stared at his arm. Behind him, through the window, every light in West's was on and spilling out onto the field, creating strange shapes on the dead grass. Dad? Cooper whispered, feeling silly. They were alone in the house. There was no reason to keep his voice down, but even that tentative whisper sounded like a shout in the two still living room. I'm over here, Ed said as if Cooper wasn't standing three feet away from him. What are you doing up? Is, is something wrong? Did something happen at the station? He shook his head slowly, then looked at Cooper. For a moment, his expression was startled and unfamiliar, like he was looking at a stranger before it cleared and he seemed to find his focus. Cooper, did you just get in? Uh, yeah, sort of. He looked over his dad's shoulder at the crime scene techs finishing up. No more than flickering shadows that passed back and forth in the windows. Did you hear about Mr. West? Yes, he said absently. That's good. Cooper raised his eyebrows. Good? Not good, obviously. Ed shook himself a bit, like he was trying to clear his head. But now we know Hardwick's killer is here. As opposed to where, Cooper said confused. His dad's eyes skittered away and he shrugged. I don't know. Cold cases like this can go on forever. Especially if the killer d died or moved away. He'd never even considered that possibility, Cooper realized with surprise. Which just went to show how little he should have been working on this case. He was way too personally involved to do his best work. Another reason why Park was sitting in a cell right now. I guess but it didn't happen that long ago. Few people who had been in killer shape back then were dead now. Well, Margaret Doherty, but Cooper hadn't liked her much for a suspect. This seemed to cross Robert Bell off the list as well. And like you said, no one seems to leave this f friggin' valley. Ed nodded. He still had that faraway look in his eyes, but beneath it he looked almost... relieved like he'd been carrying around some unspeakable dread for days and it had finally begun to clear. 
Cooper examined him closer. Ed could certainly just be relieved that with West's murder happening while he was being questioned at the station, he was off the hook for Hardwick. The agent's agenda against Park aside, it seemed obvious that both crimes had been committed by the same killer. But his dad was innocent. Of that, Cooper was sure. And unlike him, Ed's faith in the justice system was unwavering. He really believed that the innocent walked free. So why had he been worried? Why had he acted so strangely at all unless he thought... Cooper stopped. If the killer died, he repeated slowly. Ed's flinch hit him like a pistol whip to the face. It was all the confirmation he needed. You thought Mom killed Hardwick? No, Ed denied immediately. I didn't think that. But you wondered. You were afraid it might be true. That's why you've been lying to the feds, why you've been acting so weird. What the fuck? Cooper hissed. Coop, Ed said tiredly. Please, not tonight. No, Dad, no. Why the hell would you think something like that? Why would you try and... and ruin her like that? Cooper wasn't making sense. He was too shocked and hurting too. He could handle learning his mother had an affair. He was dealing with the fact that her judgment in men was maybe not the best. But to think that his father, who knew her, who remembered her better than Cooper ever could, considered her capable of murder? No, that he couldn't take. How could you say that? Cooper continued. How could you even wonder? She's not the bad one. She's never been the bad one. He hurt her! Ed exploded. His voice echoed around the tiny living room. He hurt her, and for a minute I wanted to kill him. I wanted to. You and I both know sometimes a minute is all it takes. If just for a minute she... I didn't want to think she killed him, but that man's body was in my yard, Cooper. Our yard. All these years I hoped he was suffering somewhere because he made her suffer. And he was right here. What are you talking about? What do you mean he hurt her? Ed's tone softened, and he exhaled long and slow, like he'd been waiting for this to happen. We were getting divorced. They were going to leave. Together. Leave Jagger Valley. And they were going to take you and Dean with them. She'd already told me everything. We talked. Figured it out. It killed me to lose you, you have to know that, but we both agreed you boys needed your mother more. Loved her more. He said it like he was quoting a long-ago conversation. And I couldn't stop her. I could never convince her of anything she didn't want to do. I thought maybe if... He closed his eyes. Then she found out she was sick, and it wasn't a fun adventure for him anymore. He was having second thoughts. When he disappeared, I thought that was it. He didn't want to take care of someone who might not live to see next year. I tore her up. He did that, and I hated him for it. Cooper couldn't comprehend what he was hearing. His mom was going to take him and Dean away from his dad? He tried to picture them, her and Hardwick living together somewhere, but all he kept seeing was Ed. Ed alone in this unchanging house, talking to himself on his boat, wandering the woods for hours with no one to follow behind and whine until he agreed to take them back home. I didn't know. Of course not. She didn't want you to. When he disappeared, she said he must have made his decision. She begged me not to go looking for him. And since there was no official report, I didn't. But then you didn't divorce. You took care of her, even after she said she was going to take us away. Why? Ed looked at him like he didn't understand what Cooper was saying. She was my family. No matter what, she was my family. We didn't love each other in the same way anymore, but we still chose each other. We chose to look after each other always. Whether as a couple or as friends or... He slapped his hand against his leg a few times, searching for a word. Or co-parents, or partners, or whatever you want to call it these days. Marriage, blood, who raised you, who made you, all that's a start, but it's not everything. You have to make your own family, Cooper. His expression twisted. Which is why she'd be so disappointed in what a bad job I've done at it since she... He stopped. 
The unspoken word echoed in the room, and they both waited for it to fade back into the dark corners. He didn't do a bad job. Oh, Coop. Ed rubbed his hand over his face. Didn't I? I know you hate being here. That's why I tried to change things. Take down the gazebo. More phone calls. I thought you were... I don't know, sad. He said the word like it was some newfangled invention. To him, maybe it was. I thought being here reminded you too much of your mother. But it wasn't that, was it? You didn't want to be here because you hated me. I don't hate you, Dad, Cooper whispered. Just saying it hurt his throat and nose. A visceral pain like the urge to cry had just ripped through years and layers of toxic masculinity and left actual bleeding wounds in its wake. Then why didn't you say anything? Ed's voice was harsh now, the exhaustion replaced with frustration. Anger. What do you mean, say anything? Cooper's hand went to his stomach, tracing the scars before he forced it away. Would Sophie have... No. About what? The FBI woman, Agent June, stopped by. She told me about that boy. Man. Park. Cooper's heartbeat felt so loud he was surprised the room wasn't shaking from it. What? He choked out. Told you what? He didn't do it. He didn't kill West. The inside of his head felt chaotic and slippery, but defending Oliver was something solid he could grab onto. If Ed knew about wolves. But how would June have known? And if she did, was Park in danger now in her custody? No, I don't think he killed West. It's a stupid theory. Obviously, this is just some turf war power play. Normally, this was where Ed would make a crack about the BSI obviously not being involved because West didn't die of paper cuts or something. But he just sat there, face serious. It did make me wonder why, though. Why they'd even think that, I mean. So I said that to her. I said you'd have to be pretty crazy to kill someone you just met on the off chance it would detract suspicion. And she said to me, Crazy in love. He paused. Now that was an odd thing to say. What do you think she meant by that? Cooper's head jerked to the side. An automatic no. No, he couldn't do this. Not right now on top of everything else, and fuck June for making him. He felt the sort of blind rage usually reserved for a threatened animal in the corner. She wanted a power play? He'd show her a goddamn power play. Take a breath, Coop, his father said, watching him, and Cooper inhaled obediently, feeling the air move uselessly around in his mouth, his throat closed too tight to do him any good. You and your partner. You're together. He nodded jerkily. Is he really your partner at the BSI? Yes, of course, he whispered. Is he the first man you've been with? No, he said, finding his voice now. Calm down, focus, this is happening with or without you, so control the situation. So, Ed said, this is... a thing. I don't know, Dad, is my being gay going to be a thing with you? His words hung in the air between them. I don't get it, Ed said finally, and Cooper swayed in place, suddenly and mind-numbingly exhausted. No, I didn't think you would. What's that supposed to mean? Cooper shook his head. How is this my fault? Ed demanded. You never said anything. I can't read your mind, Coop. Why wouldn't you just tell me? Because I didn't want to give you any more reasons to be disappointed in me. Cooper said, his voice flat. Ed's body went still in his chair and his eyes widened. What are you talking about? When do you think I'm disappointed in you? All the time. Big stuff like school and the FBI and the BSI. That's because I know you're not happy doing that. But also little stuff like what I'm eating, what I look like, what sports I play, who my friends are. It was always wrong. No. Cooper stopped himself. Not wrong, but the wrong decision for you. He took a deep breath. This one? This mattered too much to me to hear you say it was wrong, too. I don't think that, Ed said angrily. I've never thought that. What have I ever said that made you feel like I did? It's what you didn't say, Dad, 
Cooper could hear his voice loud and steady, like it had been growing inside him and waiting to burst out for years. You never even mentioned it. Like it didn't exist. Like it didn't even cross your mind that I could be gay or bi or anything else. How was I to know it was okay? I never heard it from you. It wasn't my job to tell you. It was yours to make me feel like I didn't have to hide it from you. Ed stared at him. I... He looked away and blinked a few times. Okay. Okay. He didn't move or speak. Just stayed staring off for so long, Cooper started to shift in place and considered walking away. Was this it? Was this all they'd say to each other? After all these years of hiding and avoiding this moment, it was... disappointing. If he was going to be forced to reveal something like this, he wanted some clarity, some acknowledgement. He wanted something in return. Dad? Cooper said finally. Ed's neck rolled forward as if waking from a trance. He looked down at the bend of his elbow. Right here, he said and then paused. Cooper waited. You would fit right here in the crook of my elbow. You'd tuck your head under my chin and we'd sit here in the chair for hours, watching the game, telling stories, napping. He smiled faintly. Sometimes we just sat here and did nothing at all. I just listened to you breathe. You fit so perfectly. Like we knew to make you just the perfect size and shape. How is that possible? Cooper didn't answer. Couldn't move even if he wanted to. Sometimes, his dad said, still staring at his empty arm, I look at you and I can't believe you ever fit in this tiny little crook in my elbow. Other times, I think if I could just get my arms around you at the right angle, you'd fit there still. Ed looked up at him. It was easier then. With her. Your mom always knew what to do. How to talk to you. I'm not good at this kind of stuff. Not with anyone. Cooper swallowed, throat aching, and said, Me neither. He hesitated then. Dean thinks we're a lot alike. Ed's head rolled back against the chair for a minute, as if absorbing that. Hmm, maybe we are. But different, too. And that's okay. He met Cooper's eye. Oliver. Does he make you happy? Cooper bit the inside of his mouth. Hard. Yeah. Ed was still examining him closely. He's, uh... You know, he's good. Ed nodded once shortly, and thankfully looked off into space instead. Good. That's good. That's all that matters. That's all that's ever mattered to me. He cleared his throat. <clears throat> you should get to bed. You've got to spring a man from jail tomorrow. You need me to make any calls? No, I already told our boss. Uh, thanks, though. Cooper shifted in place. Are you coming up, too? In a minute. I'm just going to sit here a little bit longer. He had the weirdest desire to move toward his father. To touch him. But Ed looked so vulnerable he couldn't predict what would happen if he did. He didn't think he could take it if Ed got any more emotional or shit even cried. That's something they didn't warn you about getting older. Seeing your parents age, too. Seeing them as people. Sad and afraid and haunted by their own mistakes. He backed away and hesitated in the doorway. Good night, Dad. Night, Coop. Ed's voice was gruff. Cooper started to walk away. And... He paused in the dark hall, only able to see his dad's silhouette now. I'm proud you're my son. Every single day. I should have said so. Should have said a lot of things. Cooper nodded, knowing his father couldn't see him. The tears in his eyes crested and fell down his cheeks, and he retreated upstairs before the sniffling could give him away. Chapter 12 The next morning was beautiful. The sun was shining, the sky was clear, and the fall air was crisp but not too chilly. It was the perfect day for a jailbreak. 
Fortunately, not a lot of breaking was going to be needed. Despite closing his eyes for a total of maybe ten minutes all of last night, he had still somehow missed Santiago's call. She'd left a message saying to pick his partner up as soon as it was convenient, with such a cutting tone that he dropped his phone like it was a weapon and rushed into town. He was leaning against the car when Park finally came out of the station about an hour later. He paused, looked at Cooper, then strolled down the stairs and came to a stop right in front of him. So close, Cooper could feel his body heat, but didn't touch him. You didn't call, you didn't visit, you didn't write. But baby, Cooper said, I waited for you. Promise. Park snorted and the sound, unromantic as it was, filled Cooper's chest with a sort of fluttering. I warned you, this weekend was going to suck. I've had worse, Park said, echoing their conversation from a couple days ago, which felt years away. Frankly, he looked like he'd aged a few years since then as well. The dark circles under his eyes had gotten even worse, and the baby frown lines at the corners had gotten deeper. They were angry teenage frown lines now. He was still off color, and unless Cooper was imagining it, had even lost weight. Beneath the scruff, thicker than usual after his night in jail, his face looked more angular than before. Sharper. How are you feeling? Fine. Park said quickly, smiling. Cooper made a skeptical face. No. Really? Okay, but you honestly freaked me out yesterday. I think you should see a doctor. Right now, I just need some real sleep. Cooper nodded and fished an old-fashioned key out of his pocket. He dangled it in front of Park's face. What's that for? Part of my grand apology for getting you caught up in this. I booked you a room at the Blue Crab which is obviously the worst name for a brothel I've ever heard, Park stretched, the hem of his shirt rode up, and Cooper's eyes were drawn to the revealed skin and the V between his hips. Damn, it's good to be out of the slammer. I'm ready to make up for lost time. Park snapped his fingers in front of his crotch, and Cooper's eyes shot back up. He flushed. It's Jagger Valley's nicest hotel. I thought you could take the day and get some real sleep on a mattress that isn't a bunk bed for children. Or prisoners. Park quirked his eyebrow and a glimmer of his usual sexy ease shone through the exhaustion. You booked us a fancy room with a big bed? What's the other part of this grand apology? And does it or does it not involve pants? Cooper gave him his best down-boy look and resisted reaching out to touch him. Rumor has it the room service at the Crab is also the nicest in town. I realized I haven't been feeding you adequately. Park shrugged, less excited about the prospect of unlimited seafood than Cooper had expected, and looked in the back of the car. Is that my stuff? Are you kicking me out of the house now that I have a record? Stop it, you don't have a record. Do you? Santiago said she'd get the charges dropped. She did. Our friends weren't pleased. They're going to be watching you and me more than ever, I think, so we'll have to be more, uh, delicate with the investigation. I'm done with that. Park blinked at him, genuinely caught off guard, as if he'd fully expected Cooper to continue full steam ahead after what had happened. What? What are you talking about? We should talk. He looked at the station. But not here. The Blue Crab was about as nice as Cooper had hoped for a small-town hotel that was really more of an inn. The room was spacious and clean, and the bed large. The colors were light and bright, Whites and blue-greens, and the decor, while not outright marine-based, called to the mind watercolor seascapes and windswept marshes. The food wasn't bad either, and was delivered to their room in just enough time for Park to take a much-needed hot shower and change into clean clothes. Cooper ordered lemony crab cakes. Not his favorite, but the protein would do his neglected gut well. And Park got some kind of angel hair dish with capers, scallops, lemons, and what tasted like half a bottle of Chardonnay. Are you sure you don't want to switch meals? Park asked, bemused, as Cooper sucked down yet another bite of his pasta. No, no, you should eat this. You've hardly touched it. Cooper pushed the plate away from him, but Park just picked at it absently as Cooper finished filling him in on the rest of last night and his conversation with his father. How do you feel? Park asked when Cooper caught up to this morning. About which part? The fact that the FBI outed me to my father or that he thought it possible my mother was a murderer? Park winced. Rough night. If you were smart like me, you could have gone to jail instead. Cooper bit his lip. Sorry, he said, immediately guilty. Did Santiago say if you'd... Are you... 
Did she say anything? I'm not fired, if that's what you're dancing around, Park said wryly. And it's completely my own fault, so you don't need to apologize. I should have seen what Primaliz was doing. I just haven't been... He shook his head. Anyway, I should have been there with you last night. With your dad. Cooper waved him off. No, it's good we talked alone. Even if he didn't quite know how to feel about it, he had run out this morning, purposefully avoiding Ed. What did they say to each other after all that? Did things just go back to the way they were? Did he want them to? Park was watching him closely. Cooper said, I just can't stop thinking about the fact that she... She died thinking Hardwick left her in her literal hour of need. I mean, maybe he would have left anyway, but she... She just deserved better for her last two years. But she still had you and Dean. What sounds like a good friend and your father. That matters. I guess, Cooper said. How old were you when you lost your parents? Park stood abruptly and started fussing with the in-room instant coffee maker. Cooper felt awkward, pushing Park to share something he'd never chosen to talk about before, as if he hadn't had enough soul-bearing in the last 48 hours to last a lifetime, as if just because all his secrets were being dragged to the surface he had any right to crack into Park's personal life. Sorry, you don't want to talk about it, I get that. No, that's not it, Park said quickly, but he didn't immediately continue. Cooper waited, not moving, and felt a strange trepidation creep over him from the continuing silence and Park's obvious discomfort, or rather the aggressively blank stare Cooper had come to recognize as Park's I'm uncomfortable look. He watched Park move through the familiar process of making coffee for them both. Only when he was seated again, hands wrapped around a warm mug, did he speak. When I was seven, my parents went out and left the six of us alone in the apartment with my oldest sister in charge. She was eleven. Park paused, avoiding his eyes. Sorry, I don't talk about this a lot. I'm not sure if that's where the story begins. It's a start, Cooper said. Apartment? You didn't live with the rest of your family? During the Florence case, he had gotten the impression that nearly all of the Park Pack but Oliver lived on the compound-like properties his grandparents kept in Maine and Canada. No. My parents didn't get along with my grandparents. My father's parents, that is. We were living very differently then. We moved around a lot. Almost never stuck around long enough to bother going to a school. My parents taught us at home, and since they didn't hold jobs for long, they were home often. There was no money no space. We were always in a city. Usually all six of us slept in the living room, if not eight of us. I was a bit too young to shift then, but it must have been difficult for my older siblings. Park pursed his lips, thinking, my parents were out and my big sisters were fighting and getting on each other's nerves that night, so they stuck the rest of us in front of the TV. I was old enough to know something was wrong when they didn't tell us to go to bed but not old enough to be involved in their conversation. I just knew we watched show after show without my parents coming home. After the younger ones fell asleep, I was still up watching infomercials and straining to hear the others. Park squinted out the window. They were on the third and top floor and had a decent view of the bay. The water glittered with sunlight, like a gemstone too shiny to be real. Eliza would have a picture-perfect fundraiser. Finally, Park said, we were alone for almost five days. My parents never came back. Cooper exhaled softly and closed his eyes, imagining six young children alone and frightened for almost a week. When he opened his eyes again, Park was watching him with concern, which was frankly the opposite of how this should be going. I'm so sorry, Cooper said. Don't be. Park blew out a harsh, agitated breath. When we first met in Florence, I told you I lost my parents, and that's... true, but it isn't the whole truth. What do you mean? He shook his head. My grandmother showed up on the fifth night. I'd never met her before, but I... I knew who she was. She told us our parents had died in a car crash, and we went to live with the rest of the... family. That must have been overwhelming. He shrugged. It wasn't an unhappy childhood at all. I had my siblings, plus all these new aunts, uncles, cousins. I was suddenly rich and taken care of. 
privileged. I'm not sure my younger siblings even really remember our parents. We never spoke about them after that. Park put his coffee cup to his mouth but didn't take a sip, just held the heat against his lips for a moment before putting it down on the table and continuing. I was teaching at the university in Toronto when my uncle Marcus showed up unexpectedly, saying he needed to tell me something. I was confused. I was going to see him, going to see my whole family in a short few days for the winter break. You were still part of your family's pack, Cooper whispered the word, but Park still flinched a bit. Yes, happily so. His expression shifted suddenly to one of such concern that Cooper almost looked around the room for a threat. But Park just grabbed Cooper's hand, nearly knocking over his coffee. Please know that I didn't mean to mislead you. What? Cooper said, too stunned by the urgency in Park's voice to worry about what he was saying. Marcus came to tell me that my father had died. I don't understand. Neither did I at first. But he told me that my father had been killed earlier that week. Murdered. Cooper twitched and felt Park's hand tighten over his before pulling away. So he'd been alive the whole time. Yes. Park drummed his fingers loudly on the table. The crash was a lie. My parents hadn't died, just... left. My grandparents took over our custody and told us they had died to prevent us from trying to get in touch. They disapproved of their life choices, and they never wanted us to know the truth. But after my father really did die, Marcus struggled with his conscience and went against their orders to tell me. Jesus, Cooper whispered. So does that mean your mother is still alive? Yes. Cooper's fists clenched. He looked down at his own lap and tried to control his breathing so that he wouldn't jump up, drive to Maine, and confront an entire pack of werewolves right then and there, which would not be helpful. It wouldn't. But shit, that's what he felt like doing. Cooper? Cooper, please look at me. Only the pain in Park's voice could pull Cooper out of his train of thought. He looked up to see Park's face twisted as he bit at the scar on his lip. I'm sorry I lied to you. I mean, I didn't lie, but I didn't tell you everything, and... I just didn't know when... Cooper shook his head and put his hand over Park's drumming fingers, stilling them and squeezed his hand. Oliver, I'm not angry at you. I'm pissed at your grandparents for lying to you, and your parents for abandoning you, and the rest of your family for playing along, pretty much everyone but you. Park blinked, looked down at their clasped hands, and picked them up. He brushed a kiss across Cooper's before dropping it to the table. The whole thing happened so quickly that if not for the flare of heat across his knuckles, Cooper might think he'd imagined it. Thank you. Park's voice was quiet, hesitant, almost confused. Yeah, uh, of course. What happened after that? Park cleared his throat, and his expression returned to normal. I confronted my family. They refused to speak of it and forbade me from making contact with my mother, which I didn't agree with. I removed myself from their control. That's why you're not part of the pack. What about your other siblings? They were upset but ultimately chose to remain. There are a lot of pros to being a park, and the reasons for the lie were understandable, it's true. What's okay about telling children their parents are dead and denying them a relationship? It's not okay. I'm still angry with them for making a choice that essentially determined I would never get the chance to know my father. But I started investigating his murder, and the more I learned about what happened, the more I understood where they were coming from. They wanted to protect me. What do you mean? Park tilted his head. None of my family would give me any clue as to where my parents had been living or why they decided to leave us. Even my Uncle Marcus was out of information. Eventually, I hit a dead end and asked for a favor from an old acquaintance. You know her, actually. Margaret Cola. Cooper's eyebrows shot up. Head of the trust? Top wolf in charge? An old memory of their case in Florence and an odd conversation Park had with a local alpha named Rudy came back to him. I know you owe Cola. Park looked bemused. Top Wolf isn't exactly accurate. She is an elected representative, but as head of the trust, she had resources that a college professor didn't, so I asked her to help me track down my mother. 
and in return you agreed to join the trust? It wasn't that simple, but yes, that was the end result. So you have seen your mother since that night? Park shook his head. No, I... reached out to her to let her know I knew. We've corresponded off and on the last couple of years, but she's made it quite clear several times that she doesn't want to see me. Oliver. Cooper didn't know what to say. On the one hand, he couldn't even wrap his head around a mother hurting her child like that, but on the other hand, so many things about Park suddenly made so much more sense. First and foremost, how angry he'd been with Cooper for lying to his own family and pushing them out of his life. The situation wasn't the same, but it had obviously opened an old wound, and a deep one. Is that what you meant about your grandparents lying to protect you? They didn't want you to know your mom was, a, uh, uh, not interested? No. Park stood and paced the room, radiating an unusually twitchy, agitated sort of energy. Have you ever heard of the WIP? The whip? Cooper raised an eyebrow. This took a turn. Behave. No. The Wolf Independence Party. He frowned. Independence from what? The old, established families who run things, make the rules, distribute the... Punishments, Park said vaguely. Families like yours, Cooper guessed. Park inclined his head slightly. It started with good intentions. It was the WIP who first pushed for the coming out, actually. But there are radical groups who have split off, who want different things and try to get them with violence. It turns out my parents were active members of one of the factions. You can imagine why that drove a wedge between them and my grandparents. Cooper gaped at him. What does that mean, exactly? On a scale of punny signs carried by protesters to semi-violent activists to domestic terrorists. Park shrugged. He was looking jittery again, the way he had last night right before he'd had his dizzy spell, like his skin wasn't fitting right. Honestly, I don't know. We don't talk about it much. His mouth twisted. We don't talk much at all. I exaggerated when I said we've been corresponding for two years. I've received exactly three emails from my mother, ever. The last one was over a year ago. Cooper stood and walked over to him. Park eyed him cautiously, and for one bizarre moment he looked almost young to Cooper, his expression surly and unsure. If Park had been an angry teenager, this was what he would have looked like. Everyone had a little angry teenager left behind in them somewhere. Cooper opened his arms and, slowly so Park had the chance to avoid it if he wanted to, wrapped them around him in a light hug. Park felt stiff in his arms, unmoving. This is different, he said finally. He knew Cooper wasn't big on non-sexual touch. Felt like the thing to do, Cooper said, resting his chin on Park's shoulder. Besides, if you get sent up the river, I'll never get another chance at this. He groped Park's ass once, jokily, and felt him huff a laugh and gradually start to relax. Soon, even the jitters subsided. Why would someone throw away this man? You make your own family. Ed may not have been the best father, and he certainly wasn't a role model for expressing his emotions, but he had made a good point there. I'm glad you're in my life, Cooper said simply. There was a lot more he could have said. Maybe a lot more he should have said, but this was the clearest, most honest thing he could give right now. Park did nothing for a moment, almost as if he hadn't heard, then pulled back and looked Cooper in the eye. His expression was so fierce it was actually startling. There isn't anywhere I'd rather be, Park said and kissed him, hard. A wave of heat coursed through Cooper's body as every nerve ending woke up and responded to the raw need he felt in that kiss. He ran his hands through Park's hair, pulling him closer, and Park groaned, his lips turning gentle. He slowly guided Cooper across the room toward the bed. You should get some sleep, Cooper murmured against Park's lips. Not tired he said, falling backwards onto the mattress and pulling Cooper with him until he was resting between Park's legs. They kissed there for a while and touched unhurriedly. Park felt warm, lush, and unusually pliable beneath Cooper, and they ground against each other gently. The tug and ache of the wakening erection in his jeans like a poultice for everything that had gone wrong this weekend. Hell, 
longer. If Cooper could just have this and only this, he'd be okay. Park's lips moved across Cooper's face, brushing his nose, cheek, corner of his eye, and the small hollow behind his ear, as if they had just met and he was carefully mapping the plains and valleys of undiscovered territory. Not that they had been this tentative the first time. Or the second. It was so much harder to truly marvel at a brand new lover. When you don't know where they've come from, it's less amazing that they're here. With you. Like this. But now... Cooper found Park's mouth again, and the familiar taste anchored him to this moment. He tried to shape what he was feeling into a kiss and was rewarded with a groan. Against his lips, Park breathed, I'd like you inside me. Cooper pulled back a bit, surprised. Oh. Is that okay? His dick pulsed a hearty yes, but he hesitated. They'd done it this way a few times, which he generally liked, but he'd have liked it a lot more if Park didn't get so damn quiet during it. Whenever Cooper fucked him, Park, usually so talkative in bed, would go silent and get this dark-eyed, soft, searching look on his face, as if he had just asked a question and was waiting for a response. It was so pronounced there had been more than one occasion that Cooper had paused in the middle of things and asked, What? And Park would say, What? And Cooper would say, What did you say? And Park would respond, I didn't say anything. And that time-old awkwardness was a serious mood killer. So, gradually, Cooper had stopped suggesting it, and Park never brought it up, which was fine. He enjoyed using sex to clear his head, and generally there was less thought involved when he let Park take the more active role. But that didn't mean he wasn't rock-hard at the thought of pushing into Park and making the usually so tight and controlled man supple and begging beneath him. He just never imagined Park would be the one to ask for it. Are you sure? Park tilted his head, looking up at him from the bed. Do you not like that? I do. I really do. It's just... I mean, it didn't seem like you, uh, did, and I like it the other way fine. Park raised an eyebrow. More than fine, Cooper amended, feeling his face heat. Obviously. So if you aren't sure, I don't want you to feel like, you know, you have to do anything, or... He snapped his mouth shut before he could monologue his way out of bed. Park had started to smile slowly. He pulled Cooper back down on top of him, spreading his legs and tilting his hips up. He ran his lips over the rim of Cooper's ear. I'm very sure. I want you to fuck me. Cooper felt dizzy he got so hard so fast. Wow, well, okay. They told me prison changes a man, but I didn't believe it. Park huffed a laugh against Cooper's neck. That's the stupidest thing you've ever said. Mmm, and yet you still like me. Yes, Park said simply. I do. They undressed each other slowly, kissing and touching as much as possible until they were both naked and ready, and then they touched some more. When things were getting almost too ready and he was in danger of blowing it, so to speak, Cooper reluctantly left to fetch a condom and lube from Park's carry-all. Rooting through the bag, he felt an odd flurry of nerves, which was a little absurd. He wasn't new at this any way you spun it. And besides, whatever else they were or were not, Park was a sex partner he worked well with and whom he trusted to communicate his needs and wants honestly and to respect Cooper's in return. There was an extremely low chance of this going poorly. And yet the fluttering persisted. Cooper grabbed the supplies, turned back to the bed, and his heart twisted. Park had curled up on his side and was holding his knees in the center of the mattress. His eyes were closed. Cooper crept to the edge of the bed and hovered a hand over the curve of Park's spine, ass, and legs, tracing the thick muscles without touching him. I'm not sleeping, Park said, softly cracking his eyes open, glowing gold and flickering with want. His hair had fallen over part of his face, and Cooper tucked it back in place and then kept moving over his shoulder and down the same path his hand had taken before, this time feeling warm skin and shifting muscles beneath his palm. Park arched into his touch, and his eyes closed again. When Cooper's fingers passed over his ass, Park flexed his hips and made a small, needy sound. Cooper continued down his leg, taking his time. He squeezed his ankle, then traced back up the inner side of the other leg. This time, when he reached the crease of Park's ass, he dipped inside to massage his hole and then played with his balls until Park's breathing had sped up and his skin was flushed and darker than usual against the sheets. 
How do you want me to take you? Cooper said softly and heard a rumble from Park's chest that must have been a deep, smothered groan. Park rolled quickly to his back, and his bent knees shook a bit like he was unsure whether to drop them open and expose himself or keep them up and protective. As much as he said he wanted this, Park was still a little nervous, and seeing that banished the last of Cooper's own anxieties, replacing them with an overwhelming desire to take care of Park, to soothe him. It was a vulnerable thing, opening yourself up to a lover. Rather than push his legs apart and get to business, Cooper crawled up the bed so that they were lying side by side. Park tracked the movements with a small frown. What are you? Cooper kissed him gently, feeling the willing give of his mouth. Then he started to move up and down Park's body. He ran his lips over each freckle, his nipples, his belly button, the light smattering of hair leading down to his dick. When he'd kissed everywhere, he started over again, dragging his lips and tongue into every sensitive nook and cranny while he looped his fingers, trailed them down Park's cock and between his legs, and finally, gently began to prepare him. Park closed his eyes and moaned very softly. He seemed more relaxed now that Cooper was touching him and not down there staring at him, so Cooper kept his eyes and lips focused on Park's torso, neck, and face. His body seemed just a bit different, bones closer to the surface, muscles slightly less defined, flesh softer. He was beautiful to Cooper either way, and he said so, whispering the words into Park's skin. How sweet he was, and handsome and smart and kind and good. So good. All while stretching him open more and more. Park was humping Cooper's hand now, little needy twitches that shook the bed. His dick was rigid against his stomach, but every other line of his body was loose. A puddle of trembling man splayed out on the sheets. I like seeing you like this, Cooper admitted without intending to. He flexed his fingers inside him, nudging his prostate, and Park gasped. Soft and receptive. Park opened his eyes, and his expression was so trusting it made Cooper determined to make this the best he'd ever had. So good it would erase all the doubts and fights and misunderstandings and mistakes. So good it would connect them forever, even if just as a memory too sweet to forget. No one could fuck that well. But shit, he wanted to try. Now, Park said. Please. Cooper dropped a lingering kiss to Park's knee, then repositioned himself between his legs, hovering over him and pushed inside. Park arched up and pressed his open, panting mouth to Cooper's collarbone. They stayed like that for a moment, and then Cooper slowly started to move, testing the waters until he found what he was looking for, and Park bit down convulsively on his collarbone with a muffled curse. The sharp sting was like a slap to a horse's flank. Cooper jerked forward, and the resulting gasp turned gratified growl made him do it again and again, speeding up until finally, finally, he was slamming into Park's body. Fuck, Oliver, Cooper gasped, losing himself in the hot squeeze around his cock, the little whimpering moans Park made every time their bodies slapped together and the way Park was looking up at him wide-eyed and pleasure-drunk. His hands fluttered up between them like they didn't know what to do with themselves, and Cooper grabbed Park's wrists in one hand and held them down against the bed. He saw the flex of Park's muscles as they reacted to the unfamiliar sensation of being restrained. He felt the power beneath his fingers rise to the surface, as if ready to toss Cooper off and then recede as Park surrendered to the feeling of being totally controlled. Getting that submission from Park sent waves of electricity down Cooper's spine, spots dancing across his vision and pierced something open inside him. I don't need you, Cooper said, and Park whined underneath him. I don't, I don't, I don't. He couldn't stop himself from talking. The last bit of dam inside him had crumbled and all the bitten back truths were pouring out. I don't need anyone. He let go of Park's wrists, twined his fingers in his hair, and pulled them forward while Park's arms greedily wrapped around him. Cooper stopped his own mouth from spilling more secrets by pressing it against Park's and kissing him possessively. He bit Park's lip and felt Park's hands dig painfully into his ass so sharply Cooper was sure they'd leave Mark's. I don't need you, Cooper repeated, whispering into Park's sweaty hair now. But I want you. All the time. He dropped his lips to Park's temple and couldn't pull away do as much to tenderness as to the temporary paralysis while all his body's resources focused on the tightening of his balls and the near spasmodic jerking of his hips. And I love you, Cooper murmured. 
It was like someone had shoved him off a cliff and he was hovering in the air, legs spinning like a cartoon before plummeting into a free fall. It was a mistake to say it. At all. But especially like this, during sex when it was guaranteed not to be believed. He hoped it hadn't been heard. Right, because hard of hearing was totally Park's thing. Cooper. The intensity of Park's gaze was too much. Overwhelming. Exhilarating. Terrifying. More than all that together, or maybe something else entirely. So Cooper covered his mouth with a hard kiss, and whatever words Park had begun to say transformed into a groan. Reaching between them, Cooper took hold of Park's straining erection. He had hardly finished the first stroke when he felt the flesh swell and pulse as he came. The tightening of Park's body around his dick and the guttural moan that reverberated between them ripped Cooper's climax out of him, and he pounded out his release, chasing that bright, sweet bliss deep inside of Park and inside of himself, until he couldn't tell which was which. Cooper collapsed on top of him, skin sticking together and listened to their heartbeats compete. When he'd regained semi-control of his muscles, he carefully pulled out of Park and disposed of the condom. Park hadn't moved or made a sound yet. His eyes were half-closed, a bare glint of gold shining from beneath his lashes, but Cooper still got the impression he was being watched. Okay, Cooper said softly, unsure and just a little worried by the continuing silence. Park reached up and brushed his fingers across part of Cooper's collarbone oh so gently, but he still felt a slight sting where Park had bitten him before. Park's hand then moved slowly to wrap around the back of Cooper's neck and tug him down to the bed until he was lying down, half on and half off of Park, with the side of his throat pressed firmly against Park's mouth. Weird. Uncomfortable. Vulnerable. So good. He felt Park murmuring something against the delicate skin beneath his jaw and tried to decode the pattern of his lips for a minute before giving up and just enjoying the high. The exact words didn't matter. Cooper could feel Park's body trembling and his arms holding him close. He got the gist. Chapter 13 Hours later, Park was sprawled out and finally sleeping across his chest while Cooper checked his phone. He'd much rather forego the outside world and stay hidden away in bed with Park until doomsday, but seeing as how a significant percentage of his nearest and dearest had found themselves on the wrong side of the law in the last twenty-four hours, it seemed like a bad time to cut off friends in high places. Not that anyone seemed particularly friendly at the moment. Santiago had an ominous... We have a lot to discuss in your return message. Dean had sent multiple texts, including, Where are you? And Dad is acting weird and isn't sure if you're coming back to the house. And finally, Are you and OP on run? Need money and or condoms? Even Ava had sent a disturbing picture of a book Oliver had lent him last week with the jacket shredded and boogie in the background with a glare that said, Come home or you're next. The last and strangest message was a voicemail from an unknown number. Cooper turned down the volume and played it once, and then again, listening more carefully. Cooper, it's me, Stephen. I need to talk to you. In person. Come by my house as soon as possible. It's important. Pause. Do not bring the... Don't bring Park. You have to come alone. Soon. Another pause, longer this time, and when he spoke again, Stephen sounded almost angry. If I so much as smell him down the block, forget it. We're done. And so is Mr. Park. Cooper played it a third time, but Stephen gave no hint as to what it was he wanted to talk about. He just gave his address and abruptly hung up. You aren't actually considering going to that, are you? Park said against Cooper's chest, and he jumped a bit. I thought you were sleeping. Did that? Awake now, Park slurred. Trust Doherty don't. He licked his lips. Don't trust Doherty. Hmm, yes, wide awake and eloquent as ever. Cooper ran his hand over Park's hair and smiled when he felt him arch against him and hum. Stephen wants to talk, and it could be important, so yes, I am going. I thought you were done investigating. I am, Cooper paused. This isn't investigating, this is just... a talk with an old friend. Park did him the courtesy of not calling that out as the obvious bullshit it was. All right... He rolled off of Cooper and stretched, several joints popping loudly. Just let me put some pants on and we can start not investigating right away. Park? 
He was reluctant to disturb the cozy sort of peace between them, but didn't see a way around it. I want to go alone. Park dropped back down to the bed and stared at him. Then abruptly he laughed. You're not serious. Cooper felt a fizzle of irritation. He said to come alone. He also said if he saw you again, there'd be another fight. Without sounding like a jerk, how can I describe just how little that concerns me? Oliver, Cooper forced himself to take a breath. If he has something to tell me, something important, he's not going to do it with you there. That's not my fault, but that's the way it is. As your partner, I'm asking you to trust me. Trust that I can and that I will take care of myself, just like you expect me to trust you. Park looked at him for a long time, and Cooper almost worried he was going to say no. What the hell would I say then? But eventually Park nodded. Okay. I will. I do. Cooper hesitated, wanting to lean down and kiss the frown lines from his forehead, but the charged words that had snuck out before in the heat of the moment lingered between them, unacknowledged and formidable now that the post-sex haze had officially passed. I'll call you after. Try and get some real sleep. Park nodded again, clearly holding back whatever it was he wanted to say. Cooper was dressed and almost out the door when he stopped him. Cooper. Park was sitting up in bed. The sheets gathered in his lap and his hair was sticking up absurdly. He looked rumpled, well fucked, and just for a moment, something else. Some other sharp and urgent expression that looked like surprise was twisting his face. Why? Because he couldn't believe he was acquiescing to this potentially risky plan? Because he hadn't expected to trust Cooper? Or that Cooper would take advantage of their ongoing argument to get his way? It was too late to ask. In a heartbeat, the look was gone, cleared to the old, unreadable, politely blank mask. If Doherty says anything about me. He stopped himself and shook his head as if he hadn't meant to say that. Will you tell me what Doherty says? Of course, Cooper said. He waited, but Park offered no explanation. So with a nod he left, the image of Park lingering in his mind. He was already driving away when Cooper realized the urgent expression hadn't been surprise at all. It had been panic. He pulled into the driveway and checked the address. Stephen's house was small and a bit chaotic-looking, but pretty. The sort of house Cooper could see himself wanting to buy tomato plants to keep on the porch for and spending all his free time in acrimonious dispute with groundhogs that started as a joke until it wasn't. A shed to the side was painted to look like a woodland scene, and he vaguely remembered Stephen had married an artist. He pulled out his phone and considered texting Park if for no other reason than to make sure the ringer didn't go off in the trunk, and then he'd have to kill the guy. Suddenly the passenger door opened. Cooper jumped in his seat, heart racing wildly as Stephen slipped inside, looking more grim and serious than ever before. Jesus, you scared me. Cooper released the taser he'd grabbed for and left it holstered at his hip. Stephen watched the movement shrewdly. So it's true. B.S.I. Stephen must have been looking into him. Maybe he'd ask Dean. What was the name of that department your brother transferred to again? Or maybe he'd reached out across the werewolf network, floating their names. Cooper focused on not flinching when he thought about what Stephen might have heard through that. He opened his hands wide. Sorry, I told you I knew everything, though. And I said you don't. Not everything. Stephen shook his head and looked away. You're right, this... Cooper gestured between them, came as a total shock. Does Dean know? No, of course not. What do you mean, of course? Does Dean know what you do? No, if... Stephen's face didn't move. It didn't need to. That's different, Cooper said. You're right, it is. I'm different from you. I always have been. You just wandered into this world, what, a year ago? Two? Cooper didn't answer. You don't know everything, and you definitely don't know how much danger you're in. Are you threatening me? It's a friendly warning because Dean is the closest thing to a brother I have, and I don't want to see his brother end up a scratching post. Cooper's hands instinctively covered the scars at his belly. Stephen's eyes followed the movement, and he growled. Parks hurt you. No, God, no, he would never do that. He's an agent, too. He's my partner. Stephen's face turned frustrated. That doesn't mean he won't hurt you. Maybe not intentionally, but he's sick. He's struggling. What are you talking about? I've seen it before. Rose went through the same thing, and it, well, it killed her. Cooper gaped for a moment, then leaned forward and whispered, 
you think Park is on drugs? His first instinct was to laugh, but then he remembered the weird episode at the party, how tired Park was looking, his extra sleeping and loss of appetite. Even some of his more erratic behavior recently could potentially fit the bill. Primalis had accused Park of being in withdrawal, and Cooper hadn't even registered it, had dismissed it immediately. Not Park. But the truth was, anyone could abuse drugs. There wasn't really any type of person more likely to be an addict over another. Still, Cooper's brain rejected the idea. Aside from his sojourn in jail, they'd been together nearly every waking moment these last few days, even more than usual. Every non-waking moment, too. And before this weekend, he'd never seen any of these signs before. That's part of what had made a simple dizzy spell so alarming. Park had never shown the slightest hint of weakness, and Cooper had seen him in some pretty tight spots over the last four months. No, he said finally. I'm sorry, but you're wrong. I would have noticed. Not drugs, Stephen said impatiently. Rose didn't use either. Well, she self-medicated with pot, but never touched the hard stuff. When was the last time he changed? Clothes, Cooper said dumbly. No, changed. Shifted. I'm not sure. Cooper thought about it. Not since they'd gotten to Jagger Valley, certainly. This was the first time Park had really been alone. He'd been sleeping in late, too, not disappearing for his morning runs. He'd tried to the first morning, Cooper remembered, but that was when he'd run into Ed. Not in Ann Arbor, either. The case had kept them busy during the day, and Cooper had latched onto him during the night, sneaking into his room and trying to work up the nerve to discuss their relationship status. A few days, at least. Maybe a week? Cooper jumped when Stephen hissed. What? What's the matter? You don't understand how dangerous that is, do you? He's making himself sick. I could see it as soon as I met him. My six-year-old son could see it, for Christ's sake. You didn't notice anything at all? Cooper shook his head, but of course that wasn't true. I don't understand. What are you saying? We need to do it every day. Miss a day, fine, but a week? I don't even know how he's held it together that long. Not only is he hurting himself, but he is going to lose control eventually and hurt everyone unlucky enough to be close by. Like I said, I've seen it before. Rose avoided changing, too. She'd push herself as long as she could. We took the edge off, but it wasn't a cure, and eventually she'd... explode. Why would anyone avoid shifting, though? I thought it didn't hurt. Had Park lied to him about that? It doesn't. Not physically. Not really. Stephen sighed and looked out the window. He didn't say anything for a long time. Finally, How well do you remember my mom? Um, not that well, Cooper hedged, unsure where this was going, and unable to think of a single positive thing to say about the woman. She didn't leave the house a lot. Stephen smiled briefly, but it was closer to a grimace. No, she didn't. She was afraid most of her life, and more importantly, ashamed of what her children were. Werewolves, he said to Cooper's look of confusion. Unnatural. Ungodly. That's not okay, Cooper said, the understatement of the year. Why have kids if she hated what she was that much? Oh, she wasn't a wolf, Stephen said, as if that was obvious. Cooper stared. What? I didn't think that was... What? A bit of the old Stephen that Cooper used to know shined through as he rolled his eyes. You only need one parent to inherit it. We got our father's genes. He didn't tell her about him and left before our first shift. So being werewolves was... a surprise. For all of us. Our mother didn't take it well. I'm so sorry. Cooper didn't know what to say. He couldn't even begin to understand how frightening that would be. Stephen shrugged. It is what it is. But Rose hated it. She just wanted to be normal. To be what Mom wanted. So she suppressed it. Didn't shift, and it... Well, it ruined her life. He looked down at his hands in his lap. Anyway, I can recognize the signs. Park isn't like that, though, Cooper frowned. He doesn't hate what he is. He grew up with wolves. So he's comfortable talking to you about being a werewolf. He's changed in front of you before? He explained to you why he's choosing to do serious damage to himself by not shifting for a week? Cooper could imagine what his own face looked like. He turned away, mind reeling with questions, and Stephen was decent enough not to push it. Was Park always like this, and he just hadn't noticed? Was it all the time? Or was he just reluctant to talk about it around Cooper? Was shifting in front of each other something other partners did? 
other couples? He had just assumed it was a private thing he wasn't supposed to see and left it at that. But what if he had said or done something that made Park feel like he couldn't be himself around him? The thought made him nauseous. After a moment, Stephen said, I can't say for sure why Park is doing what he's doing, but I can tell you it could hurt you, badly, and it will definitely hurt him. It kills my sister. I thought Rose died of an accidental overdose. Technically she did, but that's not the whole story. I told you, she didn't do hard drugs. She never went near meth before. The whole blackmail thing made her hate being a werewolf even more, and she hadn't shifted in almost two weeks. Think about how sick your partner is now. Double it. She was a mess. She would have known her heart was way too weak to start fucking around with methamphetamines. Stephen shook his head definitively. No. She was either so far gone in her sickness that she didn't know what she was doing, or... It wasn't an accident. She took her own life. He exhaled loudly. And if that's the case, I blame it on not shifting, too. It completely fucks up your emotions. I'm so sorry, Cooper repeated. It felt even more inadequate than before. Inside, his mind was whirling. Rose never touched the hard stuff. A flicker of suspicion started to form. Don't be sorry. That's not why I'm telling you this. I'm telling you this so you stay the hell away from Park. That brought back his attention. Cooper pushed aside his musings on the case for now and shook his head. I can't do that. Stephen looked angry. Fine. He reached for the car door handle. I said what I needed to be able to look your brother in the eye when something happens to you. Stephen, wait. Cooper hesitated, but there was nothing he could say to make Stephen happy. Not without destroying his own happiness. He leaned into the back seat, reaching for the stuffed white horse there. Your son left this at the party yesterday. Before he could straighten back in the seat, he felt Stephen's fingers rest lightly on his throat. Cooper froze. His pulse picked up and his stomach cramped viciously. All it took was one claw to extend, as easy as stretching for a wolf. He couldn't lose 30% of his carotid and walk away with a scar and some vitamins. What are you doing, he said tightly. The words slurred as he tried to not move his jaw. He heard slight sniffing. Then Stephen's fingers slid down his neck and pulled the collar of his shirt to the side a bit, revealing the red skin where Park had bitten him. You're sleeping with him. Cooper jerked away. He threw the horse at Stephen and it bounced off his chest and fell to the car floor. You don't know what you're talking about. I should have guessed last night. The way he was claiming you. Stephen shook his head. Claiming? That's not... Park isn't interested in that, Cooper stuttered. I know what I saw. But if that's why you won't walk away, I suggest you find a new novelty fuck. I'm sure a BSI agent gets plenty of offers. That's not what this is, Cooper yelled, outraged and disgusted. His words echoed in the car, and even Stephen seemed taken aback. He lowered his voice. I'm not with him because of that. Does he know that? Of course he does. Didn't he? Why wouldn't he? Did it really need saying? Park knew that he... What, loved him in bed? Nowhere else, though. Cooper had been so paranoid about not letting his feelings show he hadn't considered that he could come across as, well, cold, uninterested. It hadn't occurred to him that acting like he was only in it for the job and the sex might make it seem like he was only in it for the job and the sex. It sounded like first-grade logic when put like that, but felt like the most complicated problem he'd ever faced. Was he unintentionally hurting Park? Was this the reason, or part of the reason, he was hurting himself by not shifting? How had Cooper not noticed that before? How could he not know what was happening to the person he was closest to in the whole... He stopped. There was that feeling again. That suspicion that had flitted through his mind as only a fledgling before was growing, taking shape, and asking questions. This time he held on to it, thinking. The real mystery was not who had motive to murder Hardwick, but the same reason it wasn't who murdered West. They were both secondary to the original crime. The very first murder. Look, thanks, Cooper said. He extended his hand and Stephen eyed it for a moment quizzically before shaking it. This helped. More than you know, but I need to go. I forgot I'm supposed to be somewhere right now. Stephen's eyebrows shot up. You're kidding. We're right in the middle of something. Where are you going? Cooper started the car and smiled at Stephen. To face the music. The marina was packed and Cooper pulled into the overflow parking lot across the street. Before getting out, he left a message on Park's phone, surprised and, after his conversation with Stephen, worried that he didn't pick up on the first ring. 
It's done. We have a lot to talk about, he said. Then, realizing he sounded like Santiago, added, I'm fine. Everything's fine. Just meet me at Elizabeth's fundraiser as soon as you can. I... He realized he had no idea how to end a voicemail with Park. You're everything to me. You've changed my life. I love you. Okay, bye. Hope to see you soon. He winced. Hope to see you soon. And quickly punched end. The marina looked like some kind of carnival. At one end, they'd installed a stage where a sort of bluegrass band wailed away on banjos and tambourines. Along the boardwalk, tents and tables had been set up hosting games, food, and lots of places to learn more about her platform, register to vote, or more importantly, donate. Cooper slipped through the crowd, searching the tables for Eliza. Have you gotten a button yet? Please help yourself to a pen. Vote bell! The volunteers were excellent at unloading all the personalized crap they had, but no one had actually seen the woman of the hour recently. Uh, I think she's talking to the council. I think she's taking a moment to go over her speech. I think she's supervising the dunk tank. Cooper was heading toward the podium, determining that this was the only place he knew for sure she'd have to be when he saw Gabriel coming down the dock in his direction. Shit. He didn't want to deal with him now. Not right now, and certainly not here, thirty feet away from the boathouse where Gabriel and his friends hid. But the crowd wasn't quite big enough that they could slip past each other unnoticed, and frankly, he was tired of running from this. Cooper! Gabriel waved and Cooper steeled himself as he watched his childhood crush, bully, and heartache approach. But he felt... nothing. Not the old fluttering of excitement and anticipation, not the belly-cramping anxiety and embarrassment, not even the anger that had burned through him yesterday like a brush fire. It was as if every last knot of emotion tangling him to Gabriel had relaxed and unraveled. Suddenly this was just a man he used to know. Cooper could guess the reason why, or rather the whom. Despite everything, there at the marina he couldn't help the smile that tugged at the corners of his lips, remembering the warmth of Park's body beneath his own the feel of him gradually relaxing in his arms. That was what real trust felt like. Gabriel smiled back at him. After last night, I wasn't sure I'd see you here, he said once he neared, the noise of the crowd forcing them to stand closer than normal. He squeezed Cooper's arm above the elbow, interrupting his reminiscing. But I'm glad you made it. Your support really means a lot to me. I'm not here for you, Cooper said, pulling away calmly but firmly, and enjoyed the look of surprise and annoyance that soured Gabriel's face. Okay, so newfound Zen notwithstanding, he was still a tiny bit petty. Growth was a process, and he hadn't come here to grow. He impatiently scanned the crowd over Gabriel's shoulder for Eliza. If you're looking for your guard dog, he's not here yet. Cooper stilled. What did you just say? You know, your overprotective colleague? Gabriel smiled, but his staple Mr. Charming expression was wearing thin. How do you know he's not here? I drove past him walking over this way. He's a noticeable guy. That was an understatement, and it obviously pained Gabriel to admit it. I would have offered him a ride, but... He shrugged. He was arguing with Agent June, and I didn't want to interrupt. Arguing with... Cooper whipped out his phone, but there was still no word from Park, and no wonder. God damn it. He should have anticipated one of the agents would be tailing them. What if they'd brought him in for more questions? What if they locked him back up and then Park lost control like Stephen said he would? Why were they so hellbent on Park as a suspect? And how... Cooper stopped and looked back at Gabriel, who was waxing on about how many people had shown up to the marina and how well his sister's campaign was going. How do you know Agent June? Gabriel cut off mid-monologue, expression immediately defensive. I... The FBI was questioning everyone yesterday... They wanted to know about you and... you and your colleague, while you two were over at my parents' place asking questions. Cooper blinked slowly. It was you. You're the one who told them about our relationship. Of course Gabriel had picked up on something between them, especially with his insider information on Cooper's sexuality. But to have him go running to the FBI? Cooper ran his hand through his hair and laughed without humor. You know, when we were kids, I probably would have analyzed the shit out of this show of jealousy, but not anymore, because frankly, Gabriel, I don't care. I really just don't care. I'm not jealous. No, of course not. You just tattled on me as a purely selfless concerned citizen. Tell me, did you unjealously call him my guard dog then, too? 
Gabriel's face flushed. So what if I did? That's what he was acting like. He practically bit my hand off every time I touched you yesterday. He's obviously got issues. You implied he threatened you? Cooper hissed. Jesus, no wonder they came after him so hard. Hey, Gabriel reached for him again, seemed to think better of it and crossed his arms. I was just looking out for you. You didn't do this for me. Only for yourself, just like always. Cooper started to walk away, paused, and turned back. And just so you know, Oliver's not my colleague, he's my partner. And he's not my guard dog, he's a goddamn good man, and no matter what else we are or aren't, I know he's always got my back and I've got his. So if you ever fuck with him again, you should be a hell of a lot less worried about his bite and more with my bark. Get it? Gabriel gaped at him, and Cooper allowed himself a moment of satisfaction at his expression. Surprise, discomfort, and just the beginning of shame before pushing by and continuing toward the podium. He pulled out his phone and tried to call Park again to no avail. The crowd was so loud he ducked into the boathouse to leave another message before continuing his search for Eliza. It was actually a relief to be out of the noise for a moment or two. Plus, in all honesty, he needed a minute to calm down. His heart was beating hard, and a curious feeling of relief and rightness was pumping through his veins. Now was not the time to linger, but he knew as soon as he and Park were on the other side of this shitstorm, Cooper would look back at this moment and appreciate finally getting to say the things he couldn't twenty years ago. Gabriel and that day weren't the only reasons he decided to get out of Jagger Valley, of course, but it was a big part of feeling like he was unwanted there. Standing in the same boathouse now, Cooper felt like he'd reclaimed something. This marina didn't have power over him anymore. It, like the valley, was just a place. Cooper took a deep breath of salty air and looked around. It appeared like the Bell's business was doing better than ever. The warehouse was packed with boats waiting to be worked on or simply being stored for the season up on little stilts around the sides of the building. Most of the boats were tiny, a lot of runabouts, utility boats, and even a few rowboats. In the center of the room, the floor was replaced by eerily dark bay water, sort of like a reverse peninsula. Two large walkarounds were docked there, beautiful, luxurious things, and he walked to the edge to take a closer look. Water lapped gently at the dock's edges, making the occasional odd hollow slapping sound when a passing boat outside the building drove the water in. Pretty, isn't she? Cooper took a step back, startled by the voice. Eliza Bell appeared on the deck of one of the large walkarounds and leaned over the rail to look down at him. I wanted to take her out today, but the engine's been giving me trouble. They not busy enough for you? He asked, and Eliza laughed. I have twenty minutes before I have to go up there and beg people to vote for me in the subtlest way possible. Being on the water calms me down. She smirked and shrugged. Bay kid. Cooper ran his hand over the design on the side, elaborate leaves and thorns around the boat's name. Eglantine, he read out loud. He recognized the word, a very particular flower, and the last doubt he'd had dissolved. He smiled brightly. Did Gabriel do this? Yes, he convinced me to let him do it years ago. It's a bit showy, but... She shrugged. It has sentimental value. She beckoned, and after a moment's hesitation, he climbed up to join her on deck. It really was a pretty boat and obviously well cared for. The deck was bright, gleaming white, and spotless. There was an open toolbox by the cabin door. Cooper planted himself between it and Eliza. I was actually looking for you before, he said. Oh? She put her hands in the pockets of her overlarge raincoat that protected her light gray skirt suit from the constant drops of bay water that warmed their way everywhere. Pinned to the outside was a vote bell button. What can I do for you? Yesterday, you said something about Rose. You said that at the time you and she were friends, she was struggling with a serious drug problem. Eliza looked puzzled. Yes, she did have a problem. I only wish I hadn't tried to help her by myself. If I had told someone, got her some real support, maybe we wouldn't have lost her. That's why I'm running the initiative to earlier education on substance abuse. Yes, I remember. He nodded. And just for the record, I'm all for implementing a more open and honest dialogue about drugs in schools. Except Rose didn't abuse drugs, did she? She had a health condition that would have made methamphetamines extremely dangerous. Eliza pursed her lips. Uncontrolled drug use is always dangerous. Sadly, that's not enough to stop an addict. No, that's very true. 
But in her case, a single use would have been a guaranteed fatality. That's why she'd never touch the stuff, not even to try it, not once. But you didn't know that, did you? You're not making any sense, Eliza said. Her gentle, comforting voice had shifted just slightly into something patronizing, a caricature of itself. She walked toward Cooper, making to get off the boat. I have a speech to give in fifteen minutes, so if you'll excuse me, a lot of people, thought Rose, had a serious habit because her condition, when not handled properly, can be mistaken for withdrawal. I only learned that recently myself. What I didn't understand was why her closest friend, her only friend really, would claim Rose was an addict when she wasn't. Cooper watched Eliza's expression. The pleasant, so-happy-to-see-you politician face was hardening around the edges, a bright anger creeping into her eyes. Maybe you weren't really as close as you said. Maybe you just spun the story to serve your campaign better. That's messed up, but it makes sense. But then I thought of something. The person who killed and framed Sal West couldn't have just picked him at random. He or she needed to frame someone with at least a little motive to have killed Hardwick. The killer needed to know about the blackmail. Cooper paused. Who would know about that? Hardwick did. So did Margaret Doherty, but obviously they could have killed West. Stephen knew too, but he doesn't really fit because he didn't kill Rose. No one killed Rose, Eliza snapped. She overdosed. He continued as if she hadn't spoken. There had to be someone else who knew about the blackmail, but Rose wouldn't have spread it around. She was scared, upset. She didn't even want to tell the police, but maybe she'd tell her best friend? Yeah, I think she'd definitely tell her best friend. Her only friend. Eliza's eyes were blank. Her usually kind face was abruptly inanimate and her body was motionless, like she'd been switched off. If it helps, Cooper said, I don't think you meant to kill her. I doubt you knew about her health condition or how dangerous even a tiny bit of meth would be. In fact, you cared about her quite a lot, didn't you? Yes, Eliza whispered. She was my friend. I know. He kept his voice calm, casual, conversational. This guy has been making me watch film adaptations of Shakespeare plays recently. Eglantine is not a word I'd have recognized before. Sweetbriar Rose, isn't it? You still care about her, even now. She nodded shakily. Everyone thought she was a freak, a druggie, a loser. But she was also funny and kind and beautiful and so, so sad. Eliza blinked hard like she was trying to clear an image from her eyes. We were close. I... I didn't have many friends either. My parents... I couldn't be distracted. You were just as lonely as her. She got it. She understood what it was like to have this... this perception of you constantly dictating your life. You cared about each other. Then what happened, Eliza? I found her snooping around Mommy's office looking for evidence that she was stealing money from the pageant's funds. Mommy was right, she was just using me the whole time, laughing at me. After everything I told her, Eliza gasped and there were tears in her eyes now. So you killed her? No, she wailed. I just wanted to get her kicked out of the pageant to embarrass her. She was nervous. The competition was in a couple of hours. I said we should smoke. I told her a little weed would calm her down. But you laced it with meth. It wasn't supposed to be a big deal. I knew Jacob had some stashed away. I'd even tried it myself once, but she told me she had no tolerance. So I thought, I just wanted to make sure she didn't get to the next round. I wanted everyone to know they'd been right about her all along, but she completely freaked out. She was shaking and screaming, and... Eliza licked her lips. Her eyes, they were insane. And her face. She reached out to touch her own face. It's like she wasn't even human anymore. I ran, I just ran away. And Rose died. It wasn't supposed to kill her, she whispered. It was just a stupid joke. I thought my life was over. I hid in my room all day and waited for the police to come take me away. I was so scared. But they didn't come. Because everyone in town thought she had a drug problem anyway. No one looked too closely when she OD'd. No one but Alex Hardwick. He knew what she was doing. He's the one who put her up to it, so he suspected something else was going on. He broke into our house, she hissed. I found him in my room, but it was too late. He'd already found the meth. I begged him not to say anything. I told him it was a mistake. I was still a kid. Kids make mistakes, but he refused. He said he was going to tell everyone what I did. So you followed him out of the house, and as he crossed our yard, you saw your opportunity, and you killed him. 
I just wanted him to stop, to wait, but he wasn't listening to me. Eliza closed her eyes and shook her head. I never meant to hurt Rose. She was my best friend. I loved her. It was a stupid accident, and he was going to ruin my life for no reason. I don't think the Dohertys would think there was no reason, Cooper said quietly. Tears spilled over the edges of her eyes from beneath closed lids, streaking her cheeks, and dragging down the blush there in faint pink stripes. It wasn't going to bring her back. None of this will bring her back, she sniffed. You should have just let it be. Come on, Eliza, he said gently. It's over now. Let's go. She nodded. Yes, okay. Stepped past him, whole body trembling, and started to climb over the railing of the boat. Her high-heeled pump slipped on the wet bar, and Eliza's hand shot out for help as she stumbled backwards. Instinctively, Cooper reached to steady her and regretted it immediately when her other hand yanked out of her raincoat pocket holding a wrench and clocked him across the temple. What? It was a glancing blow. She wasn't strong enough to knock him out, but it was enough that he felt unbalanced for a critical second, and his eyesight was too unfocused to see Eliza shove him with all her strength over the rail. Cooper flipped backwards and fell the ten feet toward the gap between the boat and the floor. His shin hit the edge of the cement, and bone-splitting pain shot through his leg like acid. No, no, no. His scream was lost to the water that filled his mouth and nose as his body slipped into the bay. For a moment, all he could do was clutch his leg to his chest as he sank farther down into the darkness. The water was cold, but everything below his right hip was on fire. He couldn't tell how bad it was, how dangerous it would be for him to move, if he even could move. Carefully, his tingling fingers traced down over his knee and brushed torn flesh and the unexpectedly hard edge of something that must have been a protruding bone. A wave of blackness hit him, and for a moment he couldn't think anything at all. There was only shock and pain. When he got his sight back, he realized he was gasping and choking on the brackish water. Get up. Get out. Bracing himself, he bucked back toward the surface while trying not to move his leg. It didn't work. The pain winding up his shin and thigh and into every other corner of his body was nauseating, but he kept swimming up, reaching for the surface. His hands brushed something smooth and solid above him. He opened his eyes. All he saw was darkness. Was he under the boat? Or had he drifted under the dock? If he had moved to the right, would he find the crack he'd come down through, or would he be moving farther under the warehouse floor? What had started as an itch in the base of his lungs was rapidly becoming a desperate need for air so intense it was even beginning to mute the agony in his leg. Cooper couldn't feel grateful. He spread his arms wide over his head, feeling the expanse of the thing above him, his depleting oxygen supplies had unhelpfully prompted a fluttering panic inside his skull, and he swept his hands back and forth as fast as he could under the water, searching for some way up. This wasn't how it was supposed to end. Not here and not now. He still had something he needed to tell Oliver. He still had everything he needed to tell Oliver. Suddenly the thing under his palm started to move, and Cooper pushed at it desperately as if he could speed it up. The water above his head became slightly lighter and he kicked up, hard. Fuck what it did to his broken bones. All his limbs felt so light the entire bottom half of his leg might have clean fallen off and sunk to the bottom of the bay and he would not have noticed right then. He could see the light now, and hoping to God it wasn't some divine tunnel shit, reached up. Up, like he could grab onto the air itself to pull himself out. Then there were arms around his chest and a body behind him in the water, and he was dragged swiftly to the surface. Cooper took heaving drags of air, choking and expelling water faster than he could replace it with oxygen. He realized he was being held up above the water by a person, and that the person was growling, Fucking asshole, and you idiot and stupid lucky porcupine, in his ear over and over. Cooper turned his face into Park's neck. Eliza, he said, or tried to. What came out was unintelligible sound and yet more of the bay. Shut up, you'll hurt yourself, Park said harshly and then a bit apologetically. Dean and June got her. Dean? Cooper's eyes fluttered open. The boat that had trapped him below, the Eglantine, had been shoved up against the other one so hard it had done damage and was tilting. A literal shipwreck. Eight violent gashes ran down the side, utterly destroying the twisting vines and leaves meant to memorialize Rose. The moorings had been ripped straight out of the cement somehow, and were hanging uselessly into the water. Neither Eliza, June, nor Dean were on deck. 
He tried to turn and look for them in the boathouse, but Park's arm tightened around him, holding him in place. Stop squirming, Park said into his ear. I need to get you out of the water. Leg broken. Cooper managed, or an approximation of it anyway, and felt Park's arm squeeze him again like a spasm. The movement forced him to cough up more water and his throat burned fiercely. Can you hold on to the dock for a second? He didn't bother wasting what little energy he had left in responding. Just grabbed on. Park lifted himself out of the water in one inhumanly graceful movement and then got his hands back on Cooper immediately, like a second was literally all he trusted Cooper could manage on his own. Cooper didn't take it personally. At the moment, it felt true. Count of three. Park hoisted him straight up into the air and laid him carefully onto the ground. And okay, fuck, now he could feel his leg again. Cooper swore, his head jerking back and grinding against the concrete. An almost pleasant distraction from the fire below. He felt Park fuss around the wound so delicately that he looked down there half expecting to see his partner blowing on it. What? He stopped. Park's face was... different. He looked, well, wolfier than Cooper had ever seen him. His eyes were completely changed. His teeth were fully out, and his face was sharp and... off somehow like a piece of Escher art where the eyes couldn't quite compute how the planes and angles lined up. Cooper glanced back to Eliza's boat. He could see now that the eight gouge marks through the decal were made by claws, and the angle it was tilted and rapidly taking on water made it look like someone had picked it up and tossed it across the boathouse, like a child flinging toys in the tub. But that couldn't be possible, right? He stared at Park. Oh, Cooper made some kind of watery noise of surprise and pain, and Park looked up at him, and despite all the other changes, he recognized that look. Shockingly vulnerable, hopeful, and warm with a heavy, overlying layer of pure exasperation. Cooper reached up to brush Park's wet hair plastered over his face away, and then let his fingers trail across the changed bone structure, the flattened cheekbones and elongated jaw. Park stilled beneath the touch not even breathing when Cooper's fingers finally traced his elongated teeth. All it suddenly Park's eyes flickered upward toward something behind Cooper and widened. What now? Cooper jerked his head around, expecting to see Eliza back with more tools. Instead, he saw his father. His father, who was holding his weapon, pointed straight at him. Dad? Cooper croaked, and it sounded more like, Lub? Get away from my son, Ed said, holding his gun steady. The hell? I said get away from him. Cooper pulled himself up to sitting so he could face his father. Park didn't move at all, just stared calmly but intently at Ed. I'm just trying to help, Mr. Dayton. His face was abruptly back to being unremarkable, like it had never been any other way. Cooper could see the confusion in his father's eyes. No, Ed said firmly. Confusion didn't mean doubt. I saw you. You're the one who attacked him. Let go of my son or I will shoot. Park slowly released Cooper and started to raise his hands in the air. Cooper slapped them back. Dad, put it down. Eliza attacked me. No. No, I saw him. Change. Your teeth, your eyes, your claws. You gave him those scars. You're the... Cooper, get out of the way. Cooper had managed to drag himself in between Park and the gun, though his head was back to feeling gaseous and floating about three feet above his shoulders and his leg was... not something to think about. Dad, stop. Oliver has never hurt me. He saved me. You didn't see. You don't know. I know, Dad, okay? I know him. Everything I need to. And I love him. I really love him. Please just... Cooper reached toward his father. He makes me happy, remember? Ed lowered his weapon and Cooper let out the breath he'd been holding, his eyes drifting shut in relief. Then they stayed shut because he didn't have the strength to operate his lids anymore and the warm darkness that started in his eyes was leaking into the rest of him, blanketing his thoughts with heavy, blissful numbness. Blood loss, Cooper thought dreamily. Finally, something's going my way. Somewhere above him he heard a voice. A really lovely voice. His favorite, mutter, Ditto, you sap. Before he didn't hear, see, or think anything more. Chapter 14 Cooper woke up in the hospital. His mouth was dry and he couldn't feel his right leg at all. 
The last time he'd woken up like this, they'd taken 30% of his intestines out, and he couldn't eat solids for a week. He reached down and breathed a sigh of relief when he felt his limb continue below the knee, albeit beneath a thick cast. He opened his eyes. In the chair beside his bed, Ed was leaning forward, elbows on his knees, and glaring suspiciously across the room. Did... Dad? Ed startled and turned to him. He still looked tense and grim. You're awake. Good. His hand reached toward Cooper as if to sweep the hair out of his eyes, stopped, and just patted the mattress a couple times instead, his eyes darting back across the room. Cooper turned to follow his gaze slowly, conscious of how thick his head felt, and realized Park was standing in the corner against the curtain that divided the space, with his arms tightly crossed and looking as tense and grim as Ed. Cooper made an embarrassing, whimpering sound of relief, and Park's expression softened slightly, but he didn't move closer. After a couple moments of awkward silence, Ed cleared his throat. Your brother and Sophie are downstairs getting something to eat, he hesitated. They'll want to see you. He looked at Park, then back at Cooper. Should I? Do you want me to go tell them you're up? Yeah, please, Cooper croaked. Ed stood and hesitated, hovering over the bed and fiddling with his mustache. Then he swiftly leaned down and kissed Cooper on the top of his head. Okay. Yes. Fine. It's fine, Ed said more to himself than anyone else, and left the room with one final tense glance at Park. Have a nice chat while I was napping? Did he tell you to call him Pops? Cooper said as brightly as his throat would allow when he couldn't hear Ed's shuffling footsteps anymore. Park uncrossed his arms and moved to sit on the edge of Cooper's bed. How are you feeling? Cooper shrugged. You know more than I do. You have a compound break of your tibia possibly a slight concussion, and everyone agreed it's disgusting that you drank bay water. Yeah, my bad. He processed that. All in all, it could have been worse, especially considering he'd really thought he was going to drown for a moment or two there, and all because Eliza Bell had caught him off guard. Stupid. Though I suppose that was what she was best at. You had to have an ability to lull a false sense of security in people as a politician. It wasn't really surprising to realize those same skills doubled for her career as a triple murderer. So, uh, what exactly happened back there? Park narrowed his eyes. If you're about to tell me you have some sort of amnesia and can't remember you confessing your undying love for me and pretend it didn't happen again, I honestly might slap you, concussion or no. Cooper laughed, and it sounded slightly hysterical. Park quirked an eyebrow. No, I... No. I meant what happened there with Eliza, and, uh, you know. Cooper gestured at him and bared his own teeth. Park blinked at him, face utterly blank. I have no idea what you're talking- Oh, stop it. My dad obviously saw something. I saw it too, you going all majorly wolfy. And Doherty told me you're... unstable. That you haven't shifted in too long and it's screwing you up. Park opened his mouth as if to protest, but Cooper put his hand on his leg. It's not like I haven't noticed something was wrong on my own. You've clearly been struggling, so... Is that why you lost control? Park tilted his head and then nodded. Yes, well... My fear from smelling your blood on the dock and you missing is what did it technically, but the... He frowned. The wall wouldn't have been so thin if I'd been shifting when I was supposed to. Cooper nodded. How did you know I'd gone into the water? Did Eliza... No. Park's mouth was tight. When we got there, she was wiping down a bloody wrench before running off and leaving you to drown. Fortunately, Agent June saw enough to make even her suspicious of someone besides me. When Eliza bolted, she and Dean followed. When did you realize June was tailing you? When I left the hotel, his eyes darkened. I was having a little chat with her when I missed your call. Why you decided to confront the unsub on your own? I didn't think she could overpower me. Cooper grumbled. Park held up his hand. Regardless, I wasn't able to shake Agent June or convince her to pursue other leads, and she trailed me to the marina where your father and Dean found me. They were looking for you, too, and figured you'd be here where the action was. Cooper snorted. But how did you find me? Park coughed. I, uh, tracked your scent into the boathouse where we saw Eliza, and... He scowled. That's when I heard something hitting the bottom of the boat. 
So you just decided to move that out of the way for me? Cooper said a little breathlessly. Decent of you. Park gave him a look. You know boats weigh significantly less in the water, right? But yes, I had to. And because I wasn't shifting, I lost control of myself. Badly. In front of your father. Cooper let that sink in, so to speak, Rose Doherty lingering in the back of his mind. But Park didn't hate who he was. How could he possibly? So, he said, why weren't you? Shifting every day, I mean. He took a breath. Is it because I've done something wrong? Made you feel like, no, no, Cooper, you didn't do anything. Then what is it? Because I was seriously worried. Shit, I am seriously worried. Park looked away and muttered something. Sorry, what? Not all of us have super ears. I said I did it for you. Park said so loudly, Cooper jumped. And then, in a normal tone of voice, Not because of you, but for you. I wanted to make a good impression with your family. I wanted to be there for you because I could see how hard it was for you being here. I didn't want to just... disappear on you. Cooper's pulse sped up. Why? Park shook his head and closed his eyes for a moment as if in exasperation. He took a deep breath, opened his eyes, and looked straight at Cooper. A peculiar expression on his face, almost embarrassed but defiant too. Determined. Because I do all sorts of idiotic things around you. Like protect you when you don't want protecting and get on a goddamn floating nausea death trap just so your family likes me and twist my body inside out so you don't have to be alone and because obviously I love you. You... You love me, Cooper stuttered. Obviously, Park said. For quite some time now. Quite some time now. Cooper repeated faintly. And you didn't tell me this before because... I didn't want to rush it and lose you. Or worse, pressure you into saying the same. You know, put flower juice in your eye. I even wondered if some space would help, but... His expression turned serious. Like I said, I have a hard time walking away from you. Oh, well... That's good, nice to know, I mean... Cooper poked at the hospital blanket, rearranging it over his lap. As you pointed out before, I have made my feelings clear, so. Silence. He glanced up and was caught in Park's slow smile. What? The smile widened. Papa, no, I love him, Park said dramatically and put a hand to his brow. Cooper reached over to shove him away, but somehow his fingers grabbed hold of Park's shirt instead and pulled him down toward the bed. Park caught himself with his hands on either side of his head so as not to jostle Cooper's leg. Shut up, you know what I meant. It's still nice to hear, though, Park whispered, his breath ghosting over Cooper's lips. Cooper sighed. Okay, I can't seem to remember why at the moment, but I love you too. He kissed him, and what was supposed to be a brief, hard kiss turned tender and lingering. I love you he said when they finally parted, and then bumping noses again. I love you. All right, already. Sheesh, I heard you the first time. Park rolled his eyes, but his huge grin belied his words. I know you're bad at it, but you're really going to have to work on that poker face if we're going to keep this on the down low at work. Ah, Park said, about that. What? I've been suspended. Cooper sat up straight, and his head spun at the sudden movement. What? Why? For revealing myself to the unaware. I can't believe, did my dad? No. Though I did hear him tell Dean and Sophie, so prepare yourself for that. He sighed. I told them, actually. But why? And what were they even doing here? When June and Dean caught Eliza wrench-handed, if you will, she snapped. She had a busy schedule of murdering, framing, and campaigning to keep up with these last couple days, and trying to explain away an assault was the last straw. Sounds like politics per usual to me, Cooper muttered. Anyway, since she calmed down, she's been telling anyone who will listen Rose was some kind of monster with fangs and glowing eyes and she killed her in self-defense. Not sure how she's going to work Hardwick and West into the narrative, but word travels. 
and as soon as your name was checked into the hospital, the Bureau was alerted, got wind of Eliza's story, and decided it was worth a trip down. They saw the damage I did to the boat. I can't exactly pretend those were done with these. Park held up his average, clipped short nails. And I wasn't sure what your dad was or wasn't going to say, so I told him the truth. He paused and smiled tightly. You should know Ed didn't snitch, and I'm positive that's for your benefit, not mine. They can't do this to you, Cooper protested. Then, what exactly are they going to do to you? The usual fine. There goes your Hanukkah present, Park winked, and a three-month suspension. Three months? I was already in the doghouse because of last night, and revealing ourselves is a serious crime, especially for a trust agent who should be a pillar in this community and infallible. Park reacted like he was quoting someone. Let me guess, not McLean again, Cooper said. Cola may have stopped by, and she may have brought you that. He nodded at the table against the wall, and Cooper saw a little brown bear holding a get-well-soon heart. His eyes widened as he looked from the bear to Park. Cola? Yes, she and your father had a chat. Park sniffed, looking a bit offended. I wasn't allowed to sit in on it, but from the looks I've been getting for the past six hours, I'd say the jig is up entirely. He hesitated. And you should know. He almost certainly knows about the BSI now. Huh, Cooper said, stunned for a moment. Then, but suspend it. It wasn't your fault. I'll vouch for you. I'll complain. Cooper? Park shook his head. It's honestly fine. She was right. It was incredibly stupid and reckless of me to go so long without shifting. To get to the point where I thought... Well, some time off isn't the worst thing. Cooper bit his tongue. He had a feeling Park's excuse of not shifting because he didn't want to leave him alone was only part of the truth. He privately swore to make it his mission to figure out what else was going on, and if it had anything to do with him, he'd fix it. Hell, even if it didn't explicitly have to do with him, Cooper could still do better. He knew that. Park was still talking. Besides, I'll have plenty to keep busy. My partner has been seriously injured, and I have strict orders to keep him off his feet and hand-feed him grapes and personally sponge-bathe him until he sees fit. I really hope you're joking. What, you're saying I don't know how to keep you off your feet? Park wiggled his eyebrows. Cooper rolled his eyes. After a moment, he tentatively returned to the word that poked at him, even more than the personally sponge-bathe him situation. So, when you say partner, he said slowly, what does that mean exactly? The rest of the words came out in a garbled mess. Pretty much whatever you want it to mean, Park said frankly. I'm open to discussing some relationship parameters, but as long as it includes you and me together, I'm happy. Partners, Cooper said, tasting the word on his mouth and imagining it as something completely non-work related. Park was watching him with an amused expression. We can use a different word if you want. Boyfriend, lover, love. He looked over his shoulder conspicuously and then leaned forward and whispered, Mate. He pulled back and made a face. Now you're just bluffing. You would never agree to calling each other mate. You can't even keep a straight face when I say it. Park sighed and pressed a light kiss to Cooper's lips. For you, Agent Dayton, there doesn't seem to be much I won't do. My, my. Cooper stroked Park's face with the back of his hand. What a good mate I have. Ahem. Ed had pulled back the curtain a bit and stuck his head in. His face was ruddy with color and he was tugging at the hairs of his mustache almost manically. Cooper pulled back sharply and a pharmaceutically dulled throb bellowed a protest deep inside his mummified leg. Park raised an eyebrow. Fuck it. Cooper grabbed Park's hand and the smile he got in return did a hell of a better job than whatever was hanging in that IV bag. He's dropping. Park said without turning around. The curtain was yanked back even farther by a ridiculously grinning Dean. And loving it, he said cheerfully. But can you two wrap it up soon, because visiting hours are ending soon, and I might have, you know, a question or two million. Behind him, Sophie rolled her eyes, nodded at Cooper, and then without hesitation at Park. You guys okay? She asked kindly. Never better. Cooper squeezed Park's hand and got a squeeze back. All right, come in. Let's talk. This concludes The Wolf at Bay by Charlie Atara. 
Narrated by Eric Blomquist. Copyright 2018 by Charlie Atara. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Harlequin Harlequin Books S.A. and was produced in the year 2019 by Tantor Media Incorporated, a division of recorded books which holds the copyright thereto. Please visit Tantor.com for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program. Thank you.